Preface of Short History of the Christian Church. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tricia G. Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. Preface The present work has as its basis the series of five short histories by the same author, which appeared in the following order. The Reformation, 1884. The Early Church, 1886. The Medieval Church, 1887. The Modern Church in Europe, 1888. And The Church in the United States, 1890. Reversing the order of the first two volumes, The Short History of the Reformation and The Short History of the Early Church, the five volumes form a connected history of the Church nearly down to the present time. From this experiment of brief histories of the several periods, it has been illustrated anew that the popular taste for the condensed treatment of the secular sciences can be safely applied to the domain of theological science, and to no department with greater hope of success than to historical theology. These summaries have met with a reception far more generous than could have been expected, and the indications are not wanting that they have led students of church history and even general readers into the broader paths laid out by Neander, Geseller, Schaff, Hagenbach, Fischer, and other masters of this fascinating and growing science. What was done in the short history for each period has seemed proper for all the periods taken together. The result is the present work, Short History of the Christian Church. All the matter contained in the separate short histories has been examined with care, and large portions in every period have been rewritten. Fundamental changes have been made, such as a summary of literature at the beginning of each chapter, important additions to the part assigned the Reformation, and especially such enlargement of the parts relating to the European Church in the modern period, and the Church in the United States, as to amount to an entirely new treatment. The method pursued in the short history of these periods has been abandoned, and the result is practically a new history of each period. In these important departments, namely the literature for each chapter, the survey of the later European Church and the American Church, and essential aid in every part of the work, I have had the valuable cooperation of the Rev. John Alfred Faulkner, B.D. This scholar has elsewhere given ample proof of the true historical instinct. Among all the younger men who are digging in the rich mines of historical theology, I know of no one who is likely to bring to the light a gold of finer quality or richer luster, or whose pen bids fairer to make the church of the past a wise instructor for the church of the future. The index of authors and general index has been prepared by a friend in other labors, the Rev. Albert Osborne, B.D. For the important section of ecclesiastical statistics in the appendix to this volume, obligations are due to Henry K. Carroll, LL.D., of the editorial department of The Independent, New York, and general agent for the statistics of the churches for the present United States Census. No part of the treatment has been so delicate, or conducted with so much misgiving, as that of the various American denominations. But fairness has been uppermost in mind throughout. Yet it would be a great pleasure to welcome any suggestion, from whatever quarter, where there may seem the least lack of that high impartiality which is essential to any one who makes bold to pass, and would lead others, along the paths of history." It is earnestly hoped, however, that not even a seeming injustice has been done to any one of the noble churches which have grown up amid the manifold ecclesiastical life of the United States. Washington, D.C., December 1, 1892 End of Preface Part 1, Chapter 1 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, The Early Church, A.D. 30 to 750. Chapter 1, The Church and Its History. 
the visible church consists of the organized believers in Christ and the followers of his life. General history reveals the constant presence of a superintending providence. The rise and fall of nations is not an idle play of human passions. Schiller's aphorism is just a recognition of God's constant watchfulness and justice, quote, the world's history is the world's judgment, end quote. The wild currents have never been permitted to flow on without divine control. When the hour came for the wrong to cease, the controlling hand intervened. The result was always the triumph of the right. In the history of the church, the divine superintendence has been far more prominent. While in secular history the spiritual forces lay largely in the background, in the life of the church they have come out boldly into the clear foreground. Though often in the wrong and divided in opinion, the church has been saved from fatal error and downfall by divine interposition. Even when it has been grossly superstitious and the teacher of false doctrine, God has always raised up true servants, who became the heroes of a holy cause and the heralds of a brighter day. The champion of a wrong cause has always had his plans fail through the work of some brave and pure opponent. There has been an Athanasius to meet every Arius. To counteract a Leo X, there has always arisen a fearless Luther. To show when the divine force has controlled all human events, and made them subserve the steady progress of God's servants, is the mission of him who treats the history of the church. The office of the historian of the church is not to untie a tangled skein, but to follow the golden thread of the divine presence in all Christian ages. When our Lord's passion had occurred, three important works were accomplished. He had communicated his gospel to men, he had set a spotless example before the world, and he had achieved universal redemption by his voluntary death. His subsequent resurrection and ascension were the visible proofs of the truth of his doctrines. They were more than this, they were the twofold assurance to his followers, then and in all later ages, that they who believe in him and love him shall enjoy his constant presence during life, and afterwards enter upon the inheritance of heaven. Christ, immediately before his ascension, commanded his disciples to remain in Jerusalem until they should be endued with power from on high. Here lay his promise of spiritual endowment for their ministry. It was, at the same time, a direct lesson that a special spiritual preparation and plenitude were, for all time, a requisite for the successful preaching of the gospel. Without the descent of the Spirit at Pentecost, there would have been no impulsive power in Christianity. The Pentecost was the Jewish National Thanksgiving Day. It was the Feast of Weeks, or Harvest Feast Day, which commemorated the gift of the law to Moses, and at the same time gave occasion to return thanks for the annual products of the soil. Its observance was associated with the most touching memories connected with the founding of the theocracy, and with the subsequent preserving care of a bountiful creator. Jews in all lands united with their brethren in Palestine in an annual visit to Jerusalem to celebrate the day. The first Christian Pentecost came on the fiftieth day after our Lord's resurrection, and the tenth after his ascension. There were Jews in the sacred city from all parts of the known world. On that day, the promise of the Spirit's descent was fulfilled. Cloven tongues of fire flamed above the heads of the disciples. The miraculous gift of utterance was imparted. The multitude of Jews was attracted to the place where the disciples were. Each worshipper, whatever his language, understood the preaching. Peter explained to the people the significance of the scene, and applied the descent of the Spirit to the work of our Lord. The result was the addition of three thousand to the body of believers. The organization of the church took place immediately after the remarkable scenes at Pentecost. Measures were soon taken for a unifying ecclesiastical polity. Even before Pentecost, a new apostle, Matthias, was chosen in place of the fallen Judas. 
orders of ministers and lay members were established for the preaching of the gospel, the care of the needy, and the building up of the body of believers. Only a general organization, however, was effected. The most simple arrangements were made for government, as the believers were as yet but few, and confined to a narrow territory. The more elaborate polity was left for the future needs of the church, to take its shape according to the expansion of the societies into all lands and nationalities, and their individual requirements. The practical life of the Christians was at once simple and beautiful. It was a type of all the essential qualities which Christ had taught, as requisite for pure living and final salvation. There were both a simplicity of faith and that intense brotherly love which had their practical demonstration in the equal distribution of temporal possessions. The community of goods did not arise from a divine command, but was merely the natural effect of that broad charity which arose from the love of Christ and the possession of the Spirit. The real majesty of the early church lay in its spontaneous quality. All thoughts centered on the memory of Christ as a personal Savior, and in the consciousness of his continued presence. To crown all, there was a fervor in communicating the gospel which knew no bounds. The whole world seemed small. Its farthest horizon alone was to be the limit of teaching. What the apostles had felt and known was now their sole passion. There was little difference between the apostle and the unlettered believer. Each, in his own best way, was to preach the new life in Christ, that all men might share its sacrifice here and its holy joy hereafter. Pentecost was the practical divine testimony to the universal adoption of the gospel. The removal of the natural limitations of language was a providential indication of the application of Christianity to every class and condition. It was the divine endorsement of the command to the disciples to preach and teach the word throughout the world. End of chapter 1「Part 1 Chapter 2 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 Chapter 2 The Scenes of the Labors of the Apostles The Acts of the Apostles are the chief source of information concerning the fields of work of the different apostles, but the epistles of Paul and his associates contain frequent statements which serve to supply missing links in that more formal history. To these may be added the supplementary accounts of writers from the second century to the fourth, many of which, however, are only vague suppositions or impressions which existed in oral form in the early church. Peter represented the Jewish type of Christianity. He was slow to learn that Christianity was designed for all men. Pentecost should have been enough, but even this great lesson did not satisfy his intensely Jewish character. After important labors in Palestine, extending as far north as Antioch, he came to the council in Jerusalem. Here, at the moment of supreme test, he wisely changed his position, and united with Paul in removing all Jewish ceremonials as a condition of entrance into the church. Henceforth all bonds with Judaism were broken, and Jews and Gentiles became Christians on precisely the same terms. There are good reasons to suppose that Peter made an evangelistic tour through portions of Asia Minor, for his first epistle intimates previous labors in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, the province, and Bithynia. He also says that at the time of writing he was in Babylon. If this was the Babylon on the banks of the Euphrates, and we believe it was, he was, no doubt, attracted thither by reason of the large Jewish population resident there. It seems to have been understood by him and Paul that he should confine his labors to the east, while Paul should occupy himself with the west. There is no historical proof that Peter founded the church in Rome, or that he was ever there. His residence there is not mentioned by the earliest writers in their lists of the first bishops of the western metropolis. The first mention was by Dionysius of Corinth, 
A.D. 170, who speaks of Peter's death in Rome. The concurrent later testimony of the early Christian writers as to his residence and death there is worthy of credit. But while we are without definite proof of Peter's presence in Rome, it is not impossible that he did spend a brief period there, and that he died about the year 67 in the persecution under Nero. There is, however, not the least foundation for the belief that Peter was ever bishop of the church. Paul towers far above all the apostles in the majesty of his character, the scope of his genius, the depth of his learning, and the sublime quality of his labors. Educated in both Jewish and pagan learning, after his miraculous conversion he became an apostle, in every sense able to cope with the antagonism of the combined foes of his age. His call was to the Gentiles. He made three great missionary tours. The first was begun in A.D. 44 and embraced Cyprus and then Asia Minor, where he visited Perga, Pisidia, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Paul's second missionary journey began A.D. 48. He went northward through Syria into Asia Minor, and visited Cilicia, Phrygia, Galatia. He then crossed the Aegean Sea into Macedonia. He began his European ministry in Philippi, and went thence southward into Greece as far as Corinth. From thence he went to Ephesus and returned to Jerusalem. He entered upon his third tour, A.D. 52. He went again into Asia Minor, taking Galatia, Phrygia, and Troas on the way. He then crossed into Macedonia and Illyricum. He returned to Troas, and, passing by the Aegean islands, proceeded back to Jerusalem. Here he was arrested and taken a prisoner to Caesarea, where he was two years in confinement. He appealed for justice to Caesar and was taken to Rome. He remained there from A.D. 59 to 61. He was now released, and, as we believe, entered on a fourth tour, embracing a visit to Crete, Macedonia, Corinth, Nicopolis, Dalmatia, and Asia Minor. He was a second time arrested and taken to Rome. He suffered martyrdom in Nero's reign, A.D. 66. John represented the mediating element between Judaism and paganism. His attachment and scene of labor seem to have been, for the first twenty years after Pentecost, chiefly in Palestine. He was present at the council in Jerusalem, A.D. 50. For twenty years, or until A.D. 70, we lose sight of him entirely. The probability is that he labored in the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates, with Babylon as the center, and returned to Jerusalem, whence he fled to Ephesus on the capture of that city by Titus. We find him now in Ephesus. His residence was intermitted by his exile to the island of Patmos. He died in Ephesus about A.D. 98, when about 100 years old. The labors of the other apostles are largely matter of conjecture, derived from the writings of Hegesippus, Eusebius, and Nicephorus, who framed their suppositions from the floating oral traditions in the Christian communities. James the Elder suffered martyrdom in Jerusalem about A.D. 44. James, our Lord's brother, preached in Jerusalem and finally died there a martyr. It was believed that Philip labored in Phrygia, Simon Zelotes in Egypt and the neighboring African coast, Thomas in India, Andrew in Scythia, Asia Minor, Thrace, and Greece, Matthias in Ethiopia, Judas, called Lebaeans or Thaddeus, in Persia, and Bartholomew in Lyconia, Armenia, and India. The uncertainty as to fields of labor of most of the apostles is one of the marvels of the scriptures. One fact is clear, however, that the trend of the world's Christian life was westward. On the distribution of the gospel into the more stable parts of the Roman Empire, we have full light in the accounts of Paul's labors. All the just and vital interests of Christianity centered in that one man's work. Rome was to be the point of departure for the sowing of the truth in the north and farther west. Here Paul brought his life and labors to a triumphant close. But with his martyrdom he had only begun his work. His example and writings, 
and the two are inseparable, have been, ever since, the permanent and necessary treasures of the church. The present current of the truth is a reversal of the old order. It is from the fields then barbarous and largely unknown to the geography of those times, towards the old east. What the apostles could only begin will be completed, in the eastern countries, by the laborers sent out from the warm heart of western Protestantism. End of chapter 2「Part 1 Chapter 3 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Greek and Roman Conditions The pagan literature, in the earliest period of Christianity, was a beautiful piece of human workmanship. No temple in stone was so symmetrical and elaborate as that of Greek and Roman letters. From rude beginnings, it had grown into such majestic and firm proportions that, to this day, it challenges the admiration of the world. The classic achievements in the whole field of literature, art, philosophy, and legislation are the common inheritance of man. When Christianity came forward with its strange claims upon the confidence of men, there was but little in its exterior which could awaken sympathy. The most despised land had produced it. Its founder had suffered death on the ignominious cross. Its first apostles were of humble origin, and, with the exception of Paul, not one had drunk at the classic fountains. That a new faith, with such multiform disadvantages, should venture upon such a hostile field, where the literature and traditions of many centuries held firm ground, seemed a hopeless task. But the heroism of the first preachers of Christianity was not disturbed by the number or strength of the enemy. The promise of success was the basis of their faith. They wrought on and expected triumph over every foe. Which should win, the obscure Christian, who had never fought a battle, or the cultivated pagan who had never lost one. The path of the Greek to mastery had been through all fields of intellectual development. Out of the old pelasgic cradle he had grown to the full grandeur of Attic manhood. The blood of many tribes flowed through his veins, and he had absorbed the strongest and best elements of all. In epic and dramatic poetry he produced Homer, Hesiod, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. The Greek was a lover of form and color. He caught his inspiration from the wild and beautiful scenery of his islands and broken coast. Apelles and Phidias became the incarnation of his passion. In his long battle for federation he had produced such great lawgivers as Solon and Lycurgus. He was of fervent temperament, and, living always in a feverish political atmosphere, he had developed Demosthenes, Aeschines, and Isocrates, orators who have swayed audiences in all later ages. In philosophy, the Greeks labored with great industry. The growth of their systems was contemporaneous with their national prosperity. The dealing with the fundamental questions of human being and destiny by Socrates and Plato reveals a deep moral purpose. There are two great periods of Greek philosophy separated by the downfall of Alexander's empire. The former extends from B.C. 600 to B.C. 324. Within this short space arose all the best thinkers who founded the Ionic, the early Pythagorean, the Eleatic, the Atomistic, and the Sophist schools. The culmination was reached in the three systems of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. The second period extends from B.C. 324 to A.D. 530. The schools of the decadence rose and fell at this time, the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Skeptics. To this was added Neoplatonism, founded by Plotinus. The most spiritual of the entire circle of Greek philosophers was Plato. In many departments of his philosophy, such as the unity and spirituality of God and the immortality of the soul, he made, though unconsciously, very near approaches to the truths of revelation. 
it was the habit of early christian teachers to regard his system as kindred to christianity eusebius said plato alone of all the greeks reached the vestibule of truth and stood upon its threshold justin martyr clemens of alexandria origen and augustine in the early period and schleiermacher and neander in the recent period were led to christ through plato as their guide the best systems in the group declined with the political supremacy of the greek confederation those which succeeded the loss of national independence were the systems of despair when christianity arose the prevailing greek philosophy was skeptical the mythology had lost its firm hold while philosophy which was the substitute offered by the profoundest thinkers proved its own inability to satisfy the cravings of the soul for salvation and to be the solution of its great problems pagan faith and thought were unavailing to meet the spiritual wants of man the soul could not live on the triumphs of art or literature or eloquence or legislation christianity came forward with its sublime truths and made proffer of them to the world paul preaching christ on mars hill looked back upon a long pathway of dead systems of greek genius and forward upon the rise of christian creations in their place great as had been the thinkers of the stoa and the academy greater still was the messenger of christ his system was the permanent truth when christianity began its career for the world's possession the roman rule was universal the literature and religion were shaped from greek models but the romans gave to everything a practical direction law was the roman habit and to govern was the roman passion the romans had no sooner conquered a rude tribe than they converted the territory into a new province and gave it all the qualities of a firm part of the empire palestine was an integral part of the great domain governed by roman deputies who were closely watched at the same time that they were entrusted with large authority paul the greek preacher enjoyed and asserted the rights of roman citizenship great highways built at great expense for the rapid movement of armies connected all parts of the broad territory these made easy the rapid dissemination of the gospel the apostles could move along these stone roads with ease and so convert paths for soldiers into highways for the triumphant march of the messengers of the peaceful gospel the difficulties confronting the church throughout the roman empire were however of formidable character the entire body of the people was hostile to any spiritual religion what did not appeal to the senses had no attraction to them as an object of worship the hold of the old mythology was lost and a general skepticism as to all beliefs prevailed but the emperors regarded the preservation of the ancestral faith as the great bulwark of the throne political government and fidelity to the prevailing mythology were held to be inseparable hence christianity was bitterly opposed so soon as its antagonism was discovered it was seen to be hostile to the elaborate temple service the emperor who was also pontifex maximus or supreme priest was held responsible for the support of the state religion the temples and pagan rites must be sustained the more closely christianity came into view the more stringent became the measures for its suppression the christians made no concealments they absented themselves from the temples threw off all faith in the ruling mythology and openly declared their hostility to it when christianity appeared the moral depravity of the roman empire was at its lowest ebb the stricter morals of the republic had disappeared in the wild licentiousness of the empire it was an age of excesses which the satirists with juvenal and perseus at their head held up to universal contempt the degradation of women was complete even in athens the wife was a slave and possessed no legal rights she could bequeath only a measure of barley to her offspring her present depression in turkey is a fair picture of the old pagan conditions her mental endowments were declared to be of inferior grade 
she was supposed to excel in duplicity and treachery marriage was a loose bond with only the shadow of political institution a low estimate was placed on childhood in sparta the maimed children were a burden to the state because useless as soldiers only boys had an importance in the eye of parents stealing was a virtue in a boy provided he could do it so cleverly as not to be detected socrates plato and aristotle never went so far as to enforce the element of religion in education children were not taught reverence for their parents jupiter the son of saturn hurled his father from the throne shut him up in tartarus and parcelled out the universe between himself and his two brothers neptune and pluto with this picture of filial brutality as the basis of the pagan mythology what better estimate could be expected of childhood all the types of parental love were based on admiration of heroic deeds when xenophon was told that his son had died in battle he replied i did not request the gods to make my son immortal or long-lived for it is not clear that this was suitable for him but that he might have integrity in his principles and be a lover of his country and now i have my desire children according to the pagan thought were only machines for fighting future battles christ achieved no greater revolution than when he elevated childhood into equality with manhood his one declaration of such is the kingdom of heaven was a fatal blow at the world's prevailing estimate of children slavery was universal it underlay the whole political and social structure in attica as early as b c 309 according to demetrius philarius there were twenty thousand citizens and four hundred thousand slaves among the romans the slaves were not regarded as persons personae but as things res the doors of the wealthy romans were guarded by ostiarii or slaves in chains who lay like dogs before their kennels when a gentleman was murdered and his assassin could not be found the crime was supposed to have been committed by a slave and all the slaves with their wives and children were put to death to make sure of the offender tacitus says that when pedanius secundus was murdered as many as four hundred innocent slaves were put to death slavery extended to all parts of the empire and the number in rome was constantly kept up by the inflow of captives in the wars end of chapter three part one chapter four of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the attitude of judaism towards christianity the jews regarded themselves as the world's teachers and lawgivers they alone of all peoples believed in the unity of god their history was a long chapter of splendor and defeat when they escaped from egyptian bondage and reached palestine their first form of government was theocratic god raised up judges to meet special emergencies in their history from this they degenerated into a monarchy which after the death of solomon was divided into two kingdoms israel and judah unity in both government and faith was gone israel was overcome by the assyrians and judah by the babylonians and both nations were led off into exile to the valley of the tigris and the euphrates only a small portion of israel or the ten tribes returned the captives of conquered judah were cured of their polytheistic tendencies and preserving their identity under cyrus and his persian successors returned to palestine after the dissolution of the empire of alexander the great who had conquered palestine b c 332 the seleucidae ruled in syria and the ptolemies in egypt between these two the jews led a subject and timid life and finally submitted to the seleucidae the greek religion was foisted upon them but they rebelled and determined to preserve their old faith and to conquer their rulers matthias and his three sons led the revolt 
for a time they were successful and hoped to restore the old davidic splendor pompey was at this time in asia at the head of the roman army he was invited to settle the dispute he entered the country besieged jerusalem b c sixty three and as was the roman wont took possession of the country and united it with the roman empire the jews had now lost all independence their later revolts had no other effect than to tighten the roman hold and to disperse small bodies of colonists around the eastern coasts of the mediterranean the samaritans were a mongrel religious body they consisted of returned jews from assyria who brought with them those elements of pagan worship which they had absorbed during their captivity they settled in the valley of shechem and built their temple on the top of mount gerizim the sect still exists and consists of about one hundred and fifty people their city is nablus which lies in the valley between mounts gerizim and ebal they have a high priest and are still in possession of their revered copy of the pentateuch believed to be the oldest in the world the pharisees were the most educated of all jewish classes their teachers were versed in the law and represented the hopes the narrowness and the ritualism of the people they taught a national revival they originated as a class about b c one forty four and aimed to restore the waning faith to its old mosaic strength inclined to allegorical interpretation and devoted to traditions they aimed to supplement the scriptures by traditional accretions the sadducees originated according to some with zadok who lived about b c two fifty they strove to restore mosaism but rejected tradition they absorbed some of the elements of pagan thought especially the doctrines of epicurus they rejected angels the resurrection of the body the immortality of the soul and the divine interference in human affairs the essenes originated about b c one fifty their belief was jewish with persian elements they prayed towards the sun and held that virtue and vice inhered in matter they led a monastic life and practised community of goods all of these sects were in full strength at the time of christ the essenes were retired but the pharisees and sadducees were strong and prominent but all the sects disappeared with the destruction of jerusalem by titus a d seventy the jews are the wanderers of all history and all continents from the time of their captivity in assyria and babylonia down to the present day they have held their pilgrim staff in hand about b c three fifty we find a large colony on the shore of the caspian sea syria under the reign of seleucus nicator b c three twelve to two hundred eighty received a vast jewish population in the insecure interval between alexander the great and a d seventy they had gone in colonies into syria mesopotamia armenia asia minor crete cyprus and the aegean islands in lydia and phrygia there was a colony of two thousand families they generally preserved their identity the most concentrated jewish population outside of palestine was in northern africa egypt libya and cyrene abounded in jews alexandria was their chief centre even under alexander the founder of the city large numbers settled there while he assigned eight thousand samaritans to the thebaid extensive privileges were granted to the jews they not only thrived in commerce but developed thorough and broad scholarship philo who attempted to harmonize jewish theology and greek philosophy was a jew whose learning was profound and worthy of high praise the greek version of the old testament the septuagint was a great triumph of jewish learning the first jewish colony in rome consisted of captives brought by pompey from palestine they were assigned a distinct part of the city which they have occupied ever since the present ghetto julius caesar granted the jews special favors they were declared freedmen libertini had their synagogues observed their festivals and held the sabbath as a sacred day the cultivated romans however always despised them they were the usual objects of raillery and satire 
Juvenal held them up to contempt by saying they prayed to nothing but the clouds and the empty heavens. The apostles observed a common plan in preaching the gospel. They went first to the Jews, and then appealed to the outlying populations. Paul's success among them was often signal, but from them came also his most bitter foes. There were great advantages in making the Jews his first auditors. They were already familiar with the sacred history antecedent to Christianity. They had heard of the marvelous career of Jesus. Their annual visits to Jerusalem, to attend the festivals, had made them acquainted with the popular estimate of the new gospel. To the Jew first was his invariable plan. But there was no long pause. Also to the Greek was the next step of the tireless preacher. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Period of Universal Persecution. The political prostration of the Jews embittered them against the Christians. There was nothing in common between the Jewish sects and the early church. The skepticism of the Sadducees and the disappointed hopes of the Pharisees combined to intensify the popular hate. The council in Jerusalem cast Peter and John into prison, and put Stephen to death. A general persecution, under Herod Agrippa, A.D. 44, broke out, and James the Elder fell a victim to its rage. The Christians took refuge in Pella, beyond the Jordan. Bar Kokhba led a final popular Jewish revolt against the Roman authority, A.D. 132, but was defeated by Julius Severus, and Jerusalem became a heap of ruins. The Roman Emperor Hadrian tried to destroy the attachment of the Christians to the sacred associations of the city by erecting on Calvary a temple to Venus, and, over the Holy Sepulchre, a statue to Jupiter. But his efforts, while pleasing to the Jews, had no material effect. The Jews, now that all hope of national independence was gone, established a school at Tiberias, where they tried to achieve with the pen what they had failed to accomplish by the sword. Their misrepresentations of Christ and his doctrines formed an important element in the general literary attack on Christianity during the first three centuries. Christianity soon extended beyond Jewish bounds, and became a thing which might well arouse the fears of the whole Roman Empire. In Rome, the Christians were regarded as simply a new Jewish sect. And when, in the middle of the first century, a disturbance arose among the Jews of Rome, both Jews and Christians were banished by the emperor Claudius. Nero represented the popular hostility to Christianity. He was believed to have set fire to Rome, where the flames had full sway for nine days. He threw the blame, however, on the Christians, and resorted to the most barbarous methods to show his rage. He even had some Christians smeared with pitch and burned alive, while he caused others to be sewed in the skins of wild beasts and thrown out to the dogs. The persecution continued until his death. Under Domitian, A.D. 81-96, a milder policy of hostility was observed, the oppression of the Christians being chiefly confined to exile and the seizure of their property. The Twelve Tables of the Roman Law forbade the existence of foreign faiths within the dominions, but the habit had been to conciliate the conquered provinces by toleration of the existing religions. The appearance of the Christians, however, was the signal for revival of the old prohibition. The bonds uniting the Christians were close, their separate services were declared an act of hostility to the country. They were accused of disobedience to the laws, and of a spirit ripe at any moment for insurrection. They were charged with immoral practices in their services. All popular calamities, such as earthquakes, inundations, pestilence, and defeat in war, were attributed to them. A popular proverb ran thus, Deus non pluit, due ad Christianos. It does not rain, lead us against the Christians. 
Tertullian has left this record of the Roman habit of charging the disciples of Christ with all possible calamities. Quote, if the Tiber overflow its banks, if the Nile do not water the fields, if the clouds refuse rain, if the earth shake, if famine or storms prevail, the cry always is, pitch the Christians to the lions. End quote. Trajan, A.D. 98 to 117, continued the policy of his predecessors, but in milder form. He gave orders to the proconsul Pliny, in Bithynia, not to seek out the Christians, but, when charges were brought against them, to give them opportunity to recant, and, in case of refusal, to sacrifice them to the gods. The persecution under Trajan extended to Palestine and Syria. Under Hadrian, a.d. 117 to 138 and antoninus pius a.d. 138 to 161 the popular fury against the christians increased to great violence while these emperors granted the church no favor their attitude was less hostile than that of some of their predecessors marcus aurelius a.d. 161 to 180 was thoughtful and calm he was a stoic by profession and, while he had no warm reverence for the national religion, he showed no sympathy with the Christians. He was repelled by their devotion to Christ and their readiness to suffer. He tolerated violence, and under him the persecutions at Smyrna, where Polycarp suffered martyrdom, and at Lyon and Vienne, in Gaul, took place. There was now a slight relaxation of violence, but under Septimus Severus, a.d. 193 to 211, the Christians were treated with cruelty. The persecution was widespread, and the martyrdoms were numerous. Alexander Severus professed to be an eclectic in faith, and regarded Jesus as one of the gods. He placed a bust of Christ beside those of Abraham, Orpheus, and Apollonius of Tyana. He instituted no active measures of hostility. Decius had but a short reign, A.D. 249 to 251, and yet he improved his time industriously by endeavoring to exterminate the Christians. His persecution was general and as violent as that under Nero. The reign of Decius was succeeded by a brief interval of peace, which was brought to a close by the hostile attitude of Valerian, A.D. 253 to 260. Under Aurelian, Diocletian, Galerius, and Maximinus, the persecution raged with varied fury. Great political complications arose. The changes in the imperial succession were frequent, and new methods of repression of the Christians were constantly adopted. During the whole time, however, the Christian church grew in numbers and aggressive force. From A.D. 64 to 313, when Constantine granted an edict of toleration to the Christians, persecutions prevailed about seventy years. All forms of torture and violent death were adopted. There was no security at home. The exiles were numerous, but the Christians carried their faith and life with them to their new places of abode, where they built up societies, which in turn became centers for the wider dissemination of the gospel. Christianity had conquered in the realm of political life. It was now safe from the hand of any Roman ruler. End of chapter 5part 1 chapter 6 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 6 christian worship the christians were at first greatly attached to the temple in jerusalem they met within its precincts there was no disposition to erect separate sanctuaries and had there been the means to meet the expense were too limited in time, however, the hostility of the Jews made it impossible to convene in either the temple or any room near it. The Christians were, therefore, driven to private houses, where one room served the purpose of a sanctuary. A small platform, cathedra, served for the speaker or reader, while a table, ara, was used for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The services consisted chiefly of reading selections from the Old Testament, the Apostolical Epistles, and, latest of all, the Gospels. 
The reading was attended with copious exposition. The day of the elaborate homily, with a short scriptural passage as a mere motto, had not yet arrived. All that was said was meant to give to the hearer a deeper knowledge of the divine word. Singing of psalms and hymns was an important part of the service. It might be led by an individual, but the music was by the whole congregation. The psalms of David and the rhythmic parts of the prophecies furnished the favorite basis. Prayer was connected with the singing, and the congregation responded, Amen, at the close. The concluding part of the service was the Lord's Supper. Until about A.D. 150, the Agape, or Love Feast, was connected with the communion service, but, because of its abuse, was afterwards separated from it. After the prayer, the kiss of charity was given, and the apostolical benediction was pronounced. There were two sacraments in the early church, the Lord's Supper and Baptism. After the Council at Jerusalem, which abrogated the Jewish initiatory ceremonial as necessary for admission to the church, baptism was held to be the only visible condition of reception. The formula, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, was observed from the beginning of the apostolic church. With respect to the mode of baptism, on which there has been much discussion, there can be no doubt that in the age immediately succeeding, the apostolic immersion in water was nearly, if not quite, the universal custom. This is now established beyond question by the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, one of the earliest remains of post-apostolic literature. At the same time, it is now equally indisputable that sprinkling or pouring was allowed when immersion was impracticable, and some of the earliest frescoes represent this as though it were a common mode. But it was not till much later that the church entered into her full liberty, and restored what many consider the apostolic mode, and the one most accordant with the spirit of Christianity, as well as with the symbolism of the ordinances. The Sabbath, or seventh day, continued to be observed by the Christians who had entered the church from Judaism. But the Sunday, or first day of the week, was also observed in memory of the Lord's resurrection. Gradually the Sunday became more prominent, and finally the observances of the seventh day was discontinued entirely. Those members of the church who had been Jews were inclined to regard with reverence the festivals to which they had been accustomed in their former communion. These, however, they relinquished, with the exception of two, Easter and Pentecost, to which also the Gentile Christians adhered, as these festivals commemorated two great events in Christian history, our Lord's resurrection and the descent of the Spirit. End of chapter 6「Part One, Chapter Seven of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: The Life of Christians. Every part of Christian life was in direct antagonism to that of the pagan Greeks and Romans. The Christians obliterated all social and national differences. No sooner was a new member received than he found himself in the midst of a brotherhood. These Christians, says Bunsen, belonged to no nation and to no state, but their fatherland in heaven was to them a reality, and the love of the brethren, in truth and not in words, made the Christian congregation the foreshadowing of a Christian commonwealth, and a model for all ages to come. The relief of the poor and suffering received early attention. Paul collected contributions from the Greek Christians in Asia Minor for the poor in Jerusalem. All his epistles prove that the poor in each society were constantly in his mind. No needy body of believers was forgotten in its silent sorrow. When, later, persecutions became violent and widespread, the spirit of apostolic sympathy was sustained in all its fervor. The pagans neglected their needy. Their religion had no heart, but the Christians sought out the suffering and helped them with lavish hand. During the pestilence in North Africa, in the middle of the third century, 
the pagans deserted their sick and dying and stripped their bodies of valuables while the christians divided their means with the suffering cleared the streets of decomposing bodies and nursed the sick with tenderness and devotion the early prominence given to woman was an important factor elizabeth anna and mary the mother of jesus became early witnesses however unconscious to the dignity and worth of woman in the christian system the women mentioned by paul in his epistles were examples of devotion and wisdom in the spread of the gospel in times of persecution women presented a sublime spectacle of readiness and composure in the hour of death perpetua and felicitas who cheerfully welcomed martyrdom became types of womanly heroism in every part of christendom christianity triumphed not only in the broad field of territorial expansion but in the more subtle department of the whole structure of social life paganism was only a whited sepulchre its splendor was an exterior thing alone it created no happy homes for woman was without worth and children were no blessing wherever the christians lived they built up happy households there was no attempt made to emancipate slaves obedience on their part was inculcated spiritually free and equal to their masters their religious prerogatives did not elevate them above their station ignatius died about one fifteen counsels slaves to serve the more zealously that they may have the greater reward not until chrysostom in the fourth century do we find any discussion of the evils of slavery and proposals for a gradual emancipation at the same time christianity applied its humane spirit to the slave paul's chart of freedom ran thus there is neither bond nor free the slave the moment he became a christian became a brother with his master as christianity expanded its tendency was to bring the oppressed and the oppressor together upon a common plane of brotherly equality paul's appeal to philemon to show kindness to the slave onesimus and receive him back again was an index of the power of christianity to soften and even obliterate all the asperity attendant upon bondage in man end of chapter seven part one chapter eight of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight ecclesiastical organization the constitution of the early church was in part of divine ordering but this was only an outline the apostolate was fundamental and original but temporary it was designed as the great introductory force which should cease so soon as it had served its purpose from this as a basis the permanent orders of presbyter and deacon developed a large measure of liberty was left to the judgment of the church as new exigencies and larger growth might demand to the temporary officers belonged the apostles the condition was that the apostles must have seen christ in the flesh or in his risen state their work was evangelistic and organizing then came the prophets they were inspired by the holy ghost for the special work of teaching higher revelations foretelling events was not their controlling function but the revelation of god's will especially in the choice of persons for great service in the church the prophet was not necessarily an apostle but the apostle was a prophet paul agabus simeon barnabas menaean judas the evangelist and silas belonged to the prophetic class after them came the evangelists they were preachers without defined limits and were aids to the apostles or as rotney says apostolic delegates their work was preparatory the preaching in new societies until organization was established philip timothy titus silas or sylvanus luke john mark clement and epaphras belonged to the evangelist class the bishops or presbyters were the highest permanent officers the word bishop episcopos 
was of Greek origin, and was in common use among both Greeks and Romans as a political supervisor. The societies of the West, which consisted of members from paganism, used the word for the chief or superintending pastor, as they were already familiar with it. The converts from Judaism naturally took the synagogue as their model, and as the elder pastor, Presbyteros, was the chief or superintending pastor of the synagogue, they applied it to the chief pastor of the Christian church. There was not the least difference in the original duties of the bishop and the presbyter. In each case, he was the spiritual head of one church or society. Later, when churches increased, and the supervising office was of wider scope, the western word supplanted the eastern, and the term bishop was used, while that of presbyter went into the background. But the bishop, in the early and pure period of the church, was of no higher order than the presbyter. The duties of one were those of both, to feed the flock of God, taking the oversight thereof. 1 Peter 5, verse 2. The deacons were both an order and an office. The duties were minutely described in the scriptures. Acts 4, verses 1 to 8. They aided the apostles, had care of the poor and sick, assisted in administering the Lord's Supper, and preached. The deaconesses were a special office designed for caring for the sick, the aged, the female poor, and the instruction of orphans. End of chapter 8「Part One, Chapter Nine of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: Abianism and Gnosticism. Christianity was making steady progress in every field. Some of the more advanced thinkers, in both Judaism and paganism, saw in the Christian system so much that commended itself to universal confidence that each proposed to adapt it to his own faith and philosophy. This was a new plan, more dangerous to Christianity by far than outward opposition. In each case, the overture was strengthened by people within the Christian fold, who responded to the flattering proposition, though without representing the spirit of the whole body. After the council in Jerusalem, which settled the great Pauline principle of the freedom of Christian converts from the Mosaic law, there remained a body of Christians who would not accept the conclusion. Jerusalem was their center. They were of two classes, those who saw in Christianity the fulfillment of all that was worthy in Judaism, and those who were more conservative and refused to acknowledge the new faith as the culmination of Mosaism. Out of these two tendencies sprang Ebionism. It held that the Mosaic law was still in force. Its close observance was a necessity for salvation. Christianity fulfilled the law, but did not abrogate it. Christ was the prophet of Israel's deliverance. He was a mere man, his generation was natural, the divine spirit entered him at baptism. Christ was a good Jew, his piety was his claim to messiahship, he performed miracles, and he supplemented the law by his own commands. The Ebionites rejected Paul's writings as not Jewish enough. They had communities in Asia Minor, Cyprus, and in Rome, and existed down to the fourth century. The Nazareans more nearly approached Christianity. They accepted Paul's writings and held that Christ was the Son of God, and that his generation was divine. They disappeared in the fourth century. The Elsesaites, or Sampsians, were of similar Jewish proclivities, but had a stronger Oriental element in their faith. They kept the Jewish Sabbath, retained sacrifices, held that oil and salt were emblems of spiritual communication, and prayed with their faces towards the sun. The Gnostic system was a combination of the new Platonic philosophy with Oriental theosophy, the two proposing to appropriate certain Christian elements. Philo, a learned Jew of Alexandria, born about B.C. 20, furnished the most decided contribution. He aimed to unite Judaism and Platonism. 
he regarded god and the world as forming a dualism both finite and infinite he believed that god could not assume visible form but can reveal himself to the soul the logos was a divine emanation which the holy spirit the divine wisdom imparted directly to the first men and to all who have since striven after likeness to god from the fundamental ideas of philo the great gnostic system developed into special systems but all of them were strained accommodations to christian ideas Cerinthus, a d one hundred was the earliest representative of the jewish form of this strange philosophy he held that judaism was the world's preparation for christianity that jesus was the natural son of joseph and mary and arrived at his pure state at baptism and by his holy life that his death was not a mediatorial service but that he would come again and establish a vast earthly kingdom basilides taught in alexandria about a d one thirty he held that the universe is a dualism deity and matter between these there is a great multitude of eons or emanations from god who record his glory and make it fruitful each nation is ruled by an eon the jewish eon taught by means of moses and the prophets but truth was universal greeks jews and persians shared it the highest eon was accorded to jesus at his baptism basilides was cautious not committing himself to any of the extremes which constituted the body of the gnostic system valentinian a d one thirty eight first taught at alexandria but afterwards removed to rome he was at first a christian but withdrew from the church he borrowed his chief ideas from plato his fundamental doctrine was emanation the supreme god lives in silence and solitude but to be perfect he must love and in order to love there must be an object so he began to emanate the eons are personalities which emanate from him man the logos and the church are divine emanations man is redeemed through the logos the crucifixion represented the divine might by which the world is purified from sin valentinian was the founder of the largest gnostic school his chief disciples were heraclion ptolemaeus and bardesanes the ophites serpent worshippers were the first of this class they existed as a small sect in egypt at the time of christ and afterwards adopted a perverted type of christianity but retained a large measure of oriental theosophy the pleroma or highest spirit develops itself in eons and from the fourth one there floats a ray of light which combines with matter and becomes the world soul man is created to defeat his elevation the serpent is prepared the serpent becomes the type of all wisdom and is worthy of worship man by his fall first arrives at the consciousness of freedom and mastery there were two minor ophite sects the canites and the sethians carpocrates built his system out of fragments of buddhism and neoplatonism he placed all faiths on the same plane orpheus pythagoras plato and christ were quite the same according to him his sect denigrated into wild libertinism in Mani and the Manichaeans, we reach the limits of Oriental Gnosticism. Mani made the faith of Zoroaster the basis of his system, but added a superstructure of Buddhism and Christianity. Fatalism pervaded the whole structure. The sect continued down to the end of the third century, when Diocletian issued an edict for its suppression. The Ophites elevated man to supreme importance their estimate has been characterized in the following lines o thou citizen of heaven thou much praised man from thee comes father through thee comes mother those two immortal names the parents of the eons saturninus who died about a d one seventy four held that the supreme father has produced by intermediate archangels and powers seven angels who are the sovereigns of the material world 
among them is the god of the jews man was created but with infirmities the saviour came to aid him towards final development tatian was a native of assyria but emigrated to rome his chief tenet was antagonism to marriage he died in a d one seventy four the anaritites and hudopastrians were followers of tatian the tendency to decline was manifested in all the gnostic schools marcion who lived about a d one fifty and his followers represented the reformatory movement he avoided all the extremes of his predecessors but leaned towards christianity he recognized paul as the only veritable apostle admitted one gospel a distortion of luke and rejected all tradition and esoteric doctrines in his later years he is said to have regretted his gnostic vagaries and to have sought readmission to the church of all gnostics he was the nearest approach to the true christian the service which gnosticism rendered to the church was to make the pagan mind acquainted with some fundamental christian truths to disintegrate the fabric of the pagan philosophy and to prove by its own fruitless endeavors the impossibility of combining any system with christianity it also stimulated to theological investigation and to the study of the scriptures basilides and heraclion were the first to comment upon the whole gospels gnosticism helped towards the elevation of the bishops and to a higher regard for the rites and doctrines received from the apostles the gnostics were a proud class they set out with claims to all knowledge approached christianity as they would any other faith and proposed to weigh it in their own small balance they made reason the test of religion and were devoid of all appreciation of the spiritual life the danger to christianity of all the gnostic systems was in winning christians to the adoption of them but the christian teachers were prompt in giving warning of their dangerous nature and no great secession to them ever occurred the christians as a body regarded the gnostics with aversion because of the claim of many of them that they believed in the best part of christianity while marcion was the nearest approach to the christian the interview of polycarp with him one day as the two met in a street in rome indicates the christian hostility to all gnostics polycarp was stopped by marcion who said do you not recognize me the father replied promptly certainly i do i know the first-born of satan end of chapter nine part one chapter ten of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain the pagan literary attack the growing importance of christianity in the mind of the pagan world became very apparent in the attempts now made in literature to destroy its very foundations by the beginning of the second century it became evident to the cultivated romans that something more than imperial opposition was necessary to arrest the new faith every persecution left christianity more solid aggressive and hopeful than it found it during the second and third centuries the two hostile forces proceeded together the sword and the pen each pursued its own path and each hoped to win by help from the other the christians met the imperial opposition by non-resistance but ceaseless evangelization they met the antagonism of literature by such bold and masterful logic and by such strong appeal to facts that the whole structure of paganism was shaken by their arguments the greek and roman writers saw in christianity certain peculiarities well calculated to give them alarm they had to deal with a new historical phenomenon they saw first that the new religion was based upon certain writings reaching back to the dawn of history and culminating later in the life of the founder and in the exposition of his doctrines second that there was an historical basis for christianity third that it dealt with fundamental moral themes fourth that the people professing faith in the doctrines never grew weary of them 
fifth that the doctrines developed pure and heroic lives sixth that the scriptural cosmogony was more reasonable and consistent than that of hesiod seventh that the character of christ was without a blemish and eighth that his death had imparted to his followers a zeal which nothing had been able to arrest to overcome such a system was a serious problem but both greek and roman writers with much self-consciousness did not hesitate to undertake the task of demolition the wise methods by which their work was met by christian writers and the fearless spirit in which the latter wrought was a great surprise it was one of the wonders of all literature the hostile attitude of even general historians can be seen in mere allusions tacitus dismisses the subject by saying that christ was the founder of a new sect that he had been crucified by pontius pilate that his system was a deadly superstition and that the christians were obnoxious to the human race antoninus says that the soul must be ready to leave the body by a mere wilful rejection of the evils of existence juvenal sneered at the christian adoration of the heavens arian reports epictetus as protesting against the galilean fearlessness of danger and the doctrine that god created all things lucian was as severe on christianity as on all other religions all of which he cast into a common vortex of worthlessness he called christ a magician and parodied the career of jonah our lord's walking on the sea of galilee and john's description of the new jerusalem the literary men of the roman empire looked upon christianity as a miserable superstition too contemptible for candid consideration when tacitus called it a pernicious superstition excitia bilis superstitio he represented the sentiments of the haughty intellectualism of paganism celsus porphyry and hercules were the strongest assailants of christianity celsus lived about a d one fifty he held to a chief deity a superintending providence and the immortality of the soul these views he derived from the platonic philosophy but when he examined christianity he lost sight of the parallel of these fundamental truths with the christian system his antagonism was bitter he assailed the old testament but levelled his attacks chiefly against the alleged weaknesses in the career and character of jesus periphery born about a d two thirty three aimed to show that the pagan world presented higher magical characters than jesus and that the gospel history abounds in hopeless contradictions his candid treatise against the christians was an attempt to show a parallel between the sorcery of apollonius of tyana and jesus with a large balance in favor of the former obscurer writers followed willingly in the footprints of the leaders satire fiction poetry indeed all forms of literary effort were employed to hold up christianity to contempt the principal grounds of hostility were one the alleged contradictions in the scriptures two the uselessness of christians to the existing state of society three the philosophical absurdity of the christian system four the claim of the humanity of jesus at the same time with that of divinity five the immorality of christians this charge was based upon the secret meetings of christians it was never seriously believed on the contrary the moral life of believers stood out in beautiful contrast to the pagan immorality that sorcery should be confounded with bad morals was natural to the pagan mind familiar with the nameless licentiousness and wild communism connected with the illusionism and other mysteries this and all the other charges were summed up by tertullian in a single sentence which he placed in the mouth of universal paganism as its final argument against the christians you have no right to exist the most which the pagan writers could hope from their attack was to prevent new accessions to the church they wrote for the pagan mind not with any view to disturbing the christian's faith in his own religion this they were not so foolish as to imagine possible the christian body was too firmly knit to give ground for such a delusive expectation 
no serious defection ever occurred because of the pagan attack. On the contrary, the numbers steadily increased. But the main object also failed completely. Paganism was in process of disintegration, and while the assailants flattered themselves that they were achieving a literary success, the result was a total disappointment. The pagan walls were failing too rapidly to be propped up, it was an effort for the impossible. Even the well-timed attack of Celsius owes its preservation to the pen of Origen. End of chapter 10「Part 1, Chapter 11 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. The Christian Defenders we now come to a brighter picture. The writing in defense of Christianity is called the Apology, and the writer an apologist. It is from the Greek word apologia, which meant a work written for resistance. But the apologies of the early church were more than this. They were not only counter-arguments, but aggressive weapons. It was a fierce warfare upon the enemy's camp, followed by a hot pursuit. There were two classes of apologists, the Greek and the Latin, according to the territory in which they occupied and the language in which they wrote. But there were further differences. The Greeks belonged mostly to the second century, and their writings exhibited a profound intimacy with the Greek philosophy. Some of them had studied in the Greek schools and entered the church only in mature life. They endeavored to prove that Christianity was the blossom of all that was valuable in every system. They stood largely on the defensive. The Latins, on the other hand, were aggressive. They lived mostly in the third century, were more argumentative, wrote in a clearer and more methodical style, and carried the warfare into the hostile ranks with an energy equal to the Roman soldier on foreign battlefields. Their perspective of Christianity was that of universal conquest and permanent dominion. The principal Greek apologists were Aristo, Quadratus, Aristides, Justin, Melito, Miltiades, Irenaeus, Athenagoras, Tatian, Clement of Alexandria, Hippolytus, and Origen. Aristo's dialogue between Papiscos and Jason was an attempt to prove the truth of Christianity and the messiahship of Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Quadratus addressed an apology to Hadrian, A.D. 131, with a view to stop the persecutions of the Christians. Aristides proved Christianity the culmination of the best systems in the classic world, and the one which should supersede all else. Justin wrote two apologies, A.D. 136 and A.D. 162, showing that the Christians were not responsible for public calamities, that they were true Roman citizens, that pagan philosophy and mythology abound in falsehood and contradiction, and that the only source of truth is the scriptures. Athenagoras, in his Embassy of the Christians, applied a philosophical method to Christian defense. Tatian, who died about A.D. 176, wrote an address to the Greeks, showing the ridiculous origin of the Greek religion and science. Clement, in his Pedagogue and the Stromata, exposed the emptiness of the whole pagan fabric. Hippolytus wrote against the pagans, the Platonic philosophy, and the Jews. Origen, born A.D. 185, wrote a work consisting of eight books against Celsus, in which he exposed the weakness of the whole pagan structure. Tertullian stands at the head. His Apologeticus, written about A.D. 200, is the most brilliant piece of apologetic writing in the early church. He showed that persecution was no final damage to the Christians. His other writings covered nearly every contested point. The supernatural element in Christianity was brought by him into great prominence, and defended with masterly skill. Cyprian wrote about the middle of the third century. His attack on pagan idolatry was merciless, and could not be answered. Arnobius, about AD 303, 
surpassed all the apologists in his use of the miracles of Jesus as a weapon of Christian attack. Lactantius, the Christian Cicero, wrote his Divine Institutions, A.D. 320. Footnote. The date here, A.D. 320, is of the second edition, addressed to Constantine. It was written 307 to 310, or perhaps earlier. End footnote. His strength lay less in the force of his argument than in the purity and beauty of his style. The objection that Christians were disloyal to the state was met by the answer that they were true to the emperor, obeyed all laws which did not interfere with Christianity, never conspired against the government, and never produced robbers, assassins, or traitors. Purity of life was proven as the outgrowth of pure doctrines. Tertullian said, quote, we live a life free from reproach, we live among you, you can see us every day, end quote. To the charge that natural calamities were produced by the Christians, he replied, quote, Why do you suffer too? Why do your gods let you have these trials? End quote. The inspiration of the scriptures and purity of doctrine were fundamental arguments in all the apologetic writings. To these came the divine character of Jesus. When the assailants repelled the miraculous power of Jesus, the apologists replied, quote, Do you not say that your Aesculapius restores the lame in the halt, that your Orpheus, Zeno, and Cleanthes know the Logos, and that Plato, in a letter to Hermias and Coriscus, speaks of a son of God? End quote. The purity of Christian morals was held up by the apologists in striking antagonism to the sensuality of paganism, which could produce only caricatures of good morals. The origin of the pagan gods was exposed with fearless skill. The apologists said, with Tatian, quote, What has become of your Juno that she produces no more gods? End quote. Arnobius said defiantly, quote, Your gods abound in passion. Some are drunkards, others are murderers, and multitudes are licentious. End quote. When this battle of three centuries was over, it was easy to see that the victory of the Christian writers was complete. It began with the pagan expectation of destroying the logical basis of Christianity, but ended by the exposure of the corruption of the Greek and Roman faith and the weakness of the boasted philosophy. Every department of Christian truth was defended by the apologists. Their arguments broke down the opposition, while they constitute a storehouse of Christian defense, to which all later Christian writers have appealed with success. The indirect service of the attacks to the church was great, in that all Christians were compelled to study the groundwork of Christianity on every side. The laity were driven to read their Bible. The private member, over all Christendom, could give a reason for the faith that was in him. By the end of the fifth century, the conflict was over. The apologists were the last to leave the field. The Christian now lived in a larger place. He was marching on to universal conquest. The words of one of the apologists expressed the attitude of all believers. Quote, every country is the Christian's fatherland, and every fatherland is the Christian's country. End, quote. End of section 11. Part 1, Chapter 12 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The Christian Schools. From whatever side the Christian convert came, he brought with him the love of the school. For ministerial training, the Jews had, from distant times, the prophetic schools under the care of their wisest teachers. In Atheus, Tarsus, and Alexandria, the Greeks possessed celebrated universities, which even Roman students attended, for the completion of studies pursued in Italy. The proper dealing with both Christian and pagan thought made a thorough ministerial culture necessary. The preacher of the early church lived in an atmosphere of opposition, and, to succeed, he must be well acquainted with not only the truth he would defend, but with the false system he would combat. The life of St. Paul furnished a remarkable illustration of this. 
the whole tendency of his character career and acquisitions was on the side of careful training timothy and titus represented a group of young men who were inducted into christianity through the labors of that apostle and by personal attendance on his journeys were prepared to succeed him and the other apostles it was a beautiful legend of the whole period that the aged john stood at the head of a theological school in ephesus whither young men flocked from all quarters to gather from him memorabilia of our lord's ministry and personality by the middle of the second century there were three great christian schools the most important was that of alexandria this city was the chief seat of philosophical culture in the world after the destruction of the literary prestige of athens all currents of thought from both east and west flowed thither for two centuries plato because of the sway of neoplatonism was a familiar name here christianity and pagan learning came into close conflict and finally the christian school took the place of the pagan university the catechetical or socratic element prevailed at first the most active period of this school covered two centuries a d two hundred to four hundred pantinus was the founder he and clement stood at its head in the second century origen heracles and dionysius in the third and didymus the blind in the fourth in addition to these we may reckon gregory thaumaturgus petrus pamphilus and eusebius who though not formally connected with it yet sympathized with its tendencies the theological characteristics were sympathy with the better greek philosophy an emphasis on intuition and the subjective life, and a disposition to allegorize the Old Testament narratives. Origen, though brilliant, was an unsafe guide, especially in his adoption of an indefinite series of creations, the soul's pre-existence, a pre-Adamite apostasy, and a final universal restoration. The school of Asia Minor consisted less in a formal educational center than in a group of theological writers and teachers. The whole region had been a scene of active theological thought since Paul's day. In the second century it leaned towards a literal and Judaistic type of Christianity, but in the third it assumed a broader character. It opposed Gnosticism and suppressed Montanism polycarp papias melito of sardis and hegesippus were its leaders in the first period and irenaeus hippolytus and julius africanus in the second the chief pursuit of the school of antioch in syria was the criticism of the sacred text and the statement of doctrinal theology its founders were dorotheus and lucianus at first it sympathized with the alexandrian school but was alienated on the rise of originistic and nestorian controversies its most prosperous period was a d three hundred to three forty two theodorus eusebius of emesa cyril apollinaris ephraim diodorus john chrysostom and theodore of mopsuestia belonged to it the centre of the school of north africa was carthage to this place and not to rome latin christianity was indebted for its prevailing type cyprian tertullian minutius felix commodianus and arnobans were its leading representatives it was distinguished for its heroic zeal for the unity of the church for aversion to gnosticism for an exact and literal biblical interpretation for an abhorrence of theological speculation and for energy in developing the practical and evangelistic side of the church its period of greatest prosperity was a d two hundred to three thirty the general tendency of the schools was to lead the church in its doctrinal and general literary development they were rallying points for christian defense and for broader plans of christian work their influence extended throughout the christian world many men were drawn towards them from the most distant regions imbibed their spirit and either went back as preachers and teachers into their own country or far away into new regions to extend christianity some of the teachers as origen were of wonderfully magnetic spirit 
and imparted both their energy and doctrines to younger minds. End of section 12「Part One, Chapter Thirteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Liberation under Constantine. We have now come to consider the outward relations of the Church. What was the bearing of the Empire upon Christianity? The period of persecution was passing away. The Church, meanwhile, was not despondent but making full plans for future triumph. A revolution in the imperial policy was close at hand, and the forces were in full play which should soon bring about the liberation of all Christendom. By the military successes of Constantine, who, A.D. 306, was called from the command of the army in Britain to succeed his father as Roman emperor. But, before getting securely in place, he had to conquer five competitors— three in the east and two in the west. It mattered not that some were blood relatives. Kinship was only a trifle in those days, and soon Constantine had disposed of all contestants to his claim to his father's crown. Constantine declared himself a Christian in sympathy early in his reign. Before the decisive battle of the Rubra Saxa with Maxentius, which should secure his rule, he claimed to see in the sky the sign of the cross, with the words, En toto nika, by this conquer. He accepted the token as an argument in favor of Christianity, gained the battle for the crown of the Roman Empire, and henceforth avowed his belief in Christianity. His vision, though in the line of his sympathies, was probably only a shrewd method to attract the Christians to his support. He carried the liberum, a standard inscribed with the cross, in all his subsequent wars. His policy was at first to make all Christians the supporters of his rule, and, by granting concessions, to heal the alienation from the empire which the repressive policy of his predecessors had produced. He published, A.D. 313, an edict tolerating Christianity as one of the legal religions of the empire but in the year 323 he enlarged the scope of his favor, and made Christianity the established faith of all his dominions. Among the chief special acts of Constantine in favor of the church may be mentioned his ordering the civil observance of Sunday, his confiscation in the east of pagan temples for Christian churches, his emancipation of slaves, his exemption of the clergy from military and municipal duty, and his ardent promotion of Christian education among his subjects. The good and the bad were employed in the imperial support. It was a happy day when the Christians could walk abroad without fear of persecution. But there were grounds for concern. Constantine left but little for the church to do for its own government. He claimed the right to supervise religion, as the emperor had always done in the case of paganism. He accounted himself still the great high priest, or Pontifex Maximus, and claimed the prerogative to compose differences, decide questions of religious policy, call ecclesiastical councils, and appoint the leading officers. Then again he retained many pagan institutions. The heathen temples were supported out of the state treasury, certain respect was paid to the national divinities, and even soothsayers were still used for help in battle. Constantine was a mixed character, not willing to lose the sympathy of the pagan citizens, and yet clear-headed enough to see that further hostility to Christianity would be fatal to his rule. He had no faith in paganism, but would not suppress it. His line of conduct was to allow it to go on as he found it, and yet to help the Christians to conquer it. He was, of all successful rulers, the most successful trimmer. The course of Constantine was attended with serious danger to the church. This did not arise from the assumption of guardianship over its affairs, but from making the whole Christian body a part of the machinery of state, and employing the state as the supreme judge of its inner and outward life. Hitherto the church had been a grand moral unity, 
held together by ties of love and doctrine but now it was absorbed by the state its framework was lost in the body politic freeman says the church conquered the state this is a great error constantine's adoption of christianity as the state religion was the conquest of the church by the state all the moral forces of the church were now impaired the bondage of the church to the state thus early begun produced the great evils of the following twelve centuries superstition the purchase of office the angry controversy about theological trifles the moral corruption of the clergy and the ignorance of the masses milton in his translation of a passage of dante's inferno thus characterizes the evil of constantine's favor Quote, ah constantine of how much ill was cause not thy conversion but those rich domains that the first wealthy pope received of thee End quote. charlemagne and not constantine was the first to confer temporal power on the papacy dante was not far astray however for constantine's patronage was the entering wedge for charlemagne's donation neander says with truth quote, the reign of constantine bears witness that the state which seeks to establish christianity by the worldly means at its command may be the occasion of more injury to the holy cause than the earthly power which opposes it with whatever force End quote. constantine could have helped the church greatly by simply removing all political disabilities and permitting the christians to develop their polity and spiritual forces as god might lead End of chapter 13part one chapter fourteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen reaction under julian the three sons of constantine divided their father's empire among themselves not one was his equal on the battlefield or in government but each pursued his father's policy of favoring the christian religion the christians were uncertain as to what would be the result when constantine's immediate family should have passed away the outlook was far from flattering when julian came to the throne there were grave apprehensions that he would renew the old war upon the christians for a time he was silent but after a while he exhibited a spirit of refined opposition to all christian institutions and doctrines julian's antecedents were calculated to prejudice his mind against christianity he was a nephew of constantine and was practically imprisoned in cappadocia because of supposed danger to the rule of constantine's sons he was educated in the languages and sciences under the oversight of the arian bishop eusebius and was prepared for clerical service as a lector but he regarded himself a victim of christian persecution in time he acquired liberty by his brother gallus becoming emperor in the east he visited constantinople became acquainted with the pagan philosophy and studied and adopted divination on the death of gallus a d three fifty four he was carried a prisoner to milan on his release he went to athens and was initiated into the mysteries of eleusis the reign of julian began in a d three fifty five at first he shared the empire with constantius but on the latter's death julian was declared by his soldiers the supreme ruler of the roman empire on the bank of the seine where the hotel clugny the heart of old paris now stands he early developed great military skill and was successful in war he here disappointed every one for he had been supposed to be only a recluse and a man of books he regarded constantine's family as fair christian representatives and hence he rejected christianity and revolutionized the imperial policy he took up his abode in constantinople and adopted immediate measures to convert it into a pagan city his one great object was to suppress christianity and restore paganism to its old grandeur but with such improvements as might be derived from oriental or any other sources 
he issued no formal edict against Christianity, but raised barriers on every hand. He claimed that his philosophy taught him toleration of all faiths, but this was a thin disguise. He was bitter towards the religion of Christ. The principal measures by which Julian sought to suppress Christianity were, one, his encouragement of schism and strife among Christians, two, the prohibition of Christian schools of learning and the study of classic authors by Christians in the belief that Christianity could not exist without the classic basis. 3. His removal of disabilities from the Jews, and his proposed, but abortive, restoration of the temple at Jerusalem, that he might prove the falsity of Christ's prediction, Matthew 23, 38, and 24, 2. 4 his requirement that the soldiers should attend pagan worship. 5. His withdrawal of existing immunities from the clergy. 6. His failure to punish his heathen subjects for deeds of violence against Christians. 7. His punishment of Christians for the slightest offenses. His support of pagan services and the rebuilding of the temples at public expense. And 8. His authorship of a work, now lost, in defense of paganism. Julian's reign was short, lasting only twenty months. He died while on a campaign against the Persians, A.D. 363. It was currently believed by the Christians that his last words were, Tandem visisti Galilea. Thou, O Galilean, hast conquered after all. Footnote. This is a legend for which there is no foundation. End footnote. He was a compound of elements not often found in one individual. He was fanatical in his treatment of the Christians, shrewd in political plans, brilliant as a military commander, cultivated in all the learning of his age, vain in the extreme, and wildly superstitious. He not only believed that Christianity was sure to die, but that he was the destined instrument to kill it. He had the egotism to believe that he excelled in literary work, an infirmity for which royal authors have generally been distinguished. Like Frederick the Great, he was never so weak as with pen in hand. His proposed new eclectic religion was heterogeneous beyond description. It was a mixture of Neoplatonic speculation, the arts of jugglery, the moralizings of Rome's best Stoic thinkers, and the wild dreams of Persian fire-worshippers. Here and there a grain of the golden truth of the Bible was dropped in, but not enough to cover the glaring shallowness of the general scheme. His god was the Mithra, or sun-god of the east, beneath whom were numerous tutelary divinities, derived from Grecian paganism and Alexandrian Gnosticism. His methods of rehabilitating paganism were on the Christian plan he re-established the priesthood on the basis of the Christian ministry. His pagan bishops preached to the people and expounded the pagan mythologies. He foisted into pagan use the constitution of the church, provided for penance, excommunication, absolution, and restoration, twisted Christian psalmody into the heathen rites, whose choirs chanted and congregations responded after the most approved ecclesiastical mode and provided hospitals for the sick, destitute, and orphans, and gave alms after the manner of the Christian diaconate. But all failed. Even an emperor could not mix Christianity and paganism. He was the last ruler on the Roman throne who was hostile to Christianity. He passed into history as Julian the Apostate. The epithet is probably a misapplication, as it is not likely that Julian was ever a real disciple of Christ. Two of his teachers, Mardonius and Ecabolius, were strongly tinged with the spirit of paganism, and he early imbibed a profound hatred to the religion of his persecutors. End of chapter 14「Part 1 Chapter 15 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Monastic Reform During the persecutions of the first three centuries, some of the Christians relapsed into paganism. 
a portion of these afterwards regretted their apostasy and wished to return to the church and be received as penitents within the church there prevailed two sentiments concerning them a lax view which exacted but little more of the penitent than a pledge of future fidelity and a severe view which kept the applicant for readmission on a long probation and in many instances would not receive him at all these two views however took a wider range than the readmission of the lapsed into the church the imperial favor was already bringing in disorders of many kinds many christians both east and west protested against them while the more wealthy saw no real danger to vital christianity by making certain social concessions the former and stricter class found expression in the life and career of montanus a native phrygian montanus a d one fifty six like the people among whom he was reared was fond of the marvellous and ecstatic the old national worship was that of cybele who was here honoured as nowhere else divination and clairvoyance were believed to be priestly endowments political disaster only fanned the flame of devotion to cybele in time christianity made its way among the people and here grew up some of those churches of asia such as laodicea and colossi to which john addressed epistles but the natural temperament remained undisturbed and the people carried into christianity the same firm fidelity to their new faith which they had entertained towards paganism the followers of montanus demanded a return to the apostolical life of the church he had been a priest of cybele and when he became a christian he was as warm for his new faith as he had been for his old one there was not a trace of idolatry left in him but his nature was quite the same he remained the visionary and the prophet he proposed to regenerate the life of all christendom he saw departures from the old simplicity and purity which he regarded himself as the chosen instrument for removing his place therefore was that of the reformer it was an obscure region to produce a man of such superior claims but he stood out before the whole christian world as the representative of the old and pure faith montanus combined the practical and visionary to a remarkable degree he claimed that there are three persons in the godhead father son and spirit and that through the third person the paraclete god prophesied to the world the world will speedily end and then the millennial reign of christ will begin the real church is the pure church nothing but absolute purity must be allowed in it there is a universal priesthood of believers penitence must take place after sin but sacrificing again to idols should exclude from total restoration to the church but god may still forgive the expansion of montanism went rapidly on communities sprang up not in phrygia alone but in many other regions they were small societies in the general church ecclesiole in ecclesia like the pietistic organizations within the bosom of the german protestant church in the seventeenth century the bishop julianus tried to win them back but failing adopt severer methods two councils were held at both of which the montanists were condemned rome favored their cause at first but afterwards settled down into a sentiment of firm opposition the looser discipline of the western christians was not likely to harmonize with it but in gaul there was a close sympathy where the bonds between the christians and those of asia minor had always been very close in north africa the view of montanus gained new favor and great prestige through the support of tertullian he advocated the universal necessity of a stricter discipline and eliminated some of the vagaries of original montanism his name gave it new respectability but with even this great advantage the system was doomed the condemnation by the councils the visionary speculations of montanus and the preeminence of ecstasy vision and chiliasm in the movement were as millstones about its neck its stronger qualities were overlooked in the vigorous warfare upon it the episcopacy found it an inconvenient thing 
as its tendency was to curtail the episcopal prerogative montanism was bitterly opposed to all centralization of authority the roman emperors opposed it everywhere at last it disappeared even in phrygia and is found only in a sect in north africa bearing the name tertullianists justinian issued two edicts against montanism a d five thirty to five thirty two after which it sank beneath the waves of more exciting questions end of chapter fifteen part one chapter sixteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen controversies on christ rise of arianism the principal scene of this important controversy was alexandria palestine and constantinople the question was concerning the divinity of christ both jews and pagans very early united in opposing this doctrine believing that it was vital to the christians john's gospel the inspired apology proves how early our lord's divine character was assailed later there came as accessories towards a low christological view the vague teachings of the antiochian school and the incongruities of the theology of origin the period during which the controversy lasted is divided into two parts a d three eighteen to three sixty one and three sixty one to three eighty one arius was a presbyter of alexandria he derived his theological ideas from the antiochian school which emphasized the unity of the divine nature and looked with great alarm on any doctrine which would seem to destroy it the outbreak in alexandria took place a d three eighteen alexander bishop of alexandria advocated the eternal sonship of christ and his equality with the father arius opposed him holding that there was a time when the son did not exist that having a beginning he cannot be of the same essence with the father that he was a creature and not creator that he was divinely illumined and therefore the logos that he is subordinate to the father and that the holy ghost is subordinate to the son the issue was clearly defined for a time alexandria was the sole scene of the controversy and the participants were the bishop and his presbyter alexander called a synod in alexandria when arius was deposed but violent opposition arose to this summary dealing with a man of the pure life of arius the scene now widened constantine the emperor ordered the contestants to stop the quarrel but no attention was paid to the command the strife raged with increased bitterness when the emperor was informed by hosius bishop of cordova whom he had sent as a special messenger to alexandria to inquire into the state of affairs that the controversy was no trifling matter and would not cease at a mere order he convened a council the council of nicaea a d 325 was the most important assembly of the early church it was attended by representatives from every part of christendom even india sent its bishop there were about three hundred bishops besides many of the inferior clergy constantine arrived during the session and presided over the deliberations athanasius stood at the head of the orthodox party the result of the council was the condemnation of arius and the passing of the celebrated nicene creed arius now became an exile in illyria constantine influenced by the persuasions of certain bishops but particularly by the entreaties of constantia widow of the emperor licinius invited arius to his court ordered athanasius to receive him back into the church and threatened deposition and banishment in case of refusal athanasius replied that he could not acknowledge as christian those whom the whole church had condemned the emperor then ceased his importunities but the arians made constantine believe that athanasius was a political enemy charging him with preventing the sailing of the egyptian fleet with supplies for constantinople he was thereupon banished to treves in gaul a d three thirty six the subsequent history of arian opinions was checkered 
Athanasius and Arius stood before the Christian world as the representatives of orthodoxy and heterodoxy. The changes in imperial sympathy were frequent, the Arians enjoying quite as much the sunshine of the palace as their orthodox adversaries. The general council of Sardica in Illyria, AD 343, renewed the conclusions of Nicaea, but Arian opinions still gained ground in the east, while in the west the opposition was only tacit and negative. When Julian gained the throne, he recalled Athanasius from exile, but afterwards banished him again. That ruler was ready for any measure by which Christians could be pitted against each other. The Council of Constantinople, AD 381, condemned the Arians once more, and two years later the Emperor Theodosius issued an edict against them. In the remoter parts of the empire they gained strength. Some of the ruder tribes adopted their view. Ulfilas was a Gothic bishop of Arian views. The celebrated Codex Argentius, now preserved in the University of Uppsala, Sweden, was his translation of the four Gospels into the Mesogothic language of the end of the fourth century. The Vandals and Moors of North Africa became Arians, but were conquered because of a rebellion during the reign of Justinian. Gradually the heresy disappeared alike from the centers and the outlying provinces. By the end of the sixth century, the only Arian people left were the Lombards of Italy. The Arian controversy was remarkable for its wide extent and the number and character of the men engaged in it. Some laughed at it as a fight over a Greek letter, but it involved the very heart of Christianity. It prevented Christianity from ever dwindling away into a mere religion of culture, a philosophy without saving power, by bringing it into the full consciousness of its divine origin. Many of the Arians were men in thorough sympathy with the Christian faith, but they did not, and probably could not, see the full logical result of their views. End of chapter 16Part 1, Chapter 17 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The Later Controversies. The new issues were largely related to the person of Christ. The Arian strife turned entirely upon his divine nature, but questions connected directly with this doctrine arose which absorbed universal attention and continued long after the Arian controversy had ceased to divide the Christian world. These new issues related to the person of Christ in his incarnate existence. The singular characteristics of these collateral controversies, which were separate currents flowing out of the Arian fountain, lie in the fact that they became permanent factors in the church. For from them have come the present Coptic and Nestorian churches, with some smaller subdivisions of Oriental Christianity. Apollinaris believed that the prevalent Christian view of the two natures of Christ savored of both Judaism and paganism. He held that the divine Logos first attained a personal existence in the man Jesus, that full divinity and humanity in one were impossible, and that the human is only the organ for revealing the divine. By ignoring the essential features of our Lord's humanity, and involving it with the divine to such an extent that it had become a mixed essence, Apollinaris subjected himself to the charge of heresy. His opinions were condemned by the synods of Rome, A.D. 375 and 378, by the Council of Constantinople, A.D. 381, and by the imperial decrees, A.D. 388, 397, and 428. Apollinaris withdrew from the church in A.D. 375 and died A.D. 390. The Nestorian controversy raged over a broad territory and excelled all others of the time in its vigorous vitality and its power to project itself into the later ages. It was another product of the restless and inventive Antioch. Nestorius became Bishop of Constantinople, 
A.D. 428. He saw the danger of Arianism, and, in his zeal to defend the full divinity of our Lord, went so far as to do injustice to his humanity. He went well beyond Apollinaris, and yet was in a measure of sympathy with the Pelagians, because of the total absence of fatalism in their system, and the large place which they gave to the freedom of the will. His opinions were that Christ possessed two natures, the divine and human, that there are not two persons, however, but only one, that there is a perfect union between the perfect God, the Word, and man, which is expressed by the word sunapheia, conjunction, that the divine so far transcends the human as largely as to absorb it, and that God the Son did not endure human suffering or go through human experiences. Instead of regarding Christ as the God-man, Nestorians held that he was the God-bearing man. The body of our Lord was simply the vehicle of the divine, the temple of the Logos. These views attracted profound attention. They were advocated with so much warmth and ability, not only by Nestorius, but by many who rallied to his support, that they spread with marvellous rapidity, and extended from the shores of the Aegean Sea to the boundaries of India. They were condemned by several councils. The Emperor Zeno, A.D. 489, dissolved the Nestorian school of Edessa, and hoped in this way to arrest the heresy. But here he failed. It was a system which could live without a theology. The Nestorians can still be found, even in name as well as doctrines, in Kurdistan and the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates. Humboldt bears witness to their contributions to the arts and sciences in the East, while their schools and hospitals have been of benign influence during all the intervening centuries. Augustine, born in Tagaste, Numidia, A.D. 354, was led to adopt Christianity while young through the example of his devout mother, Monica. He afterwards became worldly, and wandered far from the principles and example of his early life. When thirty-three years of age, he was restored to a pure and happy state, and was baptized by the aged Ambrose, Bishop of Milan. His mother, who never lost faith in him, and who had followed him in all his wanderings over many lands, had the great joy of witnessing his restoration to the church. He became a presbyter in Africa, A.D. 391, was appointed bishop of Hippo Regius in Numidia, A.D. 395, and died there, A.D. 430. The theology of Augustine was as follows. Man was created pure in God's image, and possessed of a free will. He was tempted and fell, and in him all humanity sinned. But man was capable of restoration, not of himself, but of God's grace. This grace comes not because man believes, but precedes faith, and is given that he may believe. From this grace all the stages of repentance, conversion, and final perseverance are reached and passed through. Now, as grace is a free gift of God, and precedes all act of faith on man's part, and as experience shows that not all men become converted and are saved, it must follow that God absolutely predestinates a certain number to salvation, decretum absolutum, and that the rest are left to their merited damnation. There were many departments of this new system, and Augustine defended them all with fervor and logical skill. His purity of life and noble character added great force to his theology. Out of the Augustinian theology sprang the Pelagian controversy. It marked the entrance of the Anglo-Saxon into the broad domain of the general theology of the Christian Church. Pelagius was a monk of Britain, who resided in Rome, and about A.D. 409 began to propagate his doctrines. He attacked the Augustinian system on every side. He controverted the innate depravity of man, and held that man was created mortal, that Adam's fall has made no change in human nature, and has exerted no influence on his posterity, that the heart is a tabula rasa, or blank, and has no inclination to virtue or vice, 
that man's will is perfectly free to choose virtue or vice, that Christ became man, not to save by his atoning blood, but to aid us by his doctrine and example, to attain to everlasting life, that baptism is a necessity, and that children dying unbaptized reach a lower grade of salvation than the baptized. Pelagius succeeded while in Rome in winning to his doctrines the acute and learned Celestius. Both were of pure life and ascetic tastes. They went to Africa, A.D. 411, and afterwards Pelagius proceeded to Palestine, while Celestius remained in Africa and became a presbyter. The deacon Paulinus opposed the Pelagian system and became a strong aid to Augustine. In Palestine it encountered a strong opponent in Jerome, but the Synod of Jerusalem, A.D. 415, declined to condemn the doctrines of Pelagius, and intimated that the whole controversy was a Western affair, and was of no special concern to Eastern Christians. The African Church, however, took up the question, and the two synods of Malave and Carthage, A.D. 416, condemned the Pelagians. An appeal was made by Pelagius to the Roman bishop Innocent I, but the latter died before it reached him. His successor, Zosimus, espoused the Pelagian cause and wrote an endorsement to Africa. But a new synod was called in Carthage, A.D. 417, which confirmed the former action against Pelagius. The Roman emperor, Honorius, now took part in the strife and banished the Pelagians from Rome. This brought Zosimus to drop his Pelagianism, and he wrote a circular letter against it. Suddenly the scene of controversy was shifted to the east, with Constantinople as the centre. The third general council of the church was held in Ephesus, A.D. 431, and Pelagius and Celestius were condemned, at the same time with Nestorius. The controversy assumed a milder type later in the west, under the name of semi-Pelagianism. The sharpness of both Augustinism and Pelagianism was toned down. The result was the triumph of a mild type of the Augustinian theology, adopted by the Synod of Aranico, Orange, A.D. 529. Other controversies grew out of these larger ones. Each district had its own views, while individual communities were distinguished for their espousal of some leader, which meant bitter hostility against his competitor. There was no want of hair-splitting. The philosophical terms of the Greek schools, which it was thought were dead, again came to life, and were hurled with energy from men to men and land to land. Theotokos, God-born, a word used by Nestorius, was heard from Gaul and Italy to the borders of modern Tibet and India. All Christendom was divided by a single letter of the alphabet, one half crying, Homoiosia, like essence, and the other half responding with equal fervor, Homoosia, same essence. Gregory of Nazianzus bears the following witness to the extent to which the theological discussions pervaded all classes. Quote, the city, Constantinople, is full of people who dogmatize on incomprehensible questions. The streets and marketplaces are the scenes of discussions of the old clothes dealers, the money changers, and the vendors of green groceries. If you ask how many aboli he asks for his produce, he will respond by dogmatizing on the begotten and the unbegotten. If you inquire the price of bread, you will get for answer, the father is greater than the son, and the son is subordinate to the father. If you inquire, is the bath ready? You will hear, the son was created from nothing. End quote. The results of the agitations were, on the whole, favorable to Christianity. At the moment they must have seemed not only fruitless, but of infinite damage. This is always the judgment of the age which produces theological discussions. Controversy seems only evil when in progress, but, judged by later generations, one sees the good results. The agitations of the apostolic period, and of the four centuries succeeding it, 
aroused the Christians to a sense of the importance of formulating their doctrines. They were led to meet in great councils, to compare views, and lay down those creeds, one by one, which have served the purpose of doctrinal statement for all later ages. The masses were brought to examine the scriptures with great care, and to see how far the prevailing doctrines were supported by them. The average Christian was led to distinguish between truth and error, and to perceive the vast danger which came, in a rude age, from propagating falsehood. It was a time of test. The furnace was at a white heat. Every truth which lay at the foundation of Christianity was subjected to the flames. The pagans from without had attempted, by their attacks, to destroy Christianity. But, in the period of controversy, the Christians examined their whole body of truth with their own hands. They now gave proof that they could discuss together with as much animation as against their common foe. The Council of Nicaea, A.D. 325, which determined the divinity of Christ, and that of Chalcedon, A.D. 451, which determined the union of the two natures in him, undisturbed and unmixed, made immortal statements. Hence, even in the midst of the controversial period, we can easily see positive advances of the cause of Christianity. End of chapter 17「Part One, Chapter Eighteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen Ecclesiastical Schisms. Division in the Church was intimately connected with the controversies, but the formal successions did not arise so much from differences of opinions in theological speculation as in practical life. Felicissimus was the originator of an important schism, A.D. 251, which extended from Carthage to the shores of the Atlantic. Cyprian, the bishop of Carthage, opposed the monarchical system of the episcopacy advocated by Cyprian, and when the latter fled from Carthage at the breaking out of the Decian persecution, Felicissimus denounced him for cowardice and led a revolt against him. With his fellow presbyters, he at once began to receive the lapsed into the church on the strength of the certificates which they had obtained from the confessors and martyrs. Cyprian denounced this course, and when he returned he was excommunicated by a party of Felicissimus, who chose Fortunatus for their bishop. The discontented presbyter went to Rome to try to win over its bishop, Cornelius, but failed. The schism caused Cyprian much trouble. The Novatian Schism, A.D. 251, was produced by Novatianus, with Rome as the scene. The origin lay in the corrupt measures by which Callistus, after many adventures, arrived in Rome and secured election to the episcopacy. He granted absolution to all the excommunicated alike. He permitted a second marriage, and even a third, to his clergy. After his death, the lax party continued in force. In A.D. 251, the presbyter Cornelius was chosen bishop, and his methods were similar to those of his predecessor. Novatianus, a presbyter, opposed him with great spirit. He claimed that the church consisted of the pure only, that there could be no chaff among the good wheat. An important secession was the outcome, with Novatianus as leader. It extended into the east, and in Phrygia received strong support. It lost strength, however, with the death of its leader, and in time went into decay. The Donatist schism arose from the same general cause as the other separatistic movements, but it involved more serious questions, assumed larger proportions, continued longer, and made a more thorough encroachment on the life and organization of the church than any previous schism. It began with the question of the practical religious life, but soon extended into the domain of ecclesiastical discipline, and then entered the larger sphere of the relation of the church to the state. In North Africa, the spirit of martyrdom during the persecutions assumed, in many cases, 
the form of a monomania. Christians, in large numbers, thought that by voluntary death they could atone for all former errors. Fanaticism took the place of a calm and resigned submission to the inevitable. Then came reverence for the bones of the martyrs, and for the places of their death. Many Christians thought they saw in special places and relics the abode of sanctity and the source of blessings. The question now became of such interest that elections to the episcopal office turned upon fancies arising out of this fanatical spirit. Donatus, a Numidian bishop, appeared at Carthage, A.D. 311, opposed the election of Cecilian as bishop on the ground that he had been consecrated by Felix, a tradator, or renouncer of the scriptures, in the time of persecution. Donatus stood at the head of a stricter party, and would surrender nothing to the more lax Christians. The entire church of North Africa was involved in the strife. From words the difference went so far as secession. A council at Arles, in France, condemned the Donatists, but they had warm supporters and bore persecution firmly. Though Constantine never favored the Donatists, and always decided against them, yet he did not persecute them, he ignored them. Julian favored them, and reinstated them in full power. For twenty years they had peace, during which time they built churches, organized societies, built up a vast ecclesiastical system, and were represented by their own bishop in the Nicene Council. After the death of Donatus, the sect divided into extremists and moderates. In course of time, the schism lost its hold upon the favor of the people and disappeared. The Miletian schism arose A.D. 305 to 311. During the Diocletian persecution, when Peter was Metropolitan of Alexandria and Miletius was Bishop of Lycopolis in the Thebaid, the latter took advantage of the imprisonment of the former to ordain ministers in dioceses outside his own. He complained that, as many bishops were absent, the church was suffering for want of their services. The bishops who were in captivity remonstrated against his course. Miletius held to the stricter view, and Epiphanius reports that Miletius was the representative of the stricter party in the church. An Egyptian synod took measures against Miletius, and condemned him for assuming functions not belonging to him. The schism extended over all Egypt, and was not without powerful support in other regions. Twenty-nine Miletian bishops were present at the Council of Nicaea. Their ordinations were recognized as valid, and they long continued in office. But the schism itself was condemned, though in mild terms. After the council, Miletius continued his schismatic course, but without real success. He afterwards combined with the Arians. After the middle of the 5th century, the Miletians disappeared from history. End of chapter 18「Part 1 Chapter 19 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The Scriptures and Tradition The need of a fixed and complete canon of revealed truth was felt by the Church in its earliest period. As to just what writings were canonical, the authority rested first with the Jews. Of these there were two classes the more exact and literal, who lived in Palestine and preserved most fully the traditions of their ancestors, and the more free and inexact, who lived in Alexandria and were inclined to permit doubtful books to enter the recognized canon. The Christians looked to the Palestinian Jews as the safer guides, and hence modeled their canon on the more conservative plan. The need of the scriptures, and of knowing precisely what constituted the canon, was pressed upon the early church with great force. The apologists heard from all sides the bitter lament, You are divided as to your sacred books. Tell us what they are. Hence, every safe means was employed to get at uniformity. Some Christian teachers were inclined to admit doubtful books. For example, 
Origen defended the narrative of Susanna against the attack of Julius Africanus. He was equally energetic in his plea for Tobit and Judith. Barnabas declared the four books of Ezra to be inspired. Tertullian attached the same value to the book of Enoch. Hermas elevated to similar honor the book of Eldam and Modal, two men whom tradition alleged to have written a prophecy in the wilderness. Melito, bishop of Sardis, visited Palestine, A.D. 170, with a view to getting at the best understanding concerning the Jewish view of the real canon. He gives the Old Testament canon in his commentary. He rejected Esther, Nehemiah, and the Apocrypha. It may be said that, by the beginning of the second century, there was a general understanding among Christians as to the more important books of the Old Testament canon. They are some of the same which the evangelical Protestant church of our times regards as inspired. There was more hesitation and uncertainty in arriving at agreement on the New Testament canon. The whole period of the early church was one of intense literary fertility. Many books were written by Christians, which the average believer had loved so dearly, and which had been so helpful, that it is not surprising he should place them close beside the works of Paul and John. The Epistle of Barnabas, Clement's Epistle to the Corinthians, Polycarp's Epistle to the Philippians, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Gospel of the Hebrews, and the Apocalypse of Peter had each its friends. The Muratori Fragment, which proceeded from the Roman or North African Church, gives the first list of canonical books. The Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, Thirteen Epistles by Paul, the First Epistle of John, and the First Epistle of Peter. As early as A.D. 170, these were adopted as the canon, but with a general belief that time would show it necessary to make the list larger. There was a difference of sentiment, according to the country, and even the community. The second and third epistles of John, and the Apocalypse, were in general, but not universal, use, for the Peshito is the only version omitting them. Jude was accepted by the great body of the church, but James was admitted by the Syrians only. Greek and Syrian Christians admitted the epistle to the Hebrews, but the Western Church for a time rejected it. Second Peter was longer in dispute than any of the New Testament writings. Origen and Eusebius declared against it, but other teachers were equally warm in their advocacy. The Christian scholars were not inclined to hasten towards a conclusion. They were not willing to decide in one century what a more thorough scholarship in the next would make it necessary to revoke but in time they reached a general understanding. The Synod of Hippo in North Africa, A.D. 393, under the leadership of Augustine, gave a list of the inspired books, which is the same as that in our present twenty-seven books of the New Testament. It also put the seal of its approval on the Apocrypha of the Old Testament. The ancient church, and the church of the Middle Ages, with occasional dissent of individuals, held to the Apocrypha. The Council of Carthage, A.D. 397, adopted the same resolution as that of Hippo. Shortly afterwards, Innocent, Bishop of Rome, gave his approval to the conclusions of the councils of Hippo and Carthage. From this time forth, for eleven centuries, there was no change in the sentiment of the Church as to its canonical scriptures. The Council of Trent, which met A.D. 1545, to promote the interests of the Roman Catholic Church against the new and vigorous Protestantism, in elevating the Apocrypha to an equal honor with the other sacred books, merely reaffirmed the decisions of Hippo and Carthage. In a time when the copies of the scriptures were only in manuscript, and of great cost, much value was attached to the personal recollections of the apostles and their immediate successors. Tradition, or matter handed down from father to son, was rich in reminiscence, and not likely, for two or three centuries, to go very far astray from exact history. That the narratives of aged Christians, which they had heard many years before from their seniors, 
should possess great interest and permanent value to the societies where they belonged is not surprising there is a rich glow and delightful fragrance in the words of irenaeus to florin in which he repeats what he had heard when very young from the lips of the aged polycarp who had been taught when young by john and who had told him much of what the beloved disciple had repeated concerning the miracles doctrines and life of our lord irenaeus thus continues quote, this i irenaeus too heard at that time with all eagerness and wrote down not on parchment but in my heart and by god's grace i constantly bring it up again to remembrance end quote. the later tradition as understood many centuries afterwards and playing an important part in the faith of christian people carried with it three elements apostolic origin catholicity and communication by the bishops but the early tradition was simply the unwritten truth and orally communicated from one generation to another origin and irenaeus went further than most teachers in their large place they gave to tradition tradition was regarded as a treasure of priceless value because preserving the golden links by which the memorabilia of the apostles and companions of our lord were treasured in the earliest period tradition was the only available source of christian faith and knowledge with the close of the new testament canon the apostolic writings began to assume prominence and threatened to become the only standard but the gnostics and other heretics could and did appeal also to scripture this again brought tradition to the foreground as the test of what the scriptures taught the great fathers of the second and third centuries constantly appealed to it with triumphant force the arian controversy also made much of this form of teaching by appealing to the true ancient interpretation of certain passages of scripture the catholics overthrew the arians at nicaea it was an appeal to exegetical tradition tradition thus maintained its supremacy alongside of scripture until it came to be petrified in the creeds and decisions of councils the ancient church never attained to the grand conception of the scriptures as the sole rule of faith End of chapter 19part 1 chapter 20 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 20 apocryphal writings the inventive spirit of the early church can be fully seen in the large mass of apocryphal works while the close of the scriptural canon sealed the fate of all such writings there was still a strong local attachment to some of them one of the chief sources of these apocryphal productions was the ebionotic and gnostic heresies the great body of the church was busied in resisting these heresies and yet the ebionites and gnostics themselves produced many such works and to the great outlying world the christian church had to bear the responsibility for the authorship of works produced by its own heretics the authors of the spurious writings confined themselves to no narrow territory the whole realm of thought lay open to them and they roamed at large they were as much at home in the patriarchal times as in later periods and were as skilful in writing works in the name of the roman clement as of paul or isaiah the five favorite fields were one old testament history two the life of jesus three the life and labors of the apostles four the epistles and five ecclesiastical polity and discipline the book of enoch enjoyed large popularity it was a product of the century immediately preceding christ but in the second century it underwent adaptations to the new christian conditions it has been preserved in a translation from the ethiopic manuscript the testimony of the twelve patriarchs written by a jewish christian contains prophecy and admonition it claims to have been written by the twelve sons of jacob who instruct their posterity on various duties and foretell our lord's incarnation and the downfall of judaism 
The Apocalypse of Moses, Isaiah's Ascension to Heaven, the Fourth Book of Ezra, and the Prophecies of Hystaspes belong in the same prophetic category. The Sibylline Oracles were in fourteen books, and were an imitation of the Roman Sibyllines, which enjoyed wide popularity. The Christian Sibyllines were designed to promote Christian interests. They were prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ, the destruction of Rome, the coming of Nero as Antichrist, and the final triumph of Christianity. The Christian apologists made frequent appeals to them, though with varying confidence. They claim, in the text, to have been written by a daughter-in-law of Noah. This was certainly far enough back to satisfy the most antiquarian taste of the times. The apocryphal accounts of our Lord were abundant. The first gospel of St. James the Less was a minute description of the alleged early life of Christ and the personal history of Mary. The gospel of the nativity of St. Mary, the history of Joachim and Anna and of the birth of Mary and the infant Saviour, the history of Joseph the carpenter, the gospel of the infant Saviour, and the gospel of Thomas furnished a vast mass of legendary matter, which, though worse than valueless, shows at least how profoundly the thought of the church was centred in the life and person of Jesus. The gospel of Nicodemus, the Acts of Pilate, and the epistles of Lentulus bear on the passion of our Lord, and are very minute in legendary details. To the spurious apostolical correspondence belong the Epistle of Barnabas, the Epistle to the Laodiceans, an Epistle to the Corinthians, in the Armenian language, the correspondence of Paul with Seneca, the Epistle of Ignatius to the Mother of Jesus, and the Epistles of the Holy Virgin to the inhabitants of Messina, Florence, and other cities. The Apocalypse of Peter, the Ascension of Paul, and an Apocalypse each by Thomas and Stephen, and a second Apocalypse by John, are only a small portion of this luxuriant department of spurious Christian literature. The Apostolical Constitutions was the most important writing on discipline and order proceeding from the early Church. It is a collection of eight books of instruction for both the clergy and laity on practical duties and ecclesiastical usages and polity. They claim to have been written by the apostles, but really arose at different times, no part having existed earlier than the third century. The first six books bear internal evidence of having been written in the last quarter of the third century, while the seventh and eighth indicate an origin not earlier than the fourth century. The apostolic canons are brief rules for ecclesiastical discipline and law. They were issued in the name of the Roman Clement as an authentic work of the apostles, but were afterwards declared by the Roman bishop Hormistas in the sixth century to be apocryphal. The second Trullian council, A.D. 692, rejected them as authority for the Eastern Church. They were never recognized by the Western Church. End of chapter 20part 1 chapter 21 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 21 theology during the early period on the fundamental christian doctrines there was a general agreement among christians both east and west even before the first formula of truth was established namely by the council of nicaea ad 325 there was a bold discussion of great themes. The daring of those first heroes for the truth is astounding. With only a brief history, and writhing in the agonies of martyrdom, they nevertheless wrote on themes of the broadest character. There was a difference between the Greek and the Roman Christian. The Greek was speculative. He caught up the terminology of Aristotle and the rest, and thrust it boldly into his argument on the eternal generation of our Lord. There was no subject on which he did not enter with boundless enthusiasm. The Roman was more careful. He had less to say, but more to do. 
he went beyond his pile of manuscripts and thought of a stronger organization of the church a firmer body of believers a more solid christian phalanx for the conquest of the world but beneath the speculation of the greek and the practical aggressiveness of the roman there was one faith with all the differences in the schools there was but little difference in the ruling theology the divine character lay at the foundation of all doctrine here the christian mind came into severest antagonism to the greek polytheism and the oriental dualism the christian believer regarded god as creator and preserver of the universe no attribute in modern evangelical theology was denied him in the patristic period only when the christians began to consider the relations of the three persons in the godhead and god's revelation of himself to the world do we observe variety but even here there was essential unity tertullian varied from the general view in supposing god must have a body this he did because of the misfortune of his philosophy which was borrowed from paganism that corporeity is a necessity of all existence origen and the school of alexandria controlled the church in avoiding all corporeal representations of deity the whole patristic church said we accept the divine character we do not need to prove it its proof is in us and beyond us arnobius said to attempt to prove god's existence is not much better than to deny it origen clement of alexandria and athanasius agreed in saying that the only possible knowledge we can have of god is based on grace and the logos the methods of proving the unity and trinity of the godhead were not fortunate instead of adhering to the language of the scriptures the theologians made use as well of the dialectics of aristotle and of the example of the elder faiths of india and of persia to show a parallelism yet there was no compromise no disposition to reduce the christian doctrine to the plane of any other faith the term triad was first used by theophilus of antioch while tertullian was the first to introduce the word trinity into christian theology while all the fathers accepted the three persons there was a difference of opinion in regard to the equality of essence justin's view expressed however the general and final belief of the church the three persons exist they are of equal quality beneath all the variety in the universe there is a unity of operation by the one god christology was the most fully developed of all departments of theology the logos of alexandria became the logos of the christian world some teachers proved the incarnation of our lord by a process of necessity that to reveal is a divine necessity just as the gem must shine but this was a low plane of logic the prevailing method was god is all loving and all wise and he willed the salvation of man and by the only means possible god's nature is to bless he is not an introspective character his goodness is operative when it is needed it was the father's good pleasure to reveal himself his will absorbed all necessity our lord was generated by the holy ghost born of the virgin mary and led a human life this life was sinless justin theophilus of antioch tatian and the pseudo ignatius held that the son existed from all eternity co-equally with the father but that before creation he proceeded from the father and began to lead a separate personal existence irenaeus taught christ's separate and personal sonship with the father tertullian that the members of the trinity were of the same substance but constitute a succession and origen that the logos was of eternal generation the differences of view were sought to be settled by the council of nicaea a d 325 the christian thinkers had been in danger on the one hand of emphasizing the humanity of our lord to the detriment of his divinity and on the other of allowing his divinity to absorb his humanity but the perfection of each nature finally entered into the permanent faith of the church the final christology of the period 
reduces itself to this christ was eternally coexistent and cooperative with the father he permitted the full penalty of sin to be visited upon himself his death was voluntary and achieved our redemption he rose from the dead ascended into heaven became our high priest in the fullness of time he will come to judge the world when he will reward the righteous and punish the guilty the discussions on the logos threw the consideration of the holy ghost into the background the adversaries of christianity knew that christianity must stand or fall with the divinity of christ there was no emphatic and general discussion of the doctrine of the holy ghost before the fourth century the views concerning the holy ghost were quite vague by some he was identified with the word and by others with wisdom tertullian was the first to distinctly assert the personality of the spirit though he subordinated him to the father and the son origen followed him in this but was undecided as to his nature the general council of constantinople a d three eighty one formally laid down the doctrine of the divinity of the holy ghost which has ever since been maintained by the church cosmology was a fruitful field of speculation is matter eternal was a question which persia had hurled at the western mind and because christianity answered no the whole oriental philosophy opposed the new religion the christian claimed that his sacred books taught that only an eternal god could create matter tertullian spoke for the whole church when he said that god did not need the world for his own glory but that creation was for man the pagan believed in a past golden age the christian looked back upon lost paradise but his eye was keen to foresee a perfect restoration he studied man in relation to the future sin passed from our first parents upon all humanity theophilus of antioch and tertullian taught that man can arrive at spiritual excellence by the development of his spiritual faculties through his own choice and the quickening power of the spirit three views on the union of soul and body were advocated one pre-existence of the soul before union with the body two the soul is transmitted through adam to all generations three each soul is created with the body at birth each of these three views had its advocates but the third became the prevailing opinion the world's social life is impure against this stands the church organized purity god's children his bride the foreshadowing of his everlasting kingdom it is a living body of believers there may be unbelievers in the body but in the main the church is pure and god will take care to preserve its character the object of the church is the culture of the soul until released from its bondage it is the depository of the divine truth god has furnished in the church according to cyprian and irenaeus the universal operation of the spirit there was a disposition on the part of some teachers to associate a sacrificial union of the holy ghost with the water in baptism origen says that baptism is the beginning and the source of the gifts of the spirit baptismal regeneration was thus taught by many of both the early and later fathers gregory of nazianzus called baptism the sacrament of the new birth cyprian spoke of the regenerating water and augustine of the sacrament of birth and regeneration the greeks were much inclined to emphasize the spiritual gifts while the latins were more cautious and attached great importance to the previous spiritual state of the baptized in the general faith of the church there was not only a belief in baptismal regeneration but a disposition to assign to baptism an effect so important that it became the custom to postpone its reception till the close of life for fear of losing its precious effect some writers emphasized the ethical disposition of the soul but the universal tendency was to exaggerate the effect of the baptismal waters the act of baptism in the adult was the human sign of a divine act of grace performed upon the soul 
Tertullian disapproved of infant baptism, Origen favoured it, and described it as an existing usage. Cyprian, speaking for the Western Church, did the same. The usage was universally acknowledged by the middle of the third century. The Lord's Supper was the human sign, divinely appointed to keep in mind the death of Christ. Ordinary bread and wine mixed with water were employed as symbols. After the second century, none but baptized persons could partake of the Lord's Supper. During the patristic period, there are occasional traces of the doctrine of transubstantiation, as in a theory stated by the fertile Irenaeus, that the elements, under consecration, have the effective power of the body and blood of Christ. Transubstantiation seems to have been taught in the highly rhetorical language of Ambrose, Chrysostom, and others, and to have had considerable advocacy in private circles but many of the fathers made more or less distinction between the sign and the thing signified. The words, this is my body, were sometimes construed as a liturgical accommodation, meaning the representation of the body and blood by the bread and wine, and not literally a substantial transformation. The church loved to think of a peaceful and happy future. The early coming of Christ was expected by many, while some of the more serious teachers and scholars thought they saw in the New Testament abundant warrant for the speedy introduction of the millennium. But all such hopes were soon eclipsed in the Christian mind by the broad and white harvest field to be reaped before his coming. In the Alexandrian theology we find the first traces of a purgatorial fire. Origen made the final fire, which should destroy the world, as the same fire which should purify all souls. During the first three centuries, the general church believed that all who die enter an intermediate state, but after the fourth century, the opinion prevailed that the wicked abide in Hades, waiting for the final deliverance, and that the disciplinary dealing will cleanse them from all impurities, while the righteous will immediately enter into the presence of God the present life was regarded as the only probationary possibility. The final restoration of the wicked was advocated by Origen, who even admitted the devil to its benefits. But here, as in other fields, the church was slow to be guided by the warm fancy and generous sympathy of the imaginative African. The process of theological adjustment was slow, and attended with great difficulty. The differences in race, climate, and intelligence were serious, and, before a theological consensus was arrived at, there was the appearance of hopeless diversity. This diversity continued long after the Council of Nicaea. One council would establish Arianism, another would overthrow it. But the Council of Nicaea had the great effect of placing the doctrine of the divinity of Christ beyond doubt as a fundamental doctrine and of teaching the church that there was to be a written standard of universal faith determined by the church in its representative capacity, that the doctrines of the church would not be left to the temporary triumph of some acute dialectician, that an emperor could not make and ordain a Christian creed with any hope of success, and that theology is not a stagnant science, which admits of no enlargement with the flight of centuries and with the growth of the general domain of knowledge. It is not likely that, notwithstanding the controversies on theological questions, the faith of the Christians was seriously agitated. The hair-splitting sophistries of Christian debaters, who had brought their pagan dialectics with them into the Christian fold, did not disturb the average Christian. Those men had little to do with the determination of doctrine, the general body of plodding and fervent members, who knew no logic but the facts of the Gospels, were the principal agents who kept the church close to its original moorings. Although the most abstruse doctrines were discussed with great intensity among the people, the mass of the faithful remained true to the Orthodox Church. The theology of the matter-of-fact believer was exact and closely knit he was not disconcerted by the jargon on the process of the logos towards manifestation 
or the procession of the Holy Ghost also from the Son, or whether only the wicked enter Hades. He knew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that the Holy Ghost was the divine comforter, and that the believer's Lord would not inflict on him a long suspense after martyrdom before permitting him to behold his face. The Nicene conclusions, far from being the mere fruit of theologians, were the faith of the great commonwealth of believers throughout Christendom. The real master at Nicaea was neither Athanasius nor Constantine, but the humble believer who might be keeping his flocks beside the Euphrates, or cultivating his patch of lentils in the Thebaid, or singing his psalms beneath his thatched roof on the outskirt of a dark forest of the Germania of Trajan's day. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Ecclesiastical Government and the Roman Primacy. The early period of the Church was marked by a simple government. The offices and orders were few, derived from the Scriptures, and administered without ostentation and formality but the enlargement of territory, the multiplication of societies, the dealing with the lapsed and other classes requiring special dealing, and, above all, the bringing of the church into union with the state, increased the offices to an alarming extent. The political system of Rome entered more and more into the Christian mind as a model for government. The metropolitan center and the synodal bond were derived directly from the imperial arrangement for the government of provinces. Under Constantine, the church became only the smaller within the larger empire. Simplicity of government continued until about the end of the second century, but after that the tendency was towards a complex polity. For at least three-quarters of a century before Constantine, the new taste had exhibited itself, but when he converted Christianity into the state religion, all obstacles were removed and offices multiplied. Of the minor clergy, the subdeacons came first. They assisted the deacons in subordinate services. The acolytes were assistants to the bishops in many subordinate relations. At the communion service, they filled the cup with wine and water and helped in the manual duties of the communion. The lectors, or readers, appear as a clerical order early in the third century. They had charge of the sacred books of the society, read prescribed passages to the congregation, and usually consisted of ministerial candidates. The catechists were only occasionally a special order, their duties being performed by presbyters, deacons, and lectors. When the congregation was very large, they were called into exercise, to propose candidates for admission to the church. The hermeneuti, or interpreters, interpreted the sermon and scriptural selections into the language of the people when the language was not Greek or Latin. This was the case in the Carthaginian church where the language was Punic. Singers, or precentors, were used in the larger churches to aid in music. The lowest official rank was the ostiarii, or doorkeepers, who served as ushers, preserved order, and had charge of the sacred buildings. Some of these offices were in force by the beginning of the third century, others not until the middle of the century. During the following century we find the other subordinate officers, the economos, or trustee of church property, the defensor, or attorney, the notarius, or secretary, who recorded and preserved official records, the parabolani, or nurses of the sick, and the fossores, or grave diggers. The chief clerical work of the greater clergy devolved upon the deacons and presbyters, whose functions remained the same as at the beginning. When the Roman Clement wrote his epistle to the Corinthians, A.D. 95, there was no difference between bishop and presbyter. The presbyter was the pastor, with all the sacred ministerial functions. The bishop was, at the beginning, the same. 
during all the early centuries he was only the presbyter but with a larger government embracing a group or territory of separate societies originally the church or congregation elected the bishop and invited neighboring bishops to consecrate him to his new office then in the third century the bishop was elected by brother bishops in adjoining territory after the manner of the election of an apostle by the middle of the third century the election of a bishop was confirmed by the votes of all the bishops of the province in presence of the laity and by their consent the council of nicaea gave the bishops of the province the right to elect without lay participation a mode very popular in the west but not in the east where the laity continued to exercise the right of both veto and direct election the bishops were elected sometimes by acclamation of the multitude as in the case of cyprian and the bishops presbyters and other clergy were compelled to submit it is historically true that in such cases the choice was generally a wise one the people knew their man with time the prerogatives of the bishop enlarged at first his power was limited by dependence on the cooperation of the presbyters he could nominate the clergy but could not advance to orders without the vote of the presbyters he could not determine doctrinal questions or discipline or general administration he had to summon the clergy of the diocese and submit the questions and abide by their vote the government of the local society was vested in the hands of the laity and the presbyter was only the spiritual guide the process by which the bishop became the chief officer was this from the first society another radiated and still others from them until there was a group of churches which extended even into the suburban parts the parent church was held in highest esteem the bishop's residence was supposed to be in connection with it but over each church there was a presbyter and over all the bishop whose spiritual functions were no greater than those of the humblest presbyter in the diocese there was some variation according to place in the independence of the individual society in constantinople for example the presbyters of the mother church served the three filial churches in order there was a tendency of the richer suburban churches towards independence in time they were grouped and had their bishop who was called a corepiscopos or rural bishop this office became a source of serious disorder the rural bishop was not acknowledged to be equal to his brother in office in the city several of the provincial synods of the fourth century took from the rural bishops the right of nominating the clergy finally the corepiscopos was abolished by the council of laodicea a d three sixty and of sardica a d three forty seven though his office continued for a long time afterwards its functions gradually became merged into the order of the presbyters the metropolitan authority was closely related to the diocese the word metropolitan does not appear before the council of nicaea but the idea had been in force from the earlier period of the expansion of the church the city where the gospel was planted and from which it extended into other regions of the province was the maternal city of the church of the whole territory in due time other societies remote from the centre were formed which grew in number and importance and were grouped into dioceses but the connections were kept up with the central authority rome for example was the original italian church but other cities in due time received the gospel such as tusculum tibur velitre ostia and portus each of which became a diocese with a separate bishop now the bishop living in the original society was the metropolitan he was always regarded with peculiar reverence because of his supposed attachment to the doctrines and usages of the church the metropolitan had important rights he could convene provincial synods preside over them and see that the conclusions were enforced there were six metropolitans those of rome antioch jerusalem alexandria ephesus and corinth 
the patriarchate was a higher office than the metropolitanate the number of metropolitanates was reduced to four general patriarchates rome alexandria antioch and constantinople this was an imitation of the political division by constantine of the whole roman empire into four prefectures the patriarchs consecrated the metropolitans and the bishops of the diocese summoned the synods of the whole patriarchate had supervision of all general ecclesiastical affairs even the court of final appeal and could have legates at foreign courts the patriarchate of alexandria comprised six provinces antioch fifteen constantinople twenty eight and jerusalem three many things contributed to give preeminence to the roman bishop the church of rome was distinguished for its conservatism it was firm in the midst of many heresies after the overthrow of jerusalem it was believed to be the oldest apostolic church its good quality of faith was well known or as paul says had been spoken of throughout the world in the giving of alms in missionary zeal and in doctrinal purity the roman christians had no superiors the certain residence of paul in rome and the already growing impression of peter's sojourn there were important apostolical associations which clothed the roman society with great sanctity by the middle of the second century there was frequent mention of the primacy of rome in the early part of the third century there was a revision of the recognitions in which the idea of a roman primacy was made very prominent so soon as this intimation was expressed there were strong views against it cyprian declared that each bishop is equal and that the church is a unit be it so cried origen when he heard of the new roman claim to foundation by peter and therefore preeminence but if peter is the only one on whom the church is built what becomes of john and the other apostles is peter forsooth the only one against whom the gates of hell should not prevail irenaeus spoke in a similar strain and yet the trend of the general policy was towards roman centralization each new roman bishop advanced beyond the claims of his predecessor zephyrinus held that he alone should be arbiter on the discipline of penitence victor assumed the same right on the easter controversy and stephen asserted a similar claim on the baptism of heretics the resisting force lay in the eastern church where antioch was leader but there was little cohesion in the east it was regarded as provincial while in spiritual affairs rome came constantly into more prominent leadership in due time little or no attention was paid to the eastern protests when firmilian the obscure bishop of cappadocian caesarea dared to charge stephen of rome with boasting of episcopal superiority he was only laughed at in the western metropolis constantinople was called new rome when constantine made the obscure byzantium which had been subordinate to heraclea the capital of thrace his vast capital and the centre of imperial authority much advantage to the church was expected but the result was not satisfactory when he passed away there was little purity left the palace became a nest of intrigue and revolution the turkey of our times with its plots and counterplots and its nameless corruptions is only the modern reflection of the depravity which dwelt in the imperial home of the successors of constantine the members of the court frequently hurled theological terms at each other while the wranglers of schismatics were transferred to the homes of the nobility with little loss of bitterness as in the bosphorus one sees the tumultuous flow of northern and southern waters so beside its beautiful and historic banks in the fourth century one could see the meeting of all the conflicting thoughts which agitated the whole eastern church each new party hoped for success from imperial favor the agitations around the eastern half of the mediterranean became so serious as to retard missionary operations to threaten unity and to promote spiritual decline 
in the west the life was more steady there was no emperor to lean upon when an eastern heresy reached rome it was generally throttled or vivisected without much ado the roman church life had the equipoise of power and of faith in its high destiny it was willing to hear any new thing which came to it but not to go out in quest of novel ideas it possessed neither the wish nor the talent for theological invention it was willing to wait and to profit by blunders elsewhere but not to look backward except to gather up supporting traditions for a steadier and farther march into the future end of chapter 22part one chapter twenty three of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three sacred seasons and public worship the festal cycle of the christian world gradually assumed fixed form the tendency was towards an enlargement upon the apostolic limitation but each edition was achieved after heated discussion the jewish christian after losing the traces of the jewish calendar was slow to add any new day which might be suggested by the gentile christian the first day of the week for sacred services came constantly into more frequent use than the seventh but the jewish christians continued to use both the first and seventh days until the first generation had disappeared when the influence of gentile christianity became predominant barnabas ignatius and justin furnish positive proof of the early substitution of the first for the seventh day that it was called sunday because of a saxon god is an old error for which there is no foundation the first day however was associated with the sun in the oldest mythologies george smith found on a tablet at nineveh mention of sunday as a day of rest it was a day of gladness because of the great gift of our lord's resurrection the day of new light the day of the sun wednesday and friday were also used as days of service but never in the high sense of the sunday service the wednesday service was designed to commemorate our lord's arrest by the jewish council and friday to commemorate his death those days the fourth and sixth of the week were called the stations a military term as a reminder that the christian is a soldier and must be on his guard against the enemies of christ of the yearly festivals the passover was the most important it signified the festal commemoration of the sparing of the firstborn of egypt and in a christian sense the memorial celebration of the death of christ the great easter controversy arose on the duration of the easter fast it was only a question of a few hours but the whole church was divided on the trivial matter the western christians contending for the longer time and the eastern for the shorter from gaul to pontus the discussion swept synods were called and the strife became bitter but the western view prevailed and those who held to the eastern opinion either withdrew their opposition or concentrated into a little sect the quarto decimanians whose home was confined to asia minor and proconsular africa they had but a short existence the roman bishop victor refused to acknowledge as christians all who sympathized with the eastern view and excommunicated them pentecost gained additional strength in the christian mind while the jews celebrated it in thankful commemoration of the harvest and the gift of the law on sinai the christian revered it and placed it very high in his calendar in commemoration of the outpouring of the spirit after our lord's ascension epiphany was observed in the east towards the close of the second century a commemoration of the nativity was prefixed to it but became an independent feature about a d three eighty six after that christmas was observed with greater or less attention in both the east and the west the growing reverence for the martyrs led to special services on the anniversary of their death by a happy thought the day of the martyr's death was called his birthday 
processions were made on these days to the scene of the martyrdom churches were erected over the remains of the martyrs memorial sermons were preached on the anniversary and the special day was added to the calendar this tendency innocent and natural in the first four centuries afterwards became a superstition and brought many evils into the church on the memorial martyr days the lord's supper was celebrated with a view to continued fellowship with the martyrs it was called an oblation or sacrifice for martyrs sacrificium pro martyribus it must be remembered however that during the entire patristic period these memorial days for martyrs were no part of the order of the church they grew out of the fame and merit of christians who died sooner than renounce their faith in christ the martyrology of the roman catholic church the large use of images and the realistic services were all of a much later and less spiritual origin no mention is made of special buildings for christian worship until the close of the second century tertullian who died about two thirty speaks of going to church and of going to the house of god the church was on the plan of the jewish temple and the synagogue it was called the lord's house the house of prayer the house of the church the architecture of the first churches was simple and gave no promise of the subsequent splendor of the basilica and the cathedral the interior of the church consisted of three parts the vestibule the nave and the choir the congregation assembled in the nave and here the pulpit was erected the scriptures read and the sermon delivered the choir was used alone for the clergy and for the readers and the singers it corresponded to the holy of holies of the jewish temple it was separated from the nave by a lattice or railing and curtains and was elevated above the nave in the centre of the choir was a wooden table bearing the symbols of our lord's death in the rear following the semicircular wall the higher clergy sat while the bishop sat on a cathedra or raised seat even before the time of constantine reigned 306 to 337 pictures of scripture events had been set up in churches the early church was familiar with such representations and with symbolic images as the roman catacombs testify there was very early however a distaste for all representations of deity or sacred characters clement of alexandria expressed the sentiment of his age quote, the custom of daily looking on the representation of the divine being desecrates his dignity end quote. the time had not as yet arrived when christian art was employed to clothe our lord's person with ethereal beauty and sweetness the theology of the times attributed to him the sad and homely visage of prophecy and it was a quaint fancy of tertullian that he could never have been despised of men and have suffered death for them if in his person he had manifested his heavenly glory origen held that his whole person was repulsive the eastern church has never deviated from this view in the greco-russian church of today whether amidst the barbaric splendor of the cathedral of st isaac in st petersburg or in the more ancient church of the transfiguration on the kremlin it is the same sad and austere countenance which we discover in the ancient frescoes of ravenna the council of elvira a d 305 declared against the use of all images in sacred buildings though its decisions were never respected out of spain the western church was inclined early to the use of images and this preference was one of the causes which finally led to the division of the east and the west end of chapter 23book one chapter twenty four of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four ecclesiastical discipline careful training was early observed in the spiritual life of the church no sooner was a society organized 
than the closest attention was paid to the religious instruction of the young. The converts of Pentecost were immediately received into the fellowship of believers, but the work was only just begun. There must be edification. Each believer was regarded as a temple, not finished, but susceptible of all beautiful and symmetrical forms. He must be built up. Hence, full provision was made for instruction and training. Paul's epistles abound in intimations that constant attention was paid to the domestic training for Christian life and for careful instruction in biblical knowledge. The new adult convert had everything to learn. He had just come in from paganism. No miracle could compensate for the previous absence of religious truth. When one embraced the new faith, or, as the phrase of the time went, laid off the toga for the pallium, he was a blank. The catechumens were required to pass through a severe discipline. There was no fixed time for terminating the catechumenate. While the apostles baptized immediately on profession of faith, the patristic church moved more slowly, for experience taught them that nothing was lost by a longer process before full membership. There were three classes of catechumens, the hearers, the kneelers, and the petitioners. The hearers would come to the general service and hear the sermon and the lessons, but could not remain for prayers. The kneelers could also hear the prayers and even the prayer of the imposition of hands. The petitioners could hear the entire service and petition for baptism at the next public appointing, which was usually Easter Sunday. When the petition was accepted, the names of the candidate and his sponsors were recorded in the diptych, or register. Then came a close examination, or scrutiny, which lasted twenty days. When public baptism and reception took place, the new member was admitted to the Eucharist. After the period of persecution had closed, the time for the duration of the catechumenate became briefer than before. The apostolical constitutions favored three years. The Synod of Elvira laid down two, but the Synod of Agde shortened the time to eight months. The apostates were the more difficult class to manage. The temptations to apostasy were numerous. In some regions, the process of restoration continued for years. In others, when penitents were ready to suffer martyrdom, the ordeal was brief. In the African church, many apostates secured letters of peace from men just before suffering martyrdom, and with these as authority, they boldly demanded admission again into the church. One man, Lucian, boldly declared that he had granted peace to all apostates in North Africa, and had declared their sins absolved. And Cyprian, in a gentle mood, cried aloud that the church must keep peace with its martyrs. There were two classes of sins, the venial and the mortal, but martyrdom was regarded as the completion of any penitential experience. In the latter part of the third century, the penitents were more largely classified, mourners, hearers, kneelers, and bystanders. A bystander was the most advanced. He could advance up the nave of the church, join in all the prayers of the church, and witness the celebration of the Lord's Supper, but not participate in it. During all the stages towards restoration, the penitent must give practical proof of sincerity by abstaining from all diversions, by observing all the public fasts, by giving liberally towards the support of the poor, and by assisting in burying the dead. Restoration was completed by admitting the penitent to the Lord's Supper, by the prayer of absolution and reconciliation, and by the imposition of hands by the bishop. The penitential presbyter was the special officer who supervised the penitents during all the stages of restoration. It was his duty to see that all requirements were met, that the bishop was duly notified of the progress made by the penitent, and that the time was fixed for final restoration. But his chief duty was to hear under oath of secrecy the private confession of penitents. He also laid upon them the necessary penances. But this officer, though a forerunner of the priestly confessor, was appointed simply for convenience in the service of church discipline. 
the confessional, as a prerequisite for communion in the case of all Christians, came in several centuries afterwards. The office of the penitential presbyter was abolished A.D. 390 on account of a scandal occasioned by a deacon, the facts of which were revealed in the confession of a prominent woman of Constantinople. End of chapter 24「Short History of the Christian Church」by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25. Christian Life and Usages The charitable spirit of the Church in the apostolic time took larger form in the patristic period. There was no need of Christians in one place which did not awaken sympathy everywhere. When Cyprian saw that the Numidian Christians could not pay the required ransom of their captive brethren, he took a large collection in Carthage for that purpose, and sent it to them, with a letter full of fraternal expressions. Dionysius of Corinth lauded the Roman society as the helper of Christians, without distinction, from its very origin. Dionysius of Alexandria, in a letter to Stephen, Bishop of Rome, paid the same tribute. Basil of Cappadocia wrote a letter of thanks to Rome for money sent him to redeem captive Christians from their barbarous foes. Demetrius drew a striking picture of the sacrifice of Christians during the pestilence in Alexandria. Gifts for the support of the church were made at each service. Often these consisted in wares, or produce of the soil, according to the pursuits of the people. In the east a fixed sum, or the tithes, was held to be the proper standard of annual beneficence. But in the West there was no rule. The great teachers opposed any defined measure, saying that the Lord required all that could be spared. A careful record, the matricula, was preserved of all the details of the benefactions. The incentives to knowledge were very great. The transition from paganism to Christianity was a thorough revolution. The field of Christian knowledge was a new world. In the schools, catechetical exercises prevailed. The secular sciences were subordinated to religion. Christianity did not build up its great libraries, but the books written by the leading Christian thinkers were already read with profound interest. Each church was the center of knowledge. Copies of the scriptures were expensive, but were multiplied, and each church possessed several copies, together with expository and other works. All these were for the benefit of the congregation in the intervals of service and during the week. There was a special room for the use of books, which was called the frontisterion, or thinking shop. One of the first impulses of the new Christian who was possessed of means was to employ copyists and have the entire scriptures transcribed for loaning or presenting to other churches or private circles. Even during the time of persecution, so many copies of the scriptures had found their way into private hands that the pagan wrath was aroused. During the Diocletian persecution especially, their possessors were ordered to deliver up vast numbers of them. Even the pagan enemies secured copies, for the works of Celsus, Periphery, Heracles, and others give abundant proof that the authors must have had a personal inspection of some portions of the Bible. The domestic life was in direct contrast with everything pagan. There were, therefore, no reminders of the old idolatry. The typical Greek and Roman houses had been profusely adorned with figures, busts, and monograms of favorite divinities. But even this was a decline from the early Roman austerity. For nearly two centuries after the founding of Rome, no citizen had so far accommodated himself to the superstition of Greece or Egypt as to erect a statue to any deity. But the times brought sad changes. The excavations in Pompeii and the many memorials of art from the Roman ruins show how thoroughly the later art was superseded by a gross idolatry. The Christian's first impulse was to put away all such things, he lost no time in blotting out every trace of the obedient Mercury, the majestic Apollo, the generous Ceres, 
and even the omnipotent Jove, from doorway, court, and hall. But he was not satisfied with this severe absence of all symbolism. Even the more cautious Christian writers encouraged a safe and proper counterpart to the polytheistic symbolism of their pagan adversaries. Clement of Alexandria urged the use of Christian symbols on seal rings, and named as proper figures the dove as an image of the Holy Ghost, the fish with reference to the call of Zebedee's sons to be fishers of men, the ship as an emblem of the advancing church, the leer as a type of Christian joy, and the anchor as an expression of hope. The crucifix was never used. Every great teacher was an industrious correspondent. Paul had set the example, and it was diligently followed by his successors in evangelization. Epistolary writings had long been a favorite Roman fashion. Cicero, Seneca, Pliny, and many other authors chose the form of the letter to an individual in order to inform the public of their views on many special subjects. The fathers of the church chose, therefore, a means of information which they found in use already, both from apostolic and pagan example. The letters of Polycarp and Origen, and the eighty-six warm and nervous epistles of Cyprian, were only a small part of the epistolary benefaction of those times to the later church. A number of the apologists addressed their works to Roman emperors. The Christians were largely represented among the commercial and laboring classes, and often changed their abodes. They followed the lines of commerce. As in the United States, many Christian people from the Atlantic seaboard have gone into the far western regions and taken with them their religious spirit and built churches, so, in the third and fourth centuries, the Christians observed the new openings of business and planted Christian societies in the places where they settled. Between the old and new societies, a frequent correspondence was maintained. Christians who went upon a journey for any purpose were often the bearers of letters to be delivered on the way or on reaching the place of destination. When these letters arrived, being on a durable fabric, either papyrus or parchment, they became the permanent possessions of the society or the individual receiving them. The synodical letters, which were written after each session of the provincial synod to similar bodies in other provinces, will convey some idea of the extent to which official relationship was carried. When action was taken on a schism, or on any special subject, the utmost promptness was employed to communicate the fact far and wide, while a bishop, on being chosen to the office, was equally prompt in sending notifications of his election to his colleagues in every part of Christendom. The most distant parts of the church were brought into close relationship also by personal visitation. The fathers were busy travelers. Many parts of the East were even safer then for the stranger than they are today. The Christians followed classic examples. The Greek and Roman authors had been in the habit of visiting places which they described. Homer certainly saw the Troad, for the Iliad bears internal evidence of a personal examination. Herodotus journeyed in many lands, now among the priests of the Upper Nile and now in Asia Minor, endeavoring to verify the country by contact with the people and their land. Sallust visited Africa, in order to be faithful in his picture of Jugurtha. Jerome lingered long in Palestine, in order to make sure work in his exegetical studies. Papias, bishop of Hierapolis, conceived the happy thought of visiting Palestine, and trying to find among the most aged people of different countries, some who had seen our Lord in the flesh. For, said he, I did not think that I could get so much aid from the books as from the words of those living and remaining. Out of this tour grew his explanation on the discourses of our Lord. Polycarp, in his extreme age, or about A.D. 158, visited Rome, to come to an understanding with the bishop and Asestus concerning the baptism of heretics and the observance of Easter. Irenaeus labored in Asia Minor, Gaul, and Rome. 
from the journey of Hegesippus from the east to Rome, came many interesting facts concerning early church history. Among these was the finding of Manetho's catalogue of the kings of Egypt. In those days we regard the journey of Ararat as an undertaking of remarkable difficulty, but Julius made it in the interest of sacred science, and identified it as the mountain on which the ark had rested. He also visited the Dead Sea and located the site of Sodom and Gomorrah. Clement of Alexandria was a diligent traveller over three continents. Origen appears to have visited every part of the Christian world, including far-off Persia. Rufinus studied the monastic life by personal observation among the monks of the Nitrian desert. Jerome was an ideal traveller in the interest of sacred learning. He located himself in Palestine, in order to learn the idiomatic construction of the biblical text from contact with the people. He employed, as a special teacher in Hebrew, a Jew who instructed him by night, lest the Christians might learn of it and take offense. He even visited Cilicia in order to learn the deep force and subtle meaning of Paul's epistles. It need not occasion surprise that, with such pains, Jerome should easily stand at the head of the Latin church, and that to his patient and thorough scholarship the world should be indebted for the Vulgate version. This is the beautiful justification which he gave for this sojourn in Palestine. Quote, As the history of the Greeks is better understood by him who has seen Athens, and Virgil's third book by him who has sailed from the Troad to Sicily, and from there to the mouth of the Tiber, so do the holy scriptures become clearer to him who has seen Judea with his own eyes, and has made himself acquainted with the recollections of the old cities and the names of the places, whether they are the same or have been changed. Therefore I had it in heart to undertake this work, in connection with the most learned Jews, so that I have wandered through the country from which all the churches of Christ take their tone. End quote. End of chapter 25part 1 chapter 26 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 26 the church in the catacombs the roman catacombs are excavations often at great depth made by the christians for the burial of the dead the roman never continued his warfare with other faiths after death he allowed the Christians every liberty in the disposition of their dead. The catacombs had been already in use by the Jewish residents of Rome. At first they probably made a mere opening in the hillside, or a hollow beneath a shelving wall, as their fathers had done in Palestine from remote times. But, later, the Jewish burial place became an approach to the Christian catacomb. Some of these Jewish wall catacombs are still in existence, as, for example, one opposite the catacomb of San Sebastiano, and another nearer Rome in the Rondaniani vineyard. The galleries are the same as those of the Christian catacombs, only less ornate and regular. The Jewish type is everywhere recorded by the seven-branched candlestick or other Hebrew symbols. In the earlier Roman times, Burial was the method in use, but cremation came into use later, probably as a result of the importation of the Persian idea of the evil in matter. But burial was still performed by many of the older Roman families, as can be seen in the monument of the Scipios, before the Porta Capena of Rome, now within the walls. The graves of the Nassos, four Italian miles from Rome, on the Via Flaminia, consist of chambers hewn in the tufa, with horizontal niches for the bodies in precisely the same way as the Christian catacomb. There was one difference, however, between the pagan and the Christian burial place. The pagan catacomb was exclusive, like the palace, being confined to the family. But the Christian catacomb was for the whole brotherhood of faith. The ties of life were to continue after death, the poor and rich should be together in death, as they had worshipped and suffered side by side in life. No private burial place in Rome could
could be alienated by sale in all deeds the burial place was exempted in the sale of a villa and grounds the catacombs were all along known in rome and in the christian world the barbarian invasions from the sixth to the eighth century ruthlessly desecrated them but in the fourteenth and fifteenth century they were still visited by pilgrims a new discovery however took place in may fifteen seventy eight some workmen in a field along the via salaria came across a mysterious opening in the earth which led to the finding of passages frescoes of infinite variety greek and latin inscriptions and several sarcophagi from that hour subterranean rome took its place as a priceless storehouse of christian science until then the burial places of the early christians had awakened but little interest jerome relates that when a schoolboy in rome he and some of his companions frequently went down into the graves and looked at the dust of the martyrs and that they wandered through the long passages and caverns and saw the bodies on either side and that the darkness was so profound that his boyish imagination was strongly excited by the scene so that he could not help thinking of the words of david let them go down quick into hell and of the words of virgil terror surrounds me even the silence itself is horrible antonio bosio born in fifteen seventy five was the first to reveal the rich treasures which had lain concealed for thirteen centuries no difficulty was too great for his tireless spirit one catacomb after another was opened by him he created a new science he devoted thirty years to these explorations and to the preparation of his great work roma soterania and died in sixteen twenty nine his book did not appear until after his death john evelyn who visited rome in sixteen forty five and bishop burnett who made a sojourn there forty years later were the first writers to reveal to the english world the extent and significance of the christian catacombs during the time which has since elapsed the catacombs have been emptied of their greatest treasures which have been deposited in the museum of st john lateran the vatican and other places in rome some have found their way to other parts of europe the christian museum of the berlin university contains the best collection of memorials from the catacombs to be found outside of rome these with other objects illustrating christian history have been gathered through the energy and zeal of professor piper the descent into a catacomb is through a church or chapel which has been built over the entrance the passages vary in size and length the aggregate extent is a matter of conjecture de rossi the greatest of all the later explorers and writers in this rich department supposes the length of the passage of all the catacombs to be equal to the length of the entire italian peninsula marchi reaches an estimate of a third larger it is not likely that all the catacombs have been explored as late as eighteen forty eight the magnificent catacomb of pretextatus was discovered while in eighteen seventy four de rossi discovered the catacomb of st petronilla a small but very rich storehouse of sepulchral christian art no safe approach to the probable number of fixed paintings carvings and inscriptions which have been taken from the catacombs can be made in the lateran museum in the sarcophagi alone there are two hundred and seventy-six scriptural carvings the catacombs were continued in a gradually lessening degree as places of burial down to about a d four ten when the west goths plundered rome they tell the story of the faith and usages and especially of the scriptures down to that date every part of the old testament was known to the christians the word pictures of the old testament are everywhere reproduced in rude frescoes noah in the ark the offering of isaac moses taking off his shoes the translation of elijah daniel in the lion's den and the three hebrews in the fiery furnace were favorite topics as bearing on the tribulations of the church of the time the new testament furnished many themes 
no scene in our lord's ministry remained unnoticed such subjects as indicated a brighter future as the ever-growing vine and the sower and the seed were special favorites with the rude christian artist of the earliest period many scriptural citations were employed the scroll standing out of a cistus or a manuscript case was frequent paul was represented in this way with evident reference to his writings where two scrolls lay before a figure the meaning was that the deceased made no difference between the old and the new testament but accepted both as the equal and inspired word of god orthodoxy and christian defense are plainly taught in the symbolism of the catacombs christ was everywhere mentioned either by name or rude figure the humblest grave bore at least the fish which in greek consisted of the monogram of christ ichthus jesus christos theon uios soter jesus christ son of god saviour but no word or picture has been found in these silent passages which calls up any of the violent controversies which swept over the church neither has there been found a suggestion of an heretical vagary sometimes pagan pictures were given but always to teach with greater force the messiah's kingdom three representations of christ as orpheus have been found two by bosio in the catacomb of domitilla and one by de rossi in that of saint callista in the two former he sits between two trees crowned with the phrygian cap and playing on a lyre beasts come thronging about him and hear his notes and are charmed and tamed by the melody doves peafowl horses sheep serpents tortoises a dog and a hare at a lion's feet hear the music and mingle together in edenic simplicity and peace the whole is a symbol of our lord's peaceful empire and also an indication of the disposition of early christians at rome as in the theology of alexandria to make paganism bring its offering to our lord's altar thesis slaying the minotaur was made a type of david slaying goliath one beautiful figure gilt on glass and dating from the end of the fourth century represents our lord with radiated head he holds the globe of universal sovereignty in his hand while at his feet stands the cistus containing the gospel scroll the trinity was always represented in such a way as to indicate an equality of persons de rossi furnishes examples of firm faith in this doctrine where the monogram of christ is combined with the triangle the representations of christ were all of the cheerful hopeful and triumphant type only twice among the sculptures of the latern museum is he represented during his passion he everywhere appears as the good shepherd the catacombs received the bodies of martyrs in many a bitter persecution but the relatives and friends of the departed uttered no syllable of sorrow the word death is always avoided in pace was the universal legend rest and triumph were uppermost in the mind the dead were at least at peace the grave was surrounded with images of beauty peace and joy it was only after the persecutions were over and the authors had taken their places in oblivion that any symbol of suffering was placed in a roman catacomb the record of martyrdom was studiously avoided and not only that the christian might give no indication of disputing the divine preeminence of the man of sorrows but that the christian was not willing to show even by figures on a wall of a tomb that he remembered the agony which a persecuting hand had produced death had no terror to him and the persecutor only hastened the day of peace from the symbolism in the catacomb one would think that the christians were living in palaces and that kings were their servants the hare feeding on grapes the luxuriant palm tree the vase of flowers the loaf of bread and the dove with the olive branch were met with on tablets taken from all the catacombs the historical suggestions were sometimes very rich an epitaph in the cemetery of saint domitilla dating from the first century 
shows the early entrance of Christianity into the imperial household. The clank of the slave's chain was never heard in a Christian home. So completely and promptly did slavery disappear that of the eleven thousand epigraphs from the catacombs, only six, and two of these doubtful, contain any illusion to the evil, and then only in brief and simple language. There is not a trace of mariolatry in any early inscription or symbol of a catacomb. The word Maria never occurs until A.D. 381, and then only after the word Livia. The earlier inscriptions were brief, like the breathings of the stricken soul, such as, To the dearest mother, to the sweetest child, God raise thy soul, or Peace to thy spirit. Later, however, when the catacomb was used only as a cemetery, and not also as a place of refuge from the destroyer, the epigraphs became more fulsome and rhetorical. A beautiful epigraph, received to God, dating from A.D. 217, but frequently repeated afterwards, proves that the poor soul had passed through its ordeal here and needed no purgatory. In De Rossi's compilation, comprising 1,374 different epigraphs, there is no example of prayer for the dead. Clerical celibacy finds no support in the catacombs or any early tombs. An inscription, found on the Ostian Way, to the wife of a deacon or subdeacon, ran thus, Levite conjuncts Petronia forma pudoris, his mea disponens sedibus osa loco, pesquite vos lacrinis dulces concungige nate. The word puer occurred frequently in connection with mature men. It was an index of the association of perpetual youth with the life of the blessed. Hence the surviving daughter or widow or son could well call the deceased father or husband boy, in view of the immortal youth on which he had now entered. The old Hebrew names had passed away, and the epitaphs show a transition, as in the Puritan Depression in England and the New England history, where a firm faith in God and a recognition of his special deliverances in sore need blossomed out beautifully in the names which rejoicing parents gave to their children. Hence, in the epigraphs of the catacombs, we find such names as the following, Diodorus, God's gift, Fructuosus, fruit-bringing, Renovatus, renewed, Anastasia, risen, Irene, peace, Sabatia, holy day, and Concordia, harmony. But all words in the catacombs abounded in hope and joy. End of chapter 26Part 1, Chapter 27 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 Monasticism. Traces of monasticism can be found in all the great Oriental lands. Long before Christianity, and even before the conquests of Alexander in India, the monastic idea had gained great strength. Buddhism and Brahmanism made large use of it for extending their doctrines and holding their adherents. The idea of the inherent evil of matter lay at the basis of the monastic principle. It was supposed that contact with society diverted the mind from religious contemplation, and made it less worthy to be the abode of the worshipful spirit. Hence the only safety was to get far from men and their deeds." Nature must be found in her simplicity. The rude elements must be made familiar. Besides this, there must be scope for the exercise of self-denial and for the growth of Christian perfection, which it was thought could not be found in society. These were the thoughts which lay at the bottom of that Christian monasticism which played an important part in the early church and extended down to the Reformation, and still holds undisputed sway in the Roman Catholic Church. Christianity found monasticism already prevalent in the Nazarites of Palestine and the Therapeutae of Egypt, and it is not strange that, in an age of great societal corruption, 
which overspread all pagan territory, many Christians should see in the separate life a relief from danger. Persecution favored the tendency towards monasticism. Exile was only another name for a secluded life. Many Christians went voluntarily into remote regions, dwelt in caves or groves, spent the day in works of charity and much of the night in vigils, and courted nature in her wildest moods. The first monastic stage was voluntary solitude, without any movement towards a separate order. It was the individual mind, looking for spiritual relief, but with no purpose to introduce a new departure in ecclesiastical practice. The next stage was a habit of removal to certain regions, where the monks lived within reach of each other. The third stage was the sanction and regular organization of orders, which took full shape in the Benedictines and other fraternities. The monks took three vows upon themselves, perpetual fidelity to the life and order, obedience to the abbot or head of the monastery, and chastity and poverty. A number of the fathers and writers led a monastic life, but without advocacy of a separate order. The tendency grew with the times. The Old Testament was searched for support. Elijah and kindred spirits in Jewish history, and John the Baptist, were brought in to support the monastic tendency. Egypt became a favorite place for the monks. Rufinus declared that there were nearly as many monks in the deserts as people in the cities. Montalembert says, it was a kind of emigration of towns to the desert, of civilization to simplicity, of noise to silence, of corruption to innocence. The current once begun, floods of men, women, and children threw themselves into it, and flowed thither during a century with irresistible force. Paul of Thebes, in Upper Egypt, was the first Christian hermit. He lived during the persecution under Decius. He is said to have withdrawn to a distant Egyptian cave when twenty-two years of age, and to have lived there until A.D. 340. Anthony, who followed in Paul's footsteps, lived for a long time in extreme poverty in the Egyptian desert. The fame of the life of these two men went into distant lands, and their self-denial was imitated by many people in the countries lying around the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The pillar saints constituted a separate class. St. Simeon was the founder of the group. After spending ten years in a monastery and a short time in a hut as an anchoret, he mounted a pillar seventy-two feet high and four feet in diameter, where he is reported to have spent thirty years. He died at Telemessa, near Antioch, A.D. 459, and was buried with all possible ecclesiastical and military pomp. Tennyson puts in his mouth the following confession, after he had spent many years in this life of torture, O oh Lord, Lord, thou knowest I bore this better at the first, for I was strong and hale of body then. And though my teeth, which now are dropped away, would chatter with the cold, and all my beard was tagged with icy fringes in the moon, I drowned the whoopings of the owl with sound of pious hymns and psalms, and sometimes saw an angel stand and watch me as I sang. Now I am feeble grown, my end draws nigh, I hope my end draws nigh, half deaf I am, so that I scarce can hear the people hum about the column's base, and I am almost blind, and scarce can recognize the fields I know and both my thighs are rotted with the dew, yet cease I not to clamor and to cry, while my stiff spine can hold my weary head, till all my limbs drop piecemeal from the stone. Have mercy, mercy, take away my sin. End, quote. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight The Age of Gregory the Great. The march of the Roman bishop towards priority throughout the Christian world was steady. 
the divisions of the eastern empire the decline of moral life the universal spread of controversy and particularly the preeminent ability of several of the bishops of rome were calculated to advance the claims of that patriarchate above all others the bishop leo the first a d four forty to four sixty one was a man of strong intellect and he did much to clothe himself with power and prestige but the most eminent incumbent of the roman episcopate was gregory who was called the great and ruled a d five ninety to six hundred four under him every department of the priesthood and the episcopacy advanced in strength his claims artfully disguised were of the most lofty kind gregory's character was of a striking quality he was versatile and strong in everything he touched in the development of the hierarchical idea in theology liturgical literature pastoral oversight monasticism and missions he was a master his hand was felt in the whole field of the ecclesiastical life of his day born at rome a d five forty and descended from an ancient patrician family he had all the advantages which wealth and education could bring his parents designed him for service in the state but he turned his attention to the church and advanced rapidly yet he showed no disposition to hasten matters he possessed the virtue of patience in a high degree gregory after his father's death founded six cloisters and occupied one himself he dedicated himself to a life of self-denial he became deacon of the bishop pelagius and was sent as his representative to the court of constantinople he wrote a commentary on the book of job and pursued his studies with great energy he was also a brilliant preacher and wrote a book regula pastoralis the pastoral rule full of lofty spiritual instruction to his clergy on his return to rome and the death of the bishop pelagius he was chosen to succeed him he declined the office at first but afterwards accepted it but apparently by pressure towards the emperor he manifested the profoundest respect probably with a view to gaining by yielding he called himself servus suvorum dei servant of the lord's servants he devoted himself to the purification of the life of the church and the enforcement of monastic discipline he fixed the term of the novitiate to two years forbade youths under eighteen to enter a monastery and ordered all ecclesiastical officials to seize those monks who wandered about the country like tramps and to deliver them to the nearest monastery for punishment he was especially active in his encouragement of missions he organized the anglo-saxon and other missions and sought to send the gospel into every part of europe he took the greatest interest in the english mission and sent to augustine very detailed instructions for his work under him the authority of the roman bishop advanced far beyond its former dimensions he created the papacy of history he preserved amicable relations with the emperor though all the while holding firmly his ecclesiastical independence End of chapter twenty eight Book One, Chapter Twenty Nine of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine: The Expansion of Christianity. The evangelization of the nations continued with unabated zeal, whether in persecution or after the liberty given by Constantine. The work of missions was carried on with equal fervor. There were three such fields one the poor within the central regions of the empire two the population of such farther provinces as were a firm part of the dominions and three those more remote tribes which were hostile to rome and were awaiting a good opportunity to satisfy their hunger for conquest by feeding on the dying empire the church extended its boundaries by exile and all the other means employed to destroy it both in rome and in the larger provincial towns 
the conflict between the gospel and pagan literature was intense and uninterrupted. The doctrines of Jesus gained steadily on the most finished products of pagan thought. Wordsworth's description of the conquest of the missionary over the Druids of Britain applies equally well to the whole battlefield of three continents. Haughty the bard, can these weak doctrines blight his transports? Whither his heroic strain? But all shall be fulfilled. The Julian spear away first opened, and, with Roman chains, the tidings come of Jesus crucified. They came, they spread, the weak, the suffering here. Receive the faith, and in the hope abide. When Athanasius was banished from Alexandria to northern Gaul, A.D. 335, not only did the young society in the latter country enjoy the presence of an heroic example, but the exile himself began his organizing work and established the Diocese of Treves, at that time the capital of Gaul. The powerful expansion went on rapidly everywhere. Indeed, during the period of suffering, the only safety to the Christians lay in their distance from the persecuting centers. Tertullian said defiantly to the whole Roman world, We are of yesterday, yet we have filled your empire, your cities, your islands, your castles, your towns, your assemblies, your very camps, your tribes, your companies, your palaces, your senate. Your forum and your temples alone are left you. Antioch was the centre from which the light of the gospel radiated eastward into the distant parts of Asia, and westward through Asia Minor. The pathway reached from the shore of the Aegean Sea to the west of China, a longer line of march than Alexander had made. Jerusalem lost its hold as a centre of ecclesiastical power, and its spiritual dominion was divided between Antioch in the north and Alexandria in the south. Cappadocia, and the entire coast of the Euxine Sea east of the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus, were early a mission field. Colchis, Iberia, and Georgia were overspread with missionary labors. Armenia was Christianized by Gregory the Illuminator in the beginning of the fourth century. He provided that country with monasteries and seminaries, and was consecrated primate of Armenia by Leontius, Archbishop of Caesarea. The Bible was translated into Armenian, and a large Christian literature was created. In the third century, Persia had so far become evangelized that Stesiphon became the seat of a flourishing society, and a point of departure for the expansion of Christianity further east. The doctrines of Zoroaster, it has been claimed, were attacked by a converted magician, Mobed, who, in a special work, held up to his countrymen the excellence of Christianity. He suffered martyrdom, A.D. 300, but was followed by laborers of equal ardor. Edessa, in Persia, became an important center of Christian learning. The Nestorian Christians, who were compelled to leave the Roman Empire, took refuge here and laid the foundations of a rich and influential Syrian literature. Missionary operations were carried along all the lines of eastern travel. From the valley of the Tigris and the Euphrates, the indications are strong that missionaries went far into the interior of India. Bitter persecutions befell the Persian Christians in the fourth century, but they remained faithful. The church in Africa developed with amazing rapidity. Alexandria was the literary centre for the evangelization of the entire delta of the Nile. Missions were planted along either bank, and soon extended far up towards the first cataract at Philae, and to the oases on either side of the river. Carthage, the ancient Punic capital, was intimately connected with western Christendom. Many Christians came to both these cities, but in larger numbers to Alexandria, from distant regions, where they became acquainted with the theology and life of the church, and bore back again the fruits of their study and observation. The whole of proconsular Africa, including Getulia, Mauritania, and Numidia, whose western bounds were washed by the waves of the Atlantic, 
was evangelized by Roman and Carthaginian Christians. The great number of bishops in the third century, dependent on the Patriarchate of Carthage, furnishes strong evidence of the extent to which Christianity had been propagated in the whole of Western Africa, and of its strong hold upon the people. At the Synod of Labis, near Carthage, A.D. 240 or 242, ninety bishops were present, while 270 bishops signed the conclusions of the Council of Carthage, A.D. 308. Abyssinia was converted through two young men, Frumentius and Nedesius, who alone survived the massacre of the members of a scientific expedition conducted by Meropius, a Syrian philosopher. About the end of the fourth century, a translation of the Bible was made from the received Greek testament of the Alexandrian church into the old language of Abyssinia. The Abyssinian church has always remained in connection with Alexandria, its boast being, we drink from the fountain of the patriarch of Alexandria. Feeble as Abyssinian Christianity is, it has preserved its existence, through an unbroken succession of Christian governors, from the fourth century to the nineteenth. With all its error, it may in truth be called the Waldensian Church of the Switzerland of Africa. The central field of interest was the continent of Europe, Christian missionaries continued the labors of Paul, and carried the gospel through Mosia to the Danube. Macedonia had numerous Christian societies, while even Illyricum had two dioceses. By A.D. 310, three bishops lived in Philippopolis, in Thrace. The contact of the Goths north of the Danube, in Dacia, with Christianity, was a most important event. It was the opening of a new field of evangelistic labor, and had the important effect of bringing the gospel into relation with the many Teutonic tribes which constituted the eastern Germany of those times. A Gothic bishop, Theophilus, was a member of the Nicene Council. It was, however, through the labors of Ulfilas, a Gothic convert to Christianity, that the gospel spread widely among his people. He invented the Gothic alphabet, brought the Goths into literary relations with Roman culture, and opened up the pathway for Christian truth into all parts of the Ostrogothic territory. In Greece, it was not Athens but Corinth which became the ecclesiastical center of operations. Athens, however, constituted a diocese, and the third bishop resident there suffered martyrdom, A.D. 179. Aquileia, at the head of the Adriatic Sea, became a point of influence for the propagation of Christianity among the peoples of the Eastern Alps. Rome was the heart and hand of a vigorous and aggressive Christianity. The entire Italian peninsula had grown into episcopates. The first provincial synod was A.D. 303, but before this there had been seventeen smaller synods and councils, attended by bishops of all Italy. Rome converted all Spain and Gaul into a missionary field. The Roman bishop was supreme. As early as the end of the second century, Christian societies existed throughout Spain, and by the beginning of the fourth century, churches had been established in all the Gallic provinces. Vienne was an episcopal residence, A.D. 118. Lugdunum, Lyon, about A.D. 179, and Treves in the first half of the 4th century. Christianity was at first communicated to Germany, most likely, by soldiers in the Roman army. Where colonies were planted, as provincial centers of Roman authority, the gospel soon acquired a foothold. Colonia, Cologne, became a bishopric about the end of the 3rd century. At the same time, the gospel was introduced into Rhetia by the bishop Narcissus. Christianity was also planted far in the north, along the coast of the North Sea. The apostle to Scandinavia was Ansgar, who was born A.D. 801, and whose remarkable triumphs belong to the medieval period. It cannot be doubted that the gospel entered Britain at an early period, or about the middle of the second century. 
Rome, under Julius Caesar, had conquered the country and brought it into close relationship with Italy. In the Council of Arles, A.D. 314, three bishops from Britain signed the decrees, Iborius of Eparacum, York, Restitutus of Londinium, London, and Colonia Londoniensium, Lincoln. The location of these bishops proves that the whole of England was organized into a complete ecclesiastical system. Sucket, the original name of St. Patrick, or Patricius, was born in Scotland, about A.D. 400, of Christian parents of high rank. At the age of sixteen he was taken captive by the pirates of the Scots, and carried to Ireland, where he was employed as a shepherd. His confessions, written in rude style, reveal his remarkable religious history. He devoted himself to the evangelization of Ireland. Through his influence societies were planted, schools were organized, Christian literature was cultivated, and missionaries went out from that island to the continent. Columbanus, with twelve companions, went to France, A.D. 580, and began a thorough evangelistic work in the neglected parts of Gaul. He maintained independence of Rome, and would not submit to her authority with respect to Easter. When people quoted to him the name of the great Leo, Lion, he replied, Perhaps in this case a living dog may be greater than a dead lion. Gallus made Gaul the field of his labors. Willibrod, an Englishman, went to Ireland for his Christian education, and then gave his life to missionary labors among the Frisians, along the coast of the North Sea. Boniface, born near Exeter, about A.D. 680, went to Germany and spent his life in that country. End of chapter 29book 1 chapter 30 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 30 the close of the early period this rapid extension of christianity was the most notable characteristic of the borderland between the early church and the medieval period missions were promoted by the very growth of the papacy the bishops saw that their hopes of territorial power could be realized in the west and north rather than in the east, and each strove to surpass his predecessor in the good work. Missionaries and church officers were sent out from Rome with authority to plant missions, build up a literature, and indoctrinate the people in the truths of Christianity. In many instances these attempts failed, the missionaries were killed, and the old heathenism of the provinces triumphed over the young Christianity. But the tide of religious truth was too strong for final resistance. New efforts were made, and finally the old idols were removed, the temples were destroyed, and Christian chapels were erected in their place. Christianity carried with it the disposition to create a literature. The missionary was often a man of ardent theological tastes, and immediately began to adapt the growing literature of Christianity to the new people. Schools, as at Fulda in Germany, were at once organized. Here the scriptures were copied, elementary books were written, and small libraries were collected. Centers of theological learning were thus formed. The development of a literary taste was never interrupted, even amid the convulsions of the Middle Ages. The Christian pen and school were never disturbed by the storms of warfare with false faiths. The Venerable Bede represented the patient and scholarly class of his whole age. He was born in Durham, England, about A.D. 673, spent his laborious life of a century at the monastery of Wearmouth and Yarrow, and reared a literary monument of forty different works, twenty-five of which were on biblical subjects. History and kindred topics were treated in the remaining fifteen. He died in great joy, singing psalms with his pupils, immediately after concluding his Anglo-Saxon translation of John's Gospel. Wordsworth, in a beautiful fancy, thus rebukes the idler by presenting the picture of the toiling bead. 
but what if one through grove or flowery mead indulging thus at will the creeping feet of a voluptuous indolence should meet thy hovering shade o venerable bead the saint the scholar from a circle freed of toil stupendous in a hallowed seat of learning where thou heardst the billows beat on a wild coast rough monitors to feed perpetual industry sublime recluse the recreant soul that dares to shun the debt imposed on humankind must first forget thy diligence thy unrelaxing use of a long life and in the hour of death the last dear service of thy passing breath christian doctrines assumed by the close of the early period a settled condition the church had elaborated its theological standards while its creeds were now repeated from the deserts of africa to the forests of britain and the shores of the north sea the larger heresies had still a constituency but were in rapid progress of disintegration they throve only in the remoter provinces more especially in the east and were alienated from the sympathy of the great body of christian people in all lands when the middle ages began other controversies arose which were largely speculative and had but little relation to the arian and other great struggles roman centralization constantly gained strength church offices multiplied rapidly and the close of the early period was the signal for larger measures for roman primacy the bishops of rome were the real rulers of southern europe from the constantinian dynasty to the reign of charlemagne the great wealth which had been at the command of the empire was now largely diverted into ecclesiastical channels and was used to build large churches organize missions support a rapidly growing clergy found schools and create a literature superstition was the darkest color in the picture of the church at this transitional period miraculous powers were attributed to the dust of the saints the places where they died were hallowed and were regarded as most fit sites for stately sacred buildings the saintly calendar increased rapidly festivals were organized in memory of each one who had risen above the surface of his times as an exemplar of piety devotion and sacrifice the condition of the people may account in large measure for the prevalence and force of the tendency towards superstition when constantine made christianity the state religion the many millions of the roman empire were thrust upon the church for training and development the burden was altogether too great the people of the centres were still beneath the spell of the pagan traditions and gross superstitions which had grown out of polytheistic systems the populations of the provinces were in even worse plight their ancestral faiths were a rude conglomeration of fetishism there was not even a social elevation on which to build it is not a matter of wonder therefore that when such heterogeneous and untrained multitudes were thrust suddenly upon the church for its care the superstitious habit should be slow to yield to the new christian conditions when the church passed into the darkness of the middle ages the question was could it endure the ordeal of vast wealth superstition and clerical assumption when the reformation came the question was answered much was lost during the long night but light came at last the power of the church to purify itself is the greatest proof of its divine origin and the clearest prophecy of its certain conquest of the world end of chapter 30 end of book 1part two chapter one of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain part two the medieval church a d seven sixty eight to fifteen seventeen chapter one the medieval transition the significance of the middle ages lies in their transitional character the ancient period was the time of the planting organization and doctrinal establishment of christianity the modern period was to witness the application of christianity to the social intellectual and moral needs of the world 
Between these two lay the Middle Ages. It was the far-reaching mission of this remarkable period to test the power of Christianity for meeting the wants of new nations, to withstand the shock of philosophical schools, to sift and preserve the best that remained of the ancient world and pass it safely down for modern use, and, above all, to prove the ultimate power of Christianity to rise above the infirmities of those who professed it, and to lay the foundations of a new spiritual life by a return to the pure apostolic example. The office of the medieval church was to conduct man from the narrow limits of the pagan to the Protestant world. The scattered threads of the eighth century were caught up and combined into unity. Bauer says, This whole period can only be regarded by the observer as one of transition at the close of which the varied elements which appeared in different quarters concentrate into unity, and thus show forth the Church of the Middle Ages in the full significance of their universal grandeur. The first period of the medieval church extends from Charlemagne to the papacy of Gregory the Seventh, A.D. 768 to 1073. This was the time of the full appropriation and unification of the Germanic and other northern elements. Mohammedanism, lying at the borderline between the ancient and the medieval time, arose as a counterforce to Christianity. Papal supremacy in church and state culminated. The second period extends from Gregory the Seventh to the removal of the papal see into France, A.D. 1073 to 1305. Here the absolutism of the papacy was broken, and the freedom of the people dawned. The monastic orders assumed larger proportions. Speculative science was introduced into theological inquiry. This was scholasticism. It perished in the same age which produced it. The Crusades were organized during this period. The third period continued from the removal of the papal see into France to the Reformation, A.D. 1305 to 1517. The papal unity was shattered. Humanism arose, which reacted upon the old order and made possible the revival of vital Christianity and a momentous activity of mind. With the thorough breakup of the pagan conditions, there arose a new order, the introduction of Christianity among the rude nations of the North had the effect of increasing a new literary spirit. No department of thought was left in its old stagnation. The quickening was intense. With the beginning of the Middle Ages, there was a departure from the old modes of historical statement. The old Frankish chronicles had been monosyllabic, and the roughness continued in the successors of Tredegar but with the ninth century there came a smoothness and beauty in which one can see the effect of the close and finished masterpieces of the Greek and Roman period. Scientific inquiries arose, in part original and in part derived from the introduction of Arabic science through the Moslem invasion of Spain. Monasticism preserved the great works of the fathers and saved to the world by patient copying the richest productions of the masters of Greek philosophy and the drama, and Roman history and poetry. The knightly poetry of the 12th and 13th centuries attained to beautiful forms and became the foundation and inspiration for much of the poetry of the most recent centuries. New and bolder types of architecture were applied to sacred buildings, and the most impressive edifices of modern times here took their origin. The plastic arts were developed for the first time in Christian directions. Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio were at once children of medieval thought and prophets for all the future. The Italy of today is not less their creation than it is that of Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel. Political solidification was in progress. The love of liberty and its certain possession by the world's numberless millions were born in the time which has passed by the name of the Dark Ages. Looked upon in retrospect, there is almost no priceless intellectual or political treasure of the nineteenth century, whose precious seeds were not cast in the ready soil between the ninth and sixteenth centuries. 
End of chapter 1「two, Chapter Two of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Reign of Charlemagne. The process of centralization north of the Alps began with Charlemagne. His rule was the signal of death to the tottering Roman Empire. It was also the first prophecy of the ascendancy of the new Gothic nations of the north and of their firm place in the later life of europe in him the old classic conditions disappeared and the new political life began its career charlemagne called by the germans karl del gross ascended the throne on the death of his father pepin in the year 768 he divided with his brother carloman the frankish empire charlemagne taking austrasia neustria and other parts of the eastern Frankish dominions, while Carloman ruled over the western parts, or France and a large part of Germany. Carloman died in 771, and Charlemagne united his own empire with that of the rest of the family, and claimed rule over all, without regard to the rights of his brother's family. The soil was now prepared for the new European life, the church and the state working hand in hand for universal dominion. Charlemagne's methods were the creations of a masterful shrewdness. He regarded himself as a theocratic lord. His notion of himself was not that he was a mere successor of Constantine or Augustus Caesar, but of David or Solomon, the head of a vast theocracy. But the Roman bishop must not be offended. He must be outwardly treated as high priest, though Charlemagne secretly regarded himself as the real possessor of the highest religious functions. But the Pope must be made to feel that his rights were respected, yet, at the same time, must remember that kings and conquerors have their rights, and that without temporal rulers there can be no successful and safe church. Towards the Pope, Leo III, he acted with unfailing respect, and was at the same time constantly receiving from him such favors as strengthened his hold upon both his subjects and the church. Charlemagne's motto was, The church teaches, but the emperor defends and increases. To Leo III he made the following declaration of their mutual relations. It is my bounden duty, by the help of the divine compassion, everywhere to defend outwardly by arms the holy church of christ against every attack of the heathen and every devastation caused by unbelievers and inwardly to defend it by the recognition of the general faith but it is your duty holy father to raise your hands to god as moses did and to support my military service by your prayers leo the third accepted this declaration in the most complacent manner the preparations had been laid in the preceding movements. Rome was constantly at the mercy of the bold and ferocious Lombards. They threatened to sack the holy city and possess themselves of its vast wealth. In 734, Gregory III induced Charles Martel to help him against the attacks of Lutprand, king of the Lombards. Again, when Charlemagne's father, Pepin, was aspiring to destroy the Merovingian dynasty, Pope Zacharias gave his official approval to the deposition of the Merovingian king, Childric III, and in this way caused Pepin to be placed upon the throne and to become the founder of the Carolingian dynasty. This obligation of the emperor of the Franks to the pope was never forgotten during Pepin's reign. Later, Pope Stephen II personally visited Pepin in France, and secured his pledge to come down with his army and defend him against the new Lombard chief, Astolf, who had invaded the Greek exarchate, a group of five cities and the interlying territory along the eastern coast, extending from Rimini to Ancona. Astolf was also besieging Rome. Pepin defeated the Lombards, A.D. 772, took possession of the exarchate himself, and appointed the Pope as patrician of the exarchate, A.D. 754. 
the pope was thus made a temporal ruler it mattered not that the exarchate was a part of the byzantine empire and that protests were made against it pepin gave and stephen the second took this was the beginning of the temporal sovereignty of the papacy which only came to an end after a reign of eleven centuries or in eighteen seventy one when garibaldi and victor emmanuel marched into rome the final and complete cementing of papal and imperial interests took place under charlemagne desiderius the new lombard king invaded the pope's territory and laid siege to rome adrian i the now reigning pope appealed to charlemagne for help it was given and charlemagne invaded italy with a great army and defeated the lombards he confirmed and enlarged the previous gifts to the pope went to rome and was received with great pomp by pope leo the third by a clever piece of stage management in the midst of the magnificent christmas festivities of the year eight hundred leo the third advanced towards charlemagne and placed upon his head a golden crown with these words life and victory to charles augustus crowned by god the great and pacific emperor it was a well-laid plan and faithfully carried out the bells from the many domes of the eternal city preached the new gospel of the brotherhood of pope and emperor the multitude shouted their glad acclaim and the city ran wild with new joy the meaning of the coronation was clear enough charlemagne had lacked the endorsement of the church he had long coveted it such an attestation of his imperial rights would forever silence the claims of his brother carloman's children and give him such prestige as would defy all opposition then as compensation for his vast papal service he enlarged the papal territory and placed the papacy itself as a temporal sovereignty on a plan entirely new to history the later relations of charlemagne and the pope were fraternal always a part of the general policy of mutual advantage the emperor was no sooner crowned then he threw off his northern costume and put on the tunic the clamus and the sandals of the roman when he came to leave rome and leo the third exchanged kisses with him and he was lost to sight behind the hills of the champagne europe entered on a new career the northern empire was to strengthen and protect the papacy in every emergency on the other hand the papacy must give its spiritual approval to the empire beautiful as this management appeared it had its dangers each was slave to the other the papacy could only be upheld by imperial arms the empire would be in constant danger of strifes of succession without the participation and coronation of the papacy the time came later when it would have been convenient for both parties if charlemagne had never seen rome and no pope had put upon his head the crown of the caesars End of chapter two part two chapter three of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three church and state under the later carolingian rulers the example of charlemagne was on the side of imperial predominance he never meant the least surrender to the pope of absolute control over the church he knew the ancient power of the roman emperors over the religious affairs of the state and adhered to his notions of theocratic responsibility it was convenient to have a pope crown him but the august ceremony produced no restraints he regarded himself the full suzerain of rome and of rome's pope how little importance charlemagne attached to the papal coronation may be seen in the fact that in eight thirteen when he wanted to associate his son louis with him in the government of the empire he with his own hands placed the crown upon the young man's head the carolingian successors to charlemagne were a group of steadily dissolving lights the family intellect diminished to a lamentable degree but there was no relaxing of imperial claims 
each ruler asserted his sovereignty over the religious functions of europe all the carolingians adhered to the appointment of bishops as their father and his predecessors had done the civil rulers frequently sold the episcopal office to the highest bidder the council of orleans in 549 and that of paris in 557 had protested against such methods but the evil continued dagobert the first in 631 appointed his treasurer a layman to the see of cahors all the barbaric rulers ignored the authority of the roman bishop even boniface was made archbishop of mainz by royal hands charles martel rewarded his soldiers with the best seas in his realm the brightest dream of many a bronzed warrior was to spend his last years with the peaceful crozier in his scarred hand as the carolingian line continued there was a rise of papal prerogative no exception was taken to charlemagne's appointments because of his prestige and of his service to the church but his weaker descendants had no such claims and were regarded with no such awe the result of the imperial appointment of church officers was that the incumbents should feel that their authority coming from the civil ruler they were not directly subject to papal mandate the trend was to create an independent episcopacy this was of the greatest concern to the popes the bishops would not obey orders they had direct contact with the people and the matter must be changed the popes during the later carolingian rulers succeeded in good measure in getting the episcopal appointments dependent on rome rather than on the civil ruler the effect was to strengthen the papacy at the expense of the empire why not no charlemagne now wore the crown the government of the church was under the carolingians a part of the general machinery of the state under both pepin and charlemagne the body which legislated for the state did the same for the church the clergy were represented but they only served ornamental purposes just as the bishops now do in the british parliament charlemagne divided his general legislative assembly into three bodies bishops abbots and counts the first two attended to ecclesiastical matters while the last regulated political affairs the showing was fair there was the appearance of political liberty the fact was the emperor controlled all three orders charlemagne required the bishops and abbots to furnish a contingent of soldiers for his armies in proportion to the amount of property which they held officially in 801 he forbade the clergy all direct participation in military life the extinction of the carolingians was simultaneous with the complete ascendancy of the papacy for about a century there had been pleasant understandings which were of great mutual advantage charles the fat was a slender shadow of the great pepin and the greater charlemagne in 855 we find the neustrian bishops declaring to louis the german that they were not obliged to do homage or swear fidelity to their sovereign synods councils and popes were now growing clamorous for the primitive mode of electing bishops by the time the last descendants of the great charles were spending their closing days as mere weak functionaries in the palace of leon the church found herself proprietor of more than all her old prerogatives and holding her new territory with a grasp which only relaxed when she reached farther for a larger slice she paid back the princely gift of land from pepin and charlemagne by an independence and haughtiness quite new even on the bank of the tiber end of chapter three part two chapter four of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the fictitious isidore every period of religious ferment exhibits a disposition to fortify the opinions of the present by an appeal to the past the tendency applies to the evil as well as the good during the first period of the middle ages there prevailed in the whole of latin christendom 
a calm and subdued desire for papal elevation, which, notwithstanding the outward fraternity between emperor and pope, was preparing to assert itself whenever the right hour struck. The papacy had advantages over the imperial rule of a family. The son might be a poor and weak successor to his father, but no man could seat himself on the episcopal chair of Rome without at least some measure of ability. There was a division within the narrow rule of the ecclesiastical government. The metropolitan bishops were appointed by the emperor, but the bishops in general were supposed to be appointed by the pope. The classes were thus arrayed against each other. By a shrewd manipulation of public sentiment, the episcopal and papal interests received a strong support in a skilful forgery. A Spanish archbishop of the seventh century, Isidore of Hispalis, performed for the German church the distinguished service of making it acquainted with a number of important classical and patristic works. He died in 636, and left behind a name of great repute for mental and moral endowments. His services and fame were used as authority for a forgery, in favor of Roman authority as against the political ruler. The entire church was deceived, but it was a most welcome deception. The secret lay concealed long enough to fortify every branch of ecclesiastical authority, to make political rulers tremble, and to make Rome ready, when the Carolingians ran out, to extend her spiritual scepter over all rulers. The pseudo-Isidorian decretals combined all the qualities of a perfect deception. They represented a class, and yet were the best of their order. A collection of canons and epistles of Dionysius Exiguus, for example, had been generally used in the West. Isidore of Hispalis had written a collection of important canons not found in that of Dionysius Exiguus, and by his work had contributed greatly to the centralization of ecclesiastical authority in Rome. How could this same work be carried further, now that the Carolingian Empire had gained such great prestige, and threatened to eclipse the Roman bishop, and had been implored to come and help him fight his battles against the Lombards? Isidore, now in his grave, was therefore used to build up this endangered cause. It was pretended that he had left behind a set of decretals, the doings of former councils, which had never seen the light. Now, thanks to good fortune, they had been discovered. They were soon scattered as widely as rapid copyists could multiply them. No compiler had dared to go back further than the authority of Siricius, whose pontificate extended from A.D. 384 to 398. But this forger was no timid character. He boldly rushed back to alleged decrees of unknown councils, and to letters claiming to be written by Clement and Anacletus, bishops of Rome contemporary with the apostles, and by nearly thirty of the apostolic fathers themselves. The contents of the forged work were enough to condemn it it was divided into three parts. The first contained, in addition to the authentic fifty apostolical canons, fifty-nine spurious decretal writings of Roman bishops from Clement I to Melchiades, or from the end of the first century to the beginning of the fourth. Even the reputed donation of territory by Constantine to the papacy, a thing which never took place, was brought in to help the common interest. The second part comprised only authentic synodal canons. The third presented some real decretals, but, besides these, there were thirty-five spurious ones, which were held to have been written at various times from Pope Sylvester I, who died in 335, to Gregory II, who died in 731. The one purpose pervading the entire work was to prove, by early authority, the independence of the bishop. The church must protect herself and her priesthood. The bishop must be made independent of his metropolitan. When a bishop is tried, it must not be before a metropolitan or a secular tribunal, but before the pope alone. Even a clerk must be tried before an ecclesiastical court. 
an offence against a priest is an offence against god himself for a priest is very dear to god the very apple of his eye no charge against a bishop can be declared sustained unless supported by seventy-two witnesses the court must consist of twelve other bishops only the pope can convene provincial synods and his approval is necessary for the efficiency of their decrees the former opinion that the decretals were intended to prop up the primacy of rome is now abandoned by the majority of scholars the opinion is at present divided between two views the first is that the purpose of the publication was to form a general code of christian discipline and government necessary at a time of general insecurity in society and of confusion in church affairs the second and perhaps the better view is that the real meaning of the decretals was to free the bishops from their dependence on the state and on their metropolitans and provincial synods the authority of the pope was recognized and emphasized but only for the sake of the bishop the authorship of the decretals has remained a secret that isidore never wrote the collection can be seen in the barbarous latin of the ninth century citations from works of late authorship clumsy anachronisms throughout the collection the absence of all testimony to the authority of the more ancient portions of the decretals and the attempts to meet contemporaneous prejudices never in the whole history of literature was a fabrication obscured by more doubt or permitted to pass so long without challenge the date of publication ranged between a d eight forty four and eight fifty seven it was probably written in the frankish empire of rome but the evidence is not decisive the most plausible theory of authorship is that archbishop reculf a d seven eighty six to eight fourteen brought the genuine isidore from spain that this was enlarged and corrupted by the archbishop autayar and published at mainz and that the copying was done by the benedictine monk levita who may have had no suspicion of the fraud he was perpetrating the influence of the false decretals was such that popes councils synods and minor ecclesiastical officers appealed to them as final authority they were brought out to decide questions which shook the christian world after the year eight sixty four they were habitually used in papal rescripts as having binding force their genuineness was never questioned until the twelfth century the first doubts were raised by peter comestor but the fraud was never proven until the sixteenth century when the first protestant church historians the authors of the magdeburg centuries exposed the successful trick since then the better roman catholic historians have abandoned the decretals as authentic but hold them to be a pious fraud moeller calls their author a romanticist cardinal newman however goes further and with his characteristic candor calls the decretals a forgery end of chapter four Part One, Chapter Five of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: Mohammedanism. Mohammed, the founder of the faith which bears his name, was born in Mecca, Arabia, about A.D. 570. He sprang from the Koresh tribe, who were the rulers of Mecca and the surrounding country, and protected the Kaaba an ancient temple and the centre of the old national worship of arabia his parents died when he was young and he was left to the care of his grandfather he exhibited his warlike taste when twenty years of age of these first experiences he afterwards said quote, i remember being present with my uncles in war i shot arrows at the enemy and i do not regret it End quote he followed the vocation of a shepherd and said truly no prophet hath been raised up who hath not done the work of a shepherd his youth was spent in better ways than was the case with most young men about him he avoided the prevailing licentiousness was reserved and very early showed signs of hostility to the usual idolatry 
Khadija, a rich widow, put him in charge of her caravan, which was about to start for Syria. On his return he married her. He was at this time twenty-five years of age, and she was forty. The wealth which was at his disposal gave him opportunity for meditation, and for carrying out his plans as the founder of a new religion. Mohammed claimed that he fell into rhapsodies, during which he had his alleged revelations. His wife was one of the first to accept his claims to the prophetic calling. Forty or fifty others rallied about him, even before he made public his claims to special revelation. He called his religion Islam, or surrender, to the will of God. He despised idols of every kind, and appealed to his countrymen to return to the old Abrahamic faith. He preached the fundamental doctrines of Judaism, the resurrection of the human body, the final judgment, and rewards and punishments according to the life on earth. Great opposition was soon developed, and he, with fifteen adherents, went across the Red Sea to Abyssinia. This was the first Hegira, and he was forty-seven years of age at the time. In three months he returned. In a moment of weakness, or for purposes of the final success of his new faith, he yielded to the popular idolatry so far as to say of the three idols, Lat, Oza, and Manat, These are the exalted goddesses whose intercession with the deity is to be sought. But he soon recovered from this position, and denounced idolatry, root and branch, more bitterly than ever. He made a second flight into Abyssinia, where the Christian king, Negus, gave him a favorable reception. In fact, the religion of Mohammed, so far, was not antagonistic to Christianity, but friendly to it. But in due time the difference could be seen, and when once Mohammedanism was on its full career of conquest, there was no further friendship. There are traces, however, in the Koran, of Muhammad's acquaintance with the main facts of the life of Jesus. He probably acquired it when on his caravan journeys in earlier life to Syria. There were, also, Christians living in various parts of Arabia, and probably in Mecca, through whom he must have become thoroughly conversant with Christian doctrine. After Muhammad arrived at his fifty-second year, his success was more decided than before. Mecca was slower to accept his creed than the distant places. At Medina, the new faith gained great strength. Muhammad removed thither, A.D. 622, and shared in building the Grand Mosque, which afterwards occupied an important place in Mohammedan history. Mecca and Medina were at sword's points, the former being opposed to Muhammad and the latter favoring him. The Battle of Bedr was the result. Muhammad was victorious. Though the first blood was not shed here, this was the real beginning, on a large scale, of the sanguinary career of Mohammedanism. Muhammad gained steadily on his enemies. He conquered one tribe after another, until he became feared throughout Arabia. He sent legates to foreign courts, and received answers and gifts in return. He died, while making preparations for a campaign on the Syrian border, when sixty-three years of age. The Koran contains the system of Muhammad. He claimed to have received his communications miraculously, and that they should be the law of faith and practice for his followers for all time. This day, said Muhammad, at his farewell pilgrimage, have I perfected your religion unto you and from that day to this the Koran has never undergone any change, and is the standard of faith and life of the 173 millions who constitute the Mohammedan world. It is a medley of legend, history, Jewish patriarchal traditions, and sensual doctrine. It permits polygamy, and awakens the courage of Mohammedans by promises of worldly pleasures in the future life. It is severe on idolatry, and declares the unity of God. There is a great confusion of chronology. Many of the moral precepts were mere accommodations to Muhammad's infirmities. Polygamy is allowed by the Koran at the mere whim of the husband. Divorce takes place with equal ease. 
slavery is recognized as a civil institution. The Mohammedan is obliged to fight for the extension of his cause. The church and the state are one and the same. Fatalism abounds throughout the system. Under Abu Bekr and the later successors of Muhammad, the new faith was propagated with amazing rapidity. Arabia was conquered by the prophet himself. The caliphs who came after him subdued Egypt, all North Africa, Syria, Persia, Asia Minor, northern India, Spain, the south of France, and the Danubian principalities. The progress in Western Europe was arrested by the victory of Charles Martel at Tours, A.D. 732. The conquests in the countries around the eastern portion of the Mediterranean Sea were more easy because of the strifes of rulers and the dissensions of Christians. The progress of the Mohammedans into Central Europe was not arrested until 1683, when John Sobieski, the Polish king, defeated the Turks with great slaughter at Vienna. End of chapter 5「One, Chapter Six of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: The Schools of Charlemagne. The rulers immediately before Charlemagne were of barbarian origin and had no sympathy with the classic treasures. They could not appreciate the literary wealth of the countries which they conquered. They even had little respect for the poetic literature of their own countries. Theodoric could not even write his own name. Charlemagne introduced a new order. He was the first of the barbaric rulers to see the importance of learning, and, while not educated himself, he knew the value of education as a source of prosperity for his dominions. He surrounded himself with learned men. Alanine of England was his adviser in all literary matters. Charlemagne entrusted him with the organization of schools, and had him report constantly concerning the state of education among his subjects. Guizot calls Alanine the intellectual prime minister of Charlemagne. Longfellow draws the following picture of Alanine in the Palatine School. In sooth, it was a pleasant sight to see that Saxon monk with hood and rosary with ink horn at his belt, and pen and book, and mingled love and reverence in his look. Or hear the cloister and the court repeat the measured footfalls of his sandaled feet, or watch him with the pupils of his school, gentle of speech, but absolute of rule. But Charlemagne had other scholars about him, such as Clement of Ireland, Peter of Pisa, Paul the Deacon, Egenhard, Paul of Aquileia, and Theodolf. These were the true paladins of his literary court. The old universities of the classic world had been located in the lands overrun by the Saracens, and were now blotted out of existence. Their place was occupied by seminaries, where only theology was taught. The education of the better part of Europe was in the hands of the church. The Episcopal seminaries had been seats of clerical learning from the primitive period, but these had been interrupted by the onslaughts of the barbarians. Charlemagne saw their value, began to restore them to their old importance, and enlarged the curriculum of study. Out of these Episcopal seminaries grew, for centuries afterwards, some of the great universities of modern Europe. Charlemagne took pains to establish grammar and public schools. These were purely secular, and were of popular character. They were preparatory to the seminaries and to all the secular professions. Theodolf, Bishop of Orléans, was deputed to establish village schools for all classes. Then, for the first time in Europe, learning was made free for all. For the children of his court, Charlemagne had schools connected with his palace, or the school palatine. To enrich the more ignorant portions of his empire, he provided endowments for the support of schools. England, Italy, and Greece were drawn upon to furnish manuscripts for the new libraries. A special imperial constitution was adopted, 
which regulated the course of study and all other matters connected with the schools. The old trivium and quadricium arrangement was adopted. Under the former were embraced philology, logic, and rhetoric. Under the latter, music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. Here the average monk, like Egenhard, grew up in logic point device, perfect in grammar and in rhetoric wise, science of numbers, geometric art, and lore of stars, and music knew by heart. A minnesinger, long before the times, of those who sang their love in Indian rhymes. A strong theological bias was given to all studies. Music was largely limited to chanting, and astronomy to the calculation of Easter. The emperor took great pains to locate his schools in proper places. That he was wise in his selection can be seen in the fact that some of these schools have existed ever since. He established about fifty schools of high grade. Italy, Germany, and France were most favored. Among the schools which he organized were the following. Paris, Tours, Corby, Orléans, Lyon, Toulouse, Clugny, Mainz, Treves, Cologne, Utrecht, Fulda, Paderborn, and Hildesheim. The cultivation of national literature by Charlemagne was a favorite pursuit. He ruled over a heterogeneous people. Some of the tribes were advanced and already had a taste of the classic fountains, but the most were in dense barbarism. The emperor caused grammars to be compiled in the languages of his Teutonic subjects, and collected the bardic lays of Germany. He required that the sermon should be preached in the vulgar tongue, and that the common people should have the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer in their own languages. Stripes and fasts were the penalty of neglect. Special measures were taken for the circulation of the scriptures. Copies were multiplied by the monks and were distributed among the schools. Many found their way into private hands. Theological literature received a strong impetus. The monasteries became busy places, and many of the monks became authors. Their works were largely reproductions of the fathers, but occasionally the quiet atmosphere was disturbed by an original manuscript. The decline in literary activity began immediately after the death of the great Charles. The church fattened on his educational beginnings. The bishops and other clergy took education into their own hands. The Carolingian kinglets were unable to cope with Rome when it began to grasp for the possession of the schools. From the 6th century to the 8th, the education of Europe had been ecclesiastical. Under Charlemagne, it had broadened to a remarkable degree and struck its roots deeply into the popular life. It was made the affair of the state and contributed infinitely to the development of the church but now a return to the old order took place. The clergy having secured the school, its broad scope was destroyed. Its general adaptation to the professions and popular education was narrowed. The state lost it, and never gained it until the reformation of the 16th century. End of chapter 6《Of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Theological Movements. The Procession of the Holy Ghost. The antecedents of this controversy are to be found in the Trinitarian strifes of the early centuries. It was a discussion between the Greek and Latin Christians, and was called the Filioque, and from the Son, Controversy. The Eastern Church contended that the Holy Ghost proceeded from the Father only. The Latin contended that he proceeded also from the Son, Filioque. Augustine had been the chief defender of this view, he having carried the doctrine of the Trinity to its logical sequence. If Christ were divine, then the Holy Ghost must proceed from him not less than from the Father. The argument was complete. But the Eastern Church gradually adopted the other view, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father alone. The discussion was animated. 
the result was that this question was an important factor in the division of the eastern and the western church its results therefore extend far beyond the early medieval period they have had their bearing on the theology of the greek church in modern times which is the same now as when all europe was divided on the filioque question adoptionism this doctrine also was the result of earlier theological discussion the council of chalcedon a d 451 had declared that in christ there is one person but two natures this became the doctrine of the church in both east and west but in the eighth century a new interpretation was made in spain by the archbishop elipandus of toledo he was aided in reaching this conclusion by the bishop felix of urgal these men taught that christ in his divine nature is the real son of god but that in his human nature he is only son of god in an adopted sense as a name and title etherius and beatus opposed elipandus and felix and defended the orthodox view great excitement was created throughout spain where the mohammedan rulers troubled themselves little concerning the ecclesiastical conflicts but were delighted to see christians devour each other the heresy of felix spread into the frankish dominions and finally attracted the attention of charlemagne the narbonne synod of 788 was indefinite Felix appeared before the Synod of Regensburg in 792, and, his doctrine being condemned, he recanted and made his peace with the Church. On his return to Spain, he recalled his recantation. The Frankfurt Council of 794 reaffirmed the condemnation of that of Regensburg. In the year 799, Felix once more repudiated his adoptionism, after a six days further debate with Alcuin, but enjoyed thereafter little favor from either party. Elipandus lived in Moorish Spain, and never renounced his adoptionism. The heresy lived but a short time after the death of the chief promoters. Anthropology The doctrines relating to human salvation came up for new consideration. Chief emphasis was placed on the elect, Augustine had declared that God determines the number of the saved, but his teaching on the divine reprobation was negative, that God passed over the non-elect. Gottschalk taught that the wicked are as fully predestinated to damnation as the righteous are to salvation. His was a doctrine of twofold predestination, by partia predestinatio, electorum ad requiem, repaborum ad mortem a double predestination of the elect to salvation and of the reprobate to death. Arihena opposed Gottschalk's doctrine on the ground that it was an abandonment of the saving power of God's grace and an abolition of the functions of the human will. The Lord's Supper The Greek Church was the first to teach a doctrine approaching transubstantiation, or the change of the bread and wine into the real body and blood of our Lord. The work on The Sacrament of the Body and Blood of Christ, by Pascasius Radbertus, which appeared in two editions, A.D. 831 and 844, was the first book which proceeded definitely to formulate this view. Transubstantiation, however, had been often approached in previous writings on the subject. This view was opposed by vigorous theologians, with Ratramnus at their head. In the middle of the 11th century, Berganer of Tours held unmolested the more spiritual view. But he was finally compelled to sign a formula repudiating his opinion. By the end of the 11th century, however, the doctrine of transubstantiation gained such official favor in Rome that it was accepted by the Church image controversy the use of images in the church was a subject of violent controversy traces of undue reverence for them can be found as early as the fourth century not only were the eastern and western churches divided on the subject but in each there were subdivisions of disputants three being in the eastern and as many in the western the periods of controversy in the greek church are as follows first a d seven twenty six to seven fifty four 
second seven fifty four to eight thirteen third eight thirteen to eight forty three in the frankish empire three parties were represented at the synod of paris a d eight twenty five a peculiarity of this remarkable controversy was the intense interest aroused in all lands and the length to which the contestants went mobs of monks the violence of soldiers and the daring of iconoclasts image breakers were common features of this exciting time in the east after many changes of fortune in eight forty two the images were solemnly brought back into the churches and image worship has continued from that day to this the orthodox doctrine of the greek church oddly enough however only flat pictures are revered while raised images are forbidden the synod of paris referred to above true to the prevailing sentiment of the frankish church condemned images but the opinion of gregory the great died six hundred four who favored images on account of their educational and devotional use finally prevailed in the roman catholic church end of chapter seven Part two, chapter eight of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight The Rule of the Popes Leo the Fourth, AD eight fifty five to Gregory the Seventh, AD ten eighty five. The reign of the Popes of Rome was never uniform. Where one was learned and was alive to the wants of his times, another was devoted entirely to the building up of his authority. The same absence of uniformity applies to their moral character. One might be virtuous and command the respect of the whole church, but his immediate successor might be just the opposite. The tendency was towards the evil side. The temptation was to resort to corrupt measures, not only to secure the office, but to administer it when secured between leo the fourth a d eight fifty five and benedict the third it was alleged that a female pope joanna was elected and ruled john the twentieth for this reason called himself john the twenty first the chronicles of the thirteenth century were the first to make full mention of a female pope protestant historians have been divided some claiming that the proof is certain while others hold that there are better means of proving the growing immorality of the papacy than the brief rule of a pope of another sex. We do not find sufficient proof in favor of a female pope. Nearly every competent authority, at the present time, looks upon the whole story as a fable. It was a Protestant historian, David Blondell, 1649, who was the first to subject the charge to a critical examination, and who destroyed all its claims to credence but the moral methods in use were dark enough for that or any similar violation of ecclesiastical precedence nicholas the first hadrian the second and john the seventh were involved in complications with the frankish rulers the new gift of temporal possessions was now bearing its legitimate fruit it was easy to see that the attention of the popes was directed just as much towards political as spiritual matters. No period in the history of the papacy has been more corrupt than in the time of the pornocracy, A.D. 904-962. Italy was divided between hostile factions. The noble families were arrayed against each other. The ruling pope was strong or weak according to the success of the nobles whose cause he had espoused. For a half century, a wicked woman, Theodora, ruled the papacy. She was the daughter of a noble family. Her daughter, Maria, was almost her equal in genius and crime. These two women put into the papacy whom they chose. Theodora caused John X to assume the papacy. After her death, he endeavored to throw off his dependence upon her daughter, but he failed. Maria was too strong for the ungrateful successor of St. Peter. She put Peter, the Pope's brother, to death before the Pope's eyes, 
and then smothered the Pope himself in the castle of St. Angelo, A.D. 928. She immediately placed her son, John XI, in the papal chair. We now come to the opposition of the German emperors to the papal authority. Henry I was the first to assert a measure of independence. But the popes were constantly in need of help from the emperor's army. On the other hand, the emperor was in need of the pope's approval and coronation. Because, if the pope released the citizens from fealty to the emperor, the power of the latter was broken. The excommunication of an emperor by the pope was sure to bring untold evils to the former. There were, generally, competitors to the succession, and the man who had the pope's favor was almost sure to be winner in the imperial game. The misconduct of certain popes was so flagrant that the people would not endure it. For example, Benedict the Ninth, while a boy, became pope, but his crimes caused the people to eject him. They put Sylvester the Third in the papal chair. Benedict aimed to get it again, but he could not hold it, and sold it outright to Gregory the Sixth. There were now three rival popes. Henry the Third of Germany was invited in to settle matters. Clement the Second was elected, and he paid back his benefactor by crowning him Emperor of Germany and Patrician of Rome. Gregory the Seventh was the son of a mechanic, and arose from the humblest monastic life. He bore the name of Hildebrand. He could easily have been pope at an early period of his life, but chose to gain power and add to the papal authority by getting men of his choice in office. He was the Warwick of ecclesiastical history, the maker of popes. On the death of Alexander II, A.D. 1073, he was elected pope, though against powerful opposition. The time had come when he could safely throw off the mask. The people cried out, Hildebrand is Pope, St. Peter has elected him. The strife between Gregory the Seventh and Henry the Fourth of Germany was one of the most bitter in the whole history of temporal and spiritual authority. The usual request for the imperial sanction was sent to Henry, the last time that this custom was observed. Gregory determined to elevate the papacy at all hazards. His course brought him into collision with Henry the Fourth, For oppressing the Saxons, and permitting the sacred vessels to be despoiled of their jewels, which were now worn by the favorite women of Henry's court, Gregory threatened the emperor with excommunication. Henry resented the insult with great promptness and spirit. It was now a struggle of authority. All Europe was interested in the duel. Henry called a synod at Worms, A.D. 1076, which deposed the Pope as a violator of imperial rights. Gregory cast back upon the Emperor his anathema of excommunication, and declared all his subjects released from allegiance. Henry's princes, who were fast losing respect for him, declared that they would have another sovereign if the anathema were not removed by the Pope by a certain time. The result of the strife was the division of the whole Western Church. Henry saw that the reins of power were fast slipping away from him, and he resolved on penitence. He made a journey to Italy to regain the favor of the Pope. At Canossa, A.D. 1077, he humiliated himself by doing the Pope the menial service of holding the stirrups of his saddle. The result was pardon but the end was not yet. Henry repented of his repentance, and withdrew it. Parchment depositions flew back and forth. Henry deposed the Pope, and, in turn, Gregory deposed Henry. The affair took a larger form than writs of ejectment. It came to bloodshed. Armies were summoned, campaigns were conducted, and Italy and Germany swam in blood. Henry captured Rome, A.D. 1084, and the Pope became a prisoner in the castle of St. Angelo. But Gregory spoke no word of surrender. He withdrew to Salerno, where he died, A.D. 1085. His last words, which expressed the rectitude of his intentions, 
and which are engraved on his tombstone, were, I have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore I die in exile. The outcome was a victory for political independence. The later fortunes of the papacy were fluctuating. The result of the long and bitter struggle between the empire and the pope was to create an independent spirit north of the Alps. After Henry's triumph, the emperors were always disposed to assume more control and a larger independence of the papal authority. The charm of Rome's rule north of the Alps was broken forever. The ban of excommunication had lost much of its terror. Here, in this long struggle between Henry of Germany and Pope Gregory the Seventh, lies the entering wedge of the Reformation. For six centuries there lingered in Germany a doubt of the papal authority. The political rulers never forgot the example of Henry. His capture of Rome and his disposition of Gregory were of great force in all the religious struggles of Germany. They proved a powerful example for the Saxon princes in their support of Luther and the Reformation six centuries after Henry the Fourth stood all night barefooted in the snow at Canossa before the Pope's palace, and held the stirrups when the august successor of St. Peter chose to mount his horse, but atoned for it all by capturing Rome itself, deposing Gregory, and shutting him up in the castle beside the Tiber. End of chapter 8part two chapter nine of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the gregorian reform the moral decline of the tenth century was so great that not even the most extreme apologists for the papacy have been able to present a defence of it when the carolingian dynasty died out in eight eighty seven and a new one took its place this decline began in full force. The papacy had been gaining strength with every year, and when the tenth century began, such evils prevailed in the church as to threaten its very life. The most far-sighted of the leaders saw the danger, and that the church itself had become only a vast piece of political machinery, using unholy measures to advance its end. Even so warm a eulogist of Rome, as Baronius, says that in that period, Christ was as if asleep in the vessel of the church. Rome, the very heart of the church, presented a repulsive picture. The churches were neglected, and a dissolute life distinguished the priesthood. Cardinal Newman makes the following admissions. When Hildebrand was appointed to the monastery of St. Paul in Rome, he found offices of devotion neglected, sheep and cattle defiling the house of prayer, and monks attended by women. The excuse was that there were predatory bands from the Campania, which gave trouble. But in Germany, where there was no such apology, things were even worse. In France, the same evils of spiritual decline were apparent. The offices of the church were sold, almost as at an auction. An archbishop of France, who tried to silence the powerful witnesses against him when arrayed for simony, confessed his guilt, and forty-five bishops and twenty-seven other dignitaries or governors of churches came forward and confessed the criminal mode by which they had obtained their offices. Heinemar thought it necessary to issue a decree against the pawning by the clergy of the vestments and the communion plate. The nobles had their younger sons and relatives ordained for the sole purpose that they might be put in charge of lucrative benefices. Others had their dependents ordained that they might be willing instruments for any service in the household. The domestic priests served the tables, mixed the strained wine, led out the dogs for the chase, looked after the ladies' horses, and superintended the tilling of the land. Hildebrand, when he became Pope, bearing the name of Gregory the Seventh, addressed himself to remedy the evils. He, more than any man of his times, saw the necessity of a thorough moral awakening. The long experience through which he had passed, 
and his intimate acquaintance with the clergy and the laity in Rome, and throughout the church, had given him rare opportunity for learning the real life of the time. Hence, when the power was once in his hands, he wielded it with great vigor. He strove in every possible way to eradicate simony, and all the other ecclesiastical crimes, from Latin Christendom. He looked after the conduct of the clergy, and attempted to bring it up to a loftier moral plane. There was no department of discipline which he did not observe with a keen eye, and which he did not attempt with vigorous hand to improve. The marriage of the clergy was almost universal. The canons of the Roman Church had long before enforced the celibacy of the clergy. In the reply of Pope Nicholas I to the Bulgarians, 860, in the conclusions of the Synod of Worms, 868, in Leo VII's Epistle to the Gauls and Germans, 938, in the Councils of Mentz and Metz in 888, in the Decrees of Augsburg, 952, and in Benedict VIII's speech and the Decrees at Pavia in 1020, the practice of clerical marriage was severely condemned. The entire official record of the Church for two centuries, but not before, had been against the marriage of the clergy. Gregory, before anything else engaged his attention, set himself to work to correct the custom. But he little dreamed of the opposition which he had to encounter. His canons were met with the bitterest opposition. In Germany, the opposition was intense. In France, the Archbishop of Rouen was pelted with stones when attempting to enforce the new Gregorian reform. In Normandy, many churches had become heritable property to the sons and daughters of priests. In Rome, the antagonism to the canons of Gregory was even more violent, if possible, than elsewhere. Many of the churches had become scenes of wild nocturnal revelry. Priests, and even cardinals, celebrated the Lord's Supper at irregular hours for the sake of gain. Clerical immorality was universal. The enemies of the Gregorian canons, under the very eyes of Gregory himself, met his reformatory measures with relentless fury. It was not so much a rebellion against the war made on the marriage of the clergy, but of rebellion against the whole system of reform in the life of the clergy, from bishops, up or down, as one may think, through all the clerical strata. The clergy saw that they were watched as by the eye of an eagle. They knew, too, the vigor of Gregory's hand but he received only threats for his pains. With undaunted courage and perseverance, he labored for the independence and purity of the church until his death. He affected but little, except that he sowed some good seed for later times. Gregory was now sixty years of age, and was afflicted by an illness so severe that he thought himself dying. But he recovered. These were his words, quote, we were reserved to our accustomed toils, our infinite anxieties, reserved to suffer, as it were, each hour the pangs of travail, while we feel ourselves unable to save, by any steermanship, the church which seems almost foundering before our eyes. In the midst of his sorrows, on witnessing the violent opposition on every quarter, at home and north of the Alps, he cried aloud, I live as it were in death, shaken by a thousand storms. End of chapter 9「2 Chapter 10 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Moral Life and Ecclesiastical Usages. The morals of the higher clergy were, thus, the darkest feature of the times. The example of the papacy, leaving out Gregory, and now and then another pope, was not favorable to episcopal purity. As many of the bishops secured their office by purchase or political intrigues, the effect of their administration could not be expected to be of an elevated spiritual character. Cincius, 385, was the first pope to order clerical celibacy. Leo the Great, 
440 to 461, repeated the decree and extended it to subdeacons. Successive synods gave the same injunction. Gregory the Seventh, however, was the first pope to enforce these laws with inflexible purpose. For in all the countries of Western Europe, these ascetic regulations were constantly disregarded. The tenth century was especially distinguished for the general immorality of the clergy. The original jurisdiction of the bishop extended over the matter of all penances within his diocese but the tendency was to withdraw this lucrative trade from the episcopacy and let it be an affair for the pope to regulate by special agents the legates whom the bishops had sent to rome with reference to penances were clothed with special powers by the popes and even papal absolution was declared to individuals on whom penance had been pronounced by the bishops the tendency was to increase the authority of the pope the nobles were on the side of the bishops. It was the question of a territory against Rome. The Council of Pavia, in 876, declared in favor of the papal anathema as against that of a bishop. The papal management of penances went on with undisguised force. The profits were enormous. They added vastly to the papal treasury, and were in full force down to the time of Martin Luther. The reverence for the Virgin Mary was one of the peculiarities of the times. The rise of chivalry tended to increase the respect for woman throughout Europe. The religious respect for the Virgin had some bearing upon the growing custom of giving woman a larger place in social life. Learned writers indulged in speculations as to the Holy Mother's divinity. She was the Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God, and her praises went far and wide. The miraculous achievements and lofty virtues of some of the pagan divinities of the north, such as Freya, were transferred outright to her. Relics came into use far more than in the preceding period. The pilgrim to Palestine, on his return, brought with him enough sacred relics of the saints to supply a church. Each relic was the center of a throng of associations, and was supposed to be endowed with great power. The chapel became famous, which could boast a single one. Diseases were supposed to be easily curable by touching a relic. The imagination never had a larger field for play than here. The saints of the whole past were drawn upon to help the ills of the present. The eastern countries furnished many of the most precious relics, but Italy was most productive of the holy manufactures. The Frankish monastery of Centula, for example, was so highly favored that it could boast a miniature cottage belonging to St. Peter, a handkerchief of Paul, some hairs from St. Peter's beard, some souvenirs from the graves of the murdered innocents at Bethlehem, some of the Virgin Mary's milk, and some of the identical wood which Peter did not use, but which he would have used, to build the three tabernacles impulsively proposed by him on the Mount of Transfiguration. The church festivals increased during this period. The saints' days grew to an alarming number, for the motives to enlarge the calendar were very strong. The day of commencing the year was changed from Easter to Christmas, though at Florence and Pisa the year dated from March 25th down to as late as 1749. Dionysius Exiguus, A.D. 556, began the year with January. As early as the 4th century, a festival in honor of all the saints was celebrated in the Eastern Church. When the Pantheon was fitted up for Christian worship by Pope Boniface IV, 608-615, it was dedicated to the Virgin and all the saints, and its day of dedication, May 13th, was celebrated as a festival for the saints. The origin of All Souls' Day, November 2nd, illustrates the credulity and ignorance of the times. On his return from the Holy Land, a pilgrim gave out that he had seen in Sicily flames bursting out of the earth, and heard the wailings of the poor souls held in durance. These unfortunates implored him, he said, to go to the monastery of Clugny, and to pray the monks to have mercy upon them, and by prayers and alms to free them from their pains. 
From this time, 998, the abbot of Clugny, Odilo, celebrated the souls of all deceased believers on the day after all saints, and the practice spread to other monasteries. In the ninth century, the All Saints Festival was made general throughout the church. End of chapter 10「ーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーー
but now with more reason to Gregory the Great, died 601. The great increase in relics, and the enlargement of the number of saints, led to a multiplication of chapels. Each chapel had its name, according to the saint to whom it had been dedicated. No confessionals had as yet been erected, though Leo the Great, died 461, had officially recognized private confession as a legal institution, and in the 8th and ninth centuries the practice was made compulsory. With all the increase in superstition, this masterpiece of decline had not as yet been invented. The baptistry, which had previously been outside of the church building, now began to be included within the church. Bells came into use. The tower, which had hitherto been an independent structure, became connected with the church edifice. The christening of bells in churches was an ecclesiastical usage throughout the Middle Ages. A capitulary of Charlemagne, 787, forbids the baptism of cloaky, by which is probably meant the small bells in everyday use. At any rate, the order was never observed. In the 10th century, it became customary to give the bells a name. In 968, Pope John XIII consecrated the great bell of the Church of the Lateran and gave it his own name, Joannes. The arts were now departing from the classic models and undergoing the influence of the new northern nations. The Byzantine architecture, as exemplified in the rich buildings of Ravenna, was employed to some extent. Generally in Italy the basilica still prevailed. North of the Alps there was no disposition to be confined to either Roman or Byzantine style. Einhard, the court builder of Charlemagne, was the most celebrated architect of the times. Shrines for relics, candelabra, and other adornments of the sacred buildings were of elaborate and rich workmanship. The imperial treasury spared nothing in order to add to the splendor of the sanctuary and the copiousness of the ritual. Great wealth was expended in copying the scriptures. The miniature paintings in the devotional books of the times were models of painstaking and costly outlay. Even in the British Isles, much care was bestowed on the copies of the favorite authors of the patristic times. The Irish monasteries produced some of the finest specimens of early Christian art, which have come down to our own times. On the continent, the monasteries of St. Gall and Fulda took the lead as patrons of the arts. Tutilo, died 912, of St. Gall, was architect, painter, sculptor, poet, and scholar, the Michelangelo of his age. End of chapter 11「ーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーーー
which proved of great value for the study of the Greek and Roman writers, and of the fathers as well, for many centuries. Theodore of Tarsus, the Venerable Bede, and the scholar Hadrian, were at the head of Anglo-Saxon learning. The most powerful promoter of learning in Britain was Alfred the Great. The War of Races had done much to destroy all taste for scholarship. The ravages of the Scandinavian piratical tribes made the land a waste. But that wise king restored science to its former elevated position. His own example was a model of literary aspiration. He founded monasteries, churches, and schools, and built the school which afterwards grew into the University of Oxford. He invited learned men into the country, and he himself translated, though very freely, the works of Boethius and Orosius, made a paraphrase of Bede's ecclesiastical history, and translated and circulated among his clergy Gregory's book on pastoral care. The scholars of Charlemagne's court constituted a bright galaxy of masters in literature. The emperor was constantly in search of learned men. He did not care where they came from or what their opinions were. The brightest ornament of his reign was Alanine, an Anglo-Saxon. While this man was on a journey to Rome, he was introduced to Charlemagne. This was in 781, and down to his death in 804, Charlemagne would not permit the calm and learned scholar to leave his service. He commanded Alanine to superintend all the educational movements of his broad dominions. He sent him on important diplomatic missions, and found that he could trust him in the most delicate duties. In 796 he gave him the abbacy of Tours, which became, through Alanine, a celebrated seat of learning. Paul Diaconus was of Lombard origin. He had been a member of the court of the Lombard king, Desiderius. Yet Charlemagne, after subjugating the Lombards, won him to his service. But the scholar was ill at ease. The loss of his country was a sorrow which he could not overcome, and, after getting released, he withdrew to his former monastery, Monte Cassino, and died there. It is from Paul Diaconus's poem on John the Baptist that Guido of Arezzo derived his names for the musical notes. Ut queant laxis, re sonare fibris, mi ra gestorum, fa muli tuorum, sol ve pollutum, labri reatum, sancte Johannes. Laidrad of Leon, Theodulf of Orleans, and Paulinus of Aquileia were also bright lights of Charlemagne's court. End of chapter 12part two chapter thirteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen new missions the spread of christianity continued steadily from the centers in germany and france missionaries went out and labored in the darker european countries there was constant communication between britain and the continent missionaries from ireland the holy isle and from england crossed the channel into france and cooperated with continental missionaries in founding missions among the heathen dwelling in the remoter parts of europe the monasteries kept up a close brotherhood that there was great missionary fervor in them can be seen in the number of monks who went out from them and threaded the forests and climbed the mountains of rude and barbarous peoples and spent their lives amid all possible dangers in endeavoring to extend Christianity. Many of them fell by violent hands. No people parted with their ancestral idols without regarding the first Christian preachers worthy of immediate death. Sometimes the rulers were the first to accept the gospel, but often it ascended from the poor and the lowly, step by step, until the throne was reached, and Christianity was publicly proclaimed as the faith of the state. Harold, king of Jutland, was aided to the throne of his fathers against his competitors by the Carolingian emperor, Louis le Debonnaire. 
Harold and his queen were baptized in the cathedral of Mentz. There is no knowing how much conscience was in this proof of their espousal of Christianity. But it is a fact that the Danish king and queen ever afterwards befriended the gospel, and did their utmost to plant it throughout their dominions. Anskar, a monk of Corby, accompanied them back to Denmark, with a view to organize the Christian church in that country. The mission in Denmark was resisted by the people. A rebellion was excited against Harold, and he was obliged to flee from the country. Anskar was also compelled to leave, but instead of giving up his missionary work, turned his eyes towards the still more savage Sweden, and determined to plant missions there. In the year 831, Anskar, with Wittmar, a brother monk, as companion, proceeded to Sweden with gifts for the king of the country. They were attacked by pirates while on their voyage, and lost all their possessions, such as the gifts for the king, their sacred books, and their priestly robes. They barely escaped with their lives. They reached Birka on the Malar Lake, and were hospitably entertained. The king welcomed them, and in a short time his counsellor, Haragar, became a Christian convert. A few Christians were found already there, but there was no organization. Anskar remained a year and a half in Sweden, and then returned to Louis, to whom he brought friendly letters from the king of Sweden, and gave a full account of his experiences. Louis established an archiepiscopal see at Hamburg, with a view to operating directly upon Scandinavia. Anskar went to Rome, where he was consecrated to the archiepiscopal office, and deputed to preach the gospel to the northern nations. Hamburg was desolated by a Danish army, and the sea was united with Bremen. Anskar removed to the latter place. He made a second visit to Sweden in 855. He died in 865, but before his death had the pleasure of seeing Christianity taking firm hold throughout Scandinavia. He was one of the most beautiful characters of the whole medieval period. In charity, personal exposure, fearlessness of danger or death, and sublime devotion to his work, he was surpassed by no one of his times. He said, One miracle I would, if worthy, ask the Lord to grant me, and that is, that by his grace he would make me a good man. The first positive accounts we have of the introduction of the gospel into Norway is that it was carried thither by some seafaring youth. It is not unlikely, however, that the Norwegian pirates who organized and made expeditions along the western coast of Europe came in contact with Christianity, and that some of their prisoners were the means of preaching it afterwards in the country to which they were taken. Olaf the Thick, king of Norway, called St. Olaf, was the first to organize the church on a permanent basis. This he achieved in 1019, but only after the most violent measures. The gospel reached Iceland from Norway. During the 10th century, Christianity was fully established in the island. The bishops were always elected by the people. There was no formal organization of a mission there, the first preachers being merely transient missionaries. Olaf Tryggvason established Christianity permanently in the country. This was secured at a public assembly of the people. They accepted the gospel, but reserved the right to worship their former national gods in private if they wished. From Iceland, Christianity extended to Greenland. A bishopric over the latter country was established shortly after the introduction of the gospel into Iceland. Even from these remote regions, Rome was careful to gather gifts for her treasury. The Greenland Christians paid their tithes to Rome in walrus teeth. Cyril and Methodius, two Greek monks, were the first to introduce the gospel among the Bulgarians. Cyril was a theologian, and Methodius a painter, and the latter's pictures of the Day of Judgment had as much to do with the conversion of the country as the arguments of the former. These people had conquered the tribes along the lower Danube, and had settled there and also in Macedonia and Epirus. The Bulgarian prince, Bogoris, was besought by Greek, Roman, and Armenian missionaries to adopt each of these forms of Christianity. 
he looked towards the pope nicholas for advice and during this formative period of the bulgarian church its relations were with rome moravia was in the ninth century a large and powerful kingdom in 863 the king radoslav requested the greek emperor michael to send him learned men who should translate the bible into the slavonic tongue and explain it to the people cyril and methodius were accordingly sent they composed a slavonic alphabet and translated the gospels acts of the apostles the psalms and other parts of the bible this procedure awakened the opposition of the german missionaries who regarded it as a measure hostile to their own language and methods for many years the moravians suffered greatly the archbishopric of prague was established in 973 the misfortunes of the moravians culminated when they were attacked and overrun by the magyars when peace came they were no more a nation but a mere province of the kingdom of bohemia the russian princess olga in 955 went down to constantinople where she embraced christianity she endeavored to convert her son svatislav to christianity but he was proof against all her importunities her grandson vladimir however was more accessible to the truth after a long period of reflection and the sending out of messengers into different lands to examine all the various faiths he accepted christianity and caused churches to be organized and the people to be instructed in the use of the slavonic scriptures and liturgy the vens lived between the sal and the odor and were distinguished by their wildness and their fidelity to their idolatrous worship they were divided into many tribes the emperor otho i conquered them but they regained their independence in 983 and in 1047 gottschalk united them into one kingdom he strove to introduce christianity among his people but was assassinated and the land reverted to idolatry the restoration of christianity was not finally effected until 1168 when the last vendic idol was burned by absalon bishop of roskilde amidst the rejoicings of the people poland received the gospel through christian refugees from moravia when that kingdom was broken up when in 966 Mieseslaus, duke of poland was married to a bohemian princess it was the signal for the formal adoption of christianity in place of idolatry relations with the roman church were established the rude peasantry however fondly cherished the memory of their pagan rites for a long time hungary first became acquainted with christianity through the instrumentality of certain of her princes while visiting constantinople many german slaves who had been captured by the hungarians in war brought their religion with them and contributed largely towards its establishment in their new country duke gesa who reigned from 972 to 997 was a mixed character for he both sacrificed to the gods of his people and built churches for christian worship under stephen his son who reigned from 997 to 1038 christianity became the religion of the country stephen was successful in developing as well the material interests of his country and in bringing it into close relationship with germany he was a remarkable man he traveled from one end of the country to the other preaching baptizing building churches and monasteries founding schools and organizing governments he changed the constitution from a tribal union to a kingdom and largely through his own efforts christianized the whole country he is rightly called saint stephen of hungary he received the golden crown from the pope with the title of apostolic king a remarkable evidence of the power of western christianity in hungary is the fact that from the time of stephen to the beginning of the present century latin has been the official language of church court school and government strong measures were taken by the ruder hungarians after stephen's death to restore the old idolatry but they were unsuccessful the finns were conquered by eric the saint king of sweden 
in 1157. The forests were vast, and the population far away from the current of European life. Hence, the attachment of the ancestral idolatry was intense. The ignorant peasantry were largely under the control of the magicians some time after Eric's labors to introduce Christianity. From Livonia and the German districts along the Baltic, the Christians passed over into Finland, and labored assiduously for the conversion of the people. The Estonians, a people along the Baltic, were forced to accept Christianity in 1211 through a powerful religious order, the Brethren of the Sword, whose aim was to see that the northern idolaters should become Christian at all hazards, if not by peaceful measures, then by the sword. End of chapter 13「Part Two, Chapter Fourteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen: Schism between the East and the West. Early differences existed between the Church in the East and the West. They were due in part to political relations and in part to antagonism of temperament. The removal of the Roman capital to Byzantium brought political considerations into predominance over religion, while in Rome the growth of episcopal power gained supreme ascendancy. The Greek was speculative, fanciful, excitable, and wandered wildly into doctrinal paths. The Roman Christian was practical, steady, and conservative. He was slow to accept any novelty, but, having once admitted it, it was next to impossible to induce him to surrender it. The doctrinal divergence between the East and the West was first perceptible in the variety of teaching on the divinity of the Holy Ghost. The Council of Constantinople decided, in 381, that the Holy Ghost is equal in essence with the Son, and that both are consubstantial with the Father. The Western teaching, guided chiefly through the clear and logical intellect of Augustine, held that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In 589, the Toledo Council, in accordance with this view, added to the symbol of Constantinople the term filioque. Roman primacy was also a ground of violent antagonism. The Bishop of Rome held that his decisions should apply to the entire Christian Church. The growth of the papal primacy was rapid, and subject to only temporary interruptions, and was therefore looked upon by the Eastern Church with grave suspicion. The Eastern Church held that the Patriarch of Constantinople was equal in rank to the Roman Bishop, but this was not only not admitted in Rome, but indignantly rejected. There was no dependence upon Roman approval of the decisions of Eastern councils and synods. What was regarded as orthodox on the Bosphorus might be promptly decided very heterodox on the bank of the Tiber. Here was a large field for bitter antagonism. The entire political and ecclesiastical life of the two regions grew more discordant with the years. Often the animosity was as intense between them as though neither East nor West professed the Christian religion. The ecclesiastical laws and usages were also calculated to widen the chasm. The Greek church accepted 85 of the apostolic canons, while the Latin church acknowledged but 50. The controversy on images in the sacred buildings fluctuated with great violence and during a long period. The result was that the Greek church rejected them while the Roman endorsed them and gave the type for the abuse throughout Western Christendom. The Latin church declared against the marriage of the clergy, while the Greek church permitted all its clergy, excepting bishops, to remain in the marriage relation, provided that at the time of their ordination they were already married. The eating of animals strangled, the use of the figure of a lamb to represent Christ, and fasting on Saturday were permitted by the Latin church, but rejected by the Greek. The Second Trullan Council, in 692, so sharply defined these differences that its action was a violent factor towards the great schism. Photius, Patriarch of Constantinople, 
invited all the eastern patriarchs to a council which convened in 867 here he formulated the points of difference between the greek and latin christians and gave a catalogue of the doctrinal and other alleged vagaries which the western christians had committed the pope was even declared deposed and the information extended to the western church the complete schism took place in 1054 constantine monomachus the byzantine emperor having in view a war applied to the roman pope for friendly support this overture awakened the wrath of michael serralarius patriarch of constantinople and of leo of acrida metropolitan of bulgaria they wrote a letter to the bishops of the latin church charging it with grave doctrinal errors and urging it to renounce them this letter reached pope leo the ninth he was greatly excited and bitter letters passed between rome and constantinople the pope sent three delegates to the latter city but only a fiercer animosity ensued the closing signal of an open and final rupture was given by the issuing of a public excommunication of the patriarch by the legates in the church of saint sophia and their withdrawal to rome attempts at reunion were subsequently made but the divergence increased with time the doctrinal differences became more prominent while the constant growth of the papal authority in the latin church made conciliation impossible during the crusades which united all christendom strong attempts to restore the unity of the east and the west were made but in the end proved fruitless the council of Lyon in 1274 declared the reunion complete the eastern delegates accepted the roman confession of faith and acknowledged the primacy of the roman pope while the roman delegates agreed that all existing usages of the eastern church might in future be conceded to it while the nicene creed without addition or comment might remain in permanent use this pacification was brought about by the eastern emperor michael palaeologus but when he died and another took his place the old schism reappeared in full force efforts at restoration continued to be made until the middle of the fifteenth century but when the byzantine empire went down in fourteen fifty three all serious and general attempts ceased End of chapter fourteen part two chapter fifteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the anglo-saxon church the conflict of tribes and races in britain was violent during all the early christian centuries there was nothing in the condition or pursuits of the people to give the least indication of the later controlling influence of the anglo-saxon race in modern civilization and the evangelization of the world there was enough of booty in the land to attract warring tribes and freebooting sailors from the western part of the continent the native races in britain were at war with each other an invasion made the conflicts only more intense scandinavia and germany furnished the chief assailing elements probably no place has ever been the scene of more bitter tribal warfare or contained a greater number of tribes to the square mile than the british isles the tendency was towards unity alfred succeeded in conquering the danes and driving them into the territory about the present london harold the last saxon king was defeated at the battle of hastings 1066 by william duke of normandy who founded the present dynasty this was the great historical event which first gave unity to the english people there are no positive data as to the means by which christianity was propagated throughout britain but the evidence is clear that it secured a strong footing in many parts of the country during the domination of the romans during the early centuries the relations between british christianity and the churches of gaul and rome were very intimate but the saxons in their great invasion in 449 destroyed the christian worship practised in the eastern parts of britain 
Christianity, therefore, was professed chiefly along the western coast. The relations between this limited type of Christianity and the continental churches became sundered for a time. There was little communication between them. In the meantime, the British church developed on an independent basis. Its Christianity was a continuation of the apostolic type, and exhibited but little harmony with that of Rome. In the year 596, the Church of Rome sent legates to Britain, to resume the old relations of daughter and mother. There was strong opposition on the part of Britain to accept any overtures. The divergence of the British Church from that of Rome consisted more in usages and details than in fundamental doctrines. The British clergy did not adopt the tonsure of their Roman brethren, but shaved the forepart of the head instead of the crown. The Church of Britain did not acknowledge the primacy of the Roman Pope, or the confessional, or purgatory, or the Easter cycle of nineteen years adopted by Dionysius Exiguus, or the sacramental character of marriage. Whether the Briton or the Roman would conquer in matters ecclesiastical, depended largely on the native princes. By the year 660, the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy was overspread by the Christian religion. This entire territory was intensely British in its profession. Kent alone was favorable to Rome. The kings of the whole country, with all their preference for a native church, without any control from the continent, were induced by Oswy, king of Northumbria, to accept the sympathy and protection of Rome. The diplomacy in behalf of Roman ascendancy was managed with great shrewdness. Oswy called the Council of Whitby in 664. Both interests were represented by able advocates, Rome by the gifted Wilfrid, and Britain by Coleman, Bishop of Landisfarne. The result, however, was easy to foresee. The king was intent on affiliation with Rome. The council decreed accordingly, and Oswy took care to see that the decrees were rigidly enforced. The union of the British kings under the Roman banner led Scotland and Ireland in the same direction. Scotland surrendered to Rome in 700, and Ireland in 704. The monks of Iona were the last to yield. They finally surrendered in 716, and thus passed away the last remnant of the early British National Church. Alfred the Great was the most powerful agent for building up and extending Christianity during the early period of the British Church. He was king of the West Saxons, and was born in 849. After his conquest of the Danes, he made it one of the conditions of their surrender to him that their chiefs should receive baptism. Fearless in battle, Alfred was not less wise in government. He reduced the Saxon laws to a code, encouraged commercial activity, and spared no pains to educate and elevate his people. He saw the necessity of spreading good books among his people, and composed several himself for the special purpose of contributing what he could towards their intellectual development. He deplored the ignorance of his subjects, and declared that almost no one living north of the Thames could translate a Latin letter or comprehend the church ritual. He fostered clerical education. He rebuilt the old monasteries, founded schools, gathered books from every possible quarter, and invited learned men from abroad to settle within his dominions, and aid in the educational and ecclesiastical development of his people. In the Christian works which proceeded from his own pen, less regard was paid to original thought than to the reproduction of Christian classics. The chief of these were the translations of Bothius's Consolations of Philosophy and of Gregory's Pastoral Care. To the English of all later times, Alfred remains the ideal ruler, the wisest, best, and greatest king that ever reigned in England. End of chapter 15part 2 chapter 16 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 16 arnold of brescia 
the long quarrel between henry the fourth and the papacy gave rise to a new force in italy which was now felt far and wide the claims which the pope made to supreme authority awakened the alarm of certain serious minds who saw here an element of great danger to the spiritual interests of all christendom in addition to this a desire for local independence was awakened a process of violent disintegration went on especially in the italian cities the people arose against the high claims of an ecclesiastical rule and cities vied with each other in an attempt to cut loose from these restraints that the clergy should hold such power not only in rome but throughout italy was considered a curse which must be done away with and the sooner the better it requires but little time for a great popular aspiration to find its incarnation the strong desire of many thousands in italy to reduce the prerogatives of the clergy and the papacy to the primitive status of voluntary poverty and purely spiritual life and government found its representative in arnold of brescia born about the end of the eleventh century he had been taught in a good school though an italian he had gone to paris and placed himself under the care of abelard whose spirit he had imbibed he possessed rare gifts of eloquence and popular leadership he returned to italy where he boldly proclaimed against the excesses of the priesthood and indirectly against the bold claim of the pope to secular authority he was guarded in his expressions concerning the papacy and entered no theological protest but against the universal life of the clergy he proclaimed inveterate hostility he held that the priests should renounce all holding of property and live on the free will offerings of the people his fearless method and defiant exposure of the prevailing vices of the time rallied to his standard a multitude of adherents among them were many cultivated people and nobles who saw in him a safe and pure leader but when the awakening which he produced became alarming to the existing authorities he was opposed by the pope innocent the second who banished him from italy he fled to france and then to switzerland and in both countries continued to preach the need of a universal reform and the return of the church to its original simplicity arnold had accomplished a great work in rome the popular sentiment was in his favor the needful reform which he had preached gathered strength during his absence and the people whom he had influenced now revolted against the pope arnold came back to italy went to rome and stood at their head he was not only the spiritual leader of the city but in a certain sense also the political head in the eternal city he was what calvin was four centuries later in geneva the administrator of civil and ecclesiastical affairs arnold's eloquence was overwhelming the multitudes gathered about him with increasing enthusiasm he forgot his religious standpoint and inspired by the remembrance of the grandeur of old rome he became a political reformer rome should stand free independent of the pope and emperor ruled by no single man but by the senate and people then the old greatness would be restored the citizens revolted against the rule of the pope established a senate drove the pope out of rome passed laws requiring the pope to live on voluntary offerings and throw off his temporal authority and invited the german emperor to come down to italy and re-establish the old imperial rule on the banks of the tiber lucius the second led an army against the romans but was killed during the siege of the city by a paving stone eugenius the third who succeeded him fled to france and placed himself under the guidance of bernard of clairvaux eugenius was brought back to rome by roger king of the normans but he was helpless arnold was still supreme and the romans were devoted to him a young englishman who commenced life as a beggar turned his attention to the priesthood advanced through all subordinate stages until he became bishop of albano and on the death of eugenius the third succeeded to the papacy as hadrian the fourth eleven fifty four 
he hit upon a novel method of opposing the revered Arnold. He prohibited all public worship in Rome. This one act produced a powerful impression, and the people could not say that it was not within his province and a purely ecclesiastical deed. The Pope was now in the ascendant. Arnold was compelled to flee from Rome a second time, and was afterwards seized by the Emperor of Germany, Frederick Barbarossa, who gave him up to his enemies in Rome. No mercy was now shown him. He was hanged in Rome, the scene of his greatest triumphs, in 1155. To give additional indignity to his memory, his body was afterwards burned, and his ashes cast into the Tiber. During all the latter part of Arnold's career, the most powerful enemy he had to contend with was Bernard of Clairvaux. The latter not only opposed his doctrines and the general drift of his teachings in political matters, but shaped the policy of the papacy. He was the real adviser of the popes who, one after another, had to contend with Arnold, and, because of his weight with the Catholic masses, probably did more than all of the popes to undermine the influence of Arnold. To study the career of Arnold and its unhappy end, one would conclude that it was simply a revolutionary episode in the turbulent age in which he lived. But we must take a broader view. He greatly weakened the confidence of the people in the strength of the papacy. He proved that it was possible for one man, endowed with energy, to overthrow, for at least a time, the temporal sovereignty of the popes, introduce a new political life in Rome itself, and mass the people to support his views. His most bitter enemies could not find any flaw in his moral character. His purity of life was in perfect harmony with the gospel which he preached. His powerful worth, and the temporary changes which he wrought, were the great forces which continued to work long after his martyrdom. In every later effort for reform, and even in the Reformation in Germany and other countries, the name of Arnold of Brescia was a mighty factor in aiding towards the breaking of the old bonds. Even in these latest times it has its historical value, for in the struggle of the Protestantism of New Italy for mastery of the thought of the people, that name is a comfort to all who are endeavouring to bring in the new and better day, from the Alps down to Sicily. End of chapter 16Part 2, Chapter 17 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The Waldenses and the Albigenses. More than once in the history of the Church, there has arisen from among the laity a bold and fearless reaction against the moral decline of the priesthood. The most notable illustration is to be found in the rise and growth of the Waldenses. They represented the protest of the private members against the prevailing corruptions in the church. The Waldensians took their name from Peter Waldo, of Lyon in France, who appeared as a bold and fearless preacher of reform in the second half of the twelfth century. He was a private citizen of large means, and with no relation to the clergy. He gave all his wealth to the poor, circulated religious books among the people in their own language, and exposed the vices of his time. This strong protest from the laity soon awakened the hostility of Rome. Neither Waldo nor his followers had any thought of seceding from the church. Like the pietists of Germany in the last century, they hoped to produce reform within the church but their efforts soon met with fierce opposition. The Bishop of Lyon issued a decree against them. The Pope, Alexander III, in 1179, treated them with the same bitter hostility, and five years afterwards they were formally excommunicated by Pope Lucius III. They grew rapidly in numbers, however, but were compelled to seek the mountain fastnesses of Piedmont, in Italy, where they found comparative security. They also established societies in Germany and in the mountain regions of France, 
but their existence out of Piedmont was always insecure. In some instances they existed as individual believers, but knew each other by secret signs, led a pure and devout life, and labored, by such methods as defied discovery, to produce a better life around them. They regarded ordination as unnecessary, preached against purgatory, the worship of saints and priestly absolution, and held that the real church of Christ embraced many more believers than the papal church. The Waldenses were reinforced by the Catharists, who had arisen about the beginning of the eleventh century, and had preached fearlessly against the corruptions of the times. They were a sect strongly tinged with Manichaeism, and had little in common with the Waldenses except their opposition to the church. Rome had employed vigorous measures against the Catharists, who had rapidly gained strength in France, Germany, and even in England. The first Catharist martyrdoms took place in Orléans in 1022. When the Waldenses were gaining strength, notwithstanding the bitterness of Rome, the Catharists regarded their cause as identical with their own, and combined with them. The Waldenses were, at first, much less opposed than the Catharists had been, but in due time they stood alike as injurious and threatening in the eye of Rome. By and by a relentless warfare was declared against not only these heretics, but all similar reformatory bodies. Raymond Roger, Viscount of Bezier and Albi, represented the cause of the reformers, who were grouped under the general term of Albigenses. Simon de Montfort, one of the Pope's legates to carry on the crusade against the reformers, conquered them in battle, and was declared lord of the conquered territory. It is a beautiful illustration of the bond between Christians of all lands, that when these reformers were persecuted on the continent, their sufferings awakened a universal sympathy. In many of the nations of Europe, there were pure people who were praying for a better life throughout the Christian world. They watched with fear and trembling the persecutions of the believers in France and Piedmont, and believed that, though conquered today, they would be victorious tomorrow. In England this sympathy was intense, and the parties to the persecution were made to feel it. Milton, at a later day, put into ringing and immortal verse the English protest against the crusade made upon the Waldenses, not only in the time of Waldo, but many times afterwards. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. Even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worshipped stocks and stones. Forget not, in thy book record their groans, who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold, slain by the body Piedmontese that rolled, mother with infant, down the rocks. Their moans the veils redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ashes sow o'er all the Italian fields, where still doth sway the triple tyrant that from these may grow a hundredfold, who having learnt thy way, early may fly the Babylonian woe. End of chapter 17。Part 1, Chapter 18 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Thomas Beckett. The English church underwent important changes during the twelfth century. The central figure was Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Chancellor of England. During the reign of the more capable Norman kings who succeeded William the Conqueror, the English church was under the full control of the throne. The popes had little to do except to watch and wait. When Stephen became king, it was at once seen that he lacked the capacity to rule, and more especially to oppose the vigorous policy of such of the English clergy as wished to ally themselves with Rome as against the authority of the kings of England. There was a complete sundering of the relations of the clergy with the crown. The pope was claimed to be the ecclesiastical head of England. 
when henry the second came to the throne he undertook to restore the old relation and to break up the bondage to rome the diet of clarendon which met in eleven sixty four carried out his wishes its principal act was to order the election of bishops in the royal chapel with the king's consent in civil matters and in all disputes the clergy should be amenable to the king no cause could be carried to a foreign jurisdiction for decision without the king's consent the same condition was required when any clergyman left the kingdom and no member of the royal council could be excommunicated this was a direct thrust at the power of the papacy over england the battle now began in great fierceness thomas becket was born in eleven eighteen his education was purely secular and he never became a theologian his tastes were all in the line of military and diplomatic life he became however archdeacon of canterbury and provost of beverley the pope wanted stephen's son eustace to be stephen's successor to the throne and to becket belongs the responsibility of preventing it for this service henry the second appointed him chancellor of england in eleven fifty five he was now henry's most willing agent he went on a foreign campaign in the war of toulouse and led the english soldiers to success he spared no foes he went again to france to secure the marriage of henry's son to the daughter of the king of france he was the most intimate and trusted friend of the king and there was no difficult or delicate service in which he was not called upon to take the lead in eleven sixty two he was chosen archbishop of canterbury and was thus the ecclesiastical head of england we now find this man of the world in a new position he had no more fitness for a religious office than the average soldier or diplomat but he felt his new position and immediately placed himself on the side of the pope in his conflict with the king he considered it his duty to be now a loyal churchman as before he had been a loyal chancellor that becket was entirely conscientious in this there can be no doubt henry could hardly believe his own eyes becket from being the fastidious courtier the luxurious diplomat threw off all his old methods and assumed the appearance of the saintly character he was at once transformed into the squalid penitent who wore haircloth next his skin fed on roots drank nauseous water and daily washed the feet of thirteen beggars he surrendered to the king his office of chancellor and placed himself at the head of the party of the pope it was a duel of giants henry had on his side the norman nobility and the decrees of the diet of clarendon becket had with him the saxon masses and the agents of the pope it was a grave question long undecided which should win becket made due penitence for endorsing the decrees of clarendon and was granted pardon by the pope a charge for an old offence was brought against becket by the king at a council in northampton to the effect that when becket was chancellor he had appropriated to himself forty four thousand marks becket replied that he was not going to answer to charges for offences while he was not consecrated to the service of the church he appealed to the pope for justice and fled to france while in france becket's cause gained great strength the pope aided him in every possible way and he had many supporters at home henry consented to an interview with him but failed to appear the king had agreed that becket should return to his see and that he would pay all becket's debts and the expenses of his journey becket returned to canterbury and met with a cordial reception henry was frightened he exclaimed of all the cowards who eat my bread is there not one who will free me from this turbulent priest henry's agents four knights went to canterbury and finding becket unwilling to compromise slew him in the canterbury cathedral in eleven seventy reverence was paid the memory of becket in a way new to england the popular indignation amounted to a national uprising 
Henry was regarded by the people as a murderer, though no proof has ever yet been produced which can convict him of intending that crime. His remark was made in great anger, and it is unfair to suppose that by getting rid of the priest his murder was meant, much less endorsed and directed. But the people are never logicians. They rush to conclusions, and so charged Henry with the crime. The king, to conciliate them, made a pilgrimage to Becket's grave, and did ample penance for real or imaginary hostility. Two years later, Becket was canonized as St. Thomas of Canterbury. Henceforth, his tomb in the cathedral became the most popular place of pilgrimage in the whole Christian world, Rome alone excepted. Miracles were claimed to be wrought at his grave. At one time, it was alleged that as many as a hundred thousand pilgrims worshipped at the tomb of St. Thomas. These pilgrims were warmly encouraged by the court of Rome. They were regarded as helpful to the cause of papal supremacy in the British Isles, and plenary indulgence was granted every pilgrim to the shrine of the latest English saint. End of chapter 18「Part Two, Chapter Nineteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen: The Monastic Orders. Eastern monasticism, which in the early period had flourished in all parts, especially along the valley of the Nile, declined as the medieval period advanced. The monks had departed from their original pure and simple life and had ceased to be examples for popular imitation. Eustathius of Thessalonica describes the monastic decline of the twelfth century in the Eastern Church as deplorable. He speaks of the monks as a hypocritical and ignorant class, no longer worthy of the confidence or support of the Church. The most celebrated of all the Eastern monasteries were those of Mount Athos. They still exist, are held in high esteem, and are supposed to contain important literary treasures still in manuscript, with which the Christian scholars of the West are as yet unacquainted. Eccentric types of monasticism manifested themselves in the East in the twelfth century. Imitators of Simeon Stylites arose in large numbers. Many anchorites spent their lives in the tops of trees or in caves. Numerous devices were resorted to, such as the wearing of an iron shirt or other articles inflicting physical pain, in order to make the self-abnegation complete in the eye of God. Some of the monasteries were enlivened by theological discussions, though the general tendency was towards sloth and ignorance. In the cloisters at Mount Athos, the disposition towards mysticism and quietism prevailed for some time. As the Byzantine Empire declined, and the Roman Church gained strength, the Eastern monastic life lost its place in the general life of the Church. Western monasticism developed with amazing rapidity. The Benedictines and Cluniacensians occupied a prominent place in the great body of the Latin Church. The wealthy and noble were attracted towards them. Not only were fabulous gifts made to them, but the nobility even left their estates, took on themselves the vows of poverty, and in all menial service placed themselves on a level with the monks. They became cooks, shepherds, carpenters, anything and everything which the monastic order required of its humblest members. Peter of Clugny, born 1092 or 1094, and Hildegard of Bingen, born 1104, were distinguished for monastic zeal. Bernard of Clairvaux, born 1091, was very successful in extending the work of the Benedictine order. He encouraged the reclaiming of wastelands and other works of material improvement. During the 13th century, there were no less than 1,300 Benedictine abbeys, this large increase from very humble beginnings being due chiefly to the reformatory energy and pure example of Bernard himself. The mendicant orders were a reaction against the vast wealth which was poured into the abbeys of the Latin Church. 
the adoption of the monastic life by the nobility had no doubt its effect in introducing a new and more dangerous taste than had hitherto reigned in those simple abodes the orders which now arose repudiated all wealth and professed to live on alms alone the fratres minores or franciscans arose from saint francis of assisi who was born in 1182 he was distinguished for his zeal and popular eloquence he was a model of poverty without money shoes or staff he went through the country and preached the blessings of poverty to the multitudes he applied to pope innocent the third for authority for a separate order and gained the object of his desire the early stages of his career were without decided result disciples growing but slowly in number but after a certain point his success suddenly broke upon him by the year twelve nineteen he had won five thousand men to his order and by twelve sixty four there were throughout europe eight thousand franciscan cloisters which were occupied by two hundred thousand monks the dominicans were founded by dominic who was born in eleven seventy the order was approved by pope honorius the third the tastes of its members were scientific they were fond of theological discussion they carried on a bitter controversy with the franciscans over the question of mary's exemption from sin the dominicans holding to the negative in the year twelve thirty they had a theological school in paris which became a great centre of sacred learning besides these chief orders there were others which were obscure imitations among them were the carmelites the augustine hermits and the servites servi beate virginis mariae servants of the blessed virgin mary the beguins and beghards were peculiar to the netherlands lambert de begue of louvain is said to have founded the beghard order about eleven eighty both of these orders drifted into theological vagaries and were finally condemned and persecuted by the roman church the council of leon reduced the mendicant orders from twenty-three to four dominicans franciscans carmelites and augustans the knightly orders were an outgrowth of two forces the regular monastic life in the church and the physical needs called forth by the crusades the knights templars were founded by hugo of payens in eleven nineteen and godfrey of st omer baldwin king of jerusalem opened a part of the sanctuary close to the temple for their occupation they were greatly strengthened by the eloquence and influence of bernard of clairvaux who in eleven twenty eight gained an ecclesiastical confirmation of them by the synod of troyes the knights of st john though originally founded for purposes of benevolence became also a famous military order schiller in his knights of st john thus portrays their prowess in war and their sacrifice for the suffering o noble shone the fearful cross upon your mail afar when rhodes and acre hailed your might o lions of the war when leading many a pilgrim horde through wastes of syrian gloom or standing with the cherub's sword before the holy tomb yet on your forms the apron seemed a nobler armour far when by the sick man's bed ye stood o lions of the war when ye the high-born bowed your pride to tend the lowly weakness the duty though it brought no fame fulfilled by christian meekness religion of the cross thou blendst as in a single flower the twofold branches of the palm humility and power but from this high estate there was a sad decline when the knights became strong and were the objects of universal love and admiration they began to depart from their original charity and poverty they became wealthy and immoral and finally lost the respect of the church and the nations after the crusades they settled on the island of cyprus in the year thirteen o nine they captured the island of rhodes and lived there as the armed defenders of the faith they maintained their ground till fifteen twenty three when they were forced to surrender the island to the turks 
after one of the most stubbornly contested sieges in history. Down to modern times, their valor against the Turks has been unsurpassed. In 1530, Charles V ceded to them the island of Malta, which they held until 1798, when Napoleon Bonaparte took it. It is now a British possession. The Brothers of the Common Life arose amid the distractions of the papal exile in France and the terrors of the Black Death. The order was the crystallization of a general desire in the Church for a new spiritual life. It was founded by Gerhard Grote, 1340-84, and produced such pure members as Thomas Akempis of the Monastery of Agnesburg, near Zwolle in the Netherlands, and other men of a similar intensely spiritual life. End of chapter 19part two chapter twenty of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty monasteries as centres of intellectual life european learning had a safe refuge during the middle ages in the monasteries of the latin church some of the orders paid special attention to one science and others to another while still others occupied their whole time in ascetic discipline and works of charity. The monks of Monte Cassino, in southern Italy, were distinguished above all others in Europe for their scholarly taste. They possessed a very valuable library, and utilized it in the production of works which commanded the respect of learned circles throughout Europe. But the popes never looked upon the monks of Monte Cassino with favor, the great monastery was a very hotbed of liberal thought. From that place proceeded many an appeal in favor of greater intelligence, less superstition, purer morals, and papal reform. The appeals were fortified with a powerful array of thorough scholarship. The reputation of this famous monastery for liberal ideas was never lost, the monks continued from generation to generation in the same path of independent thought. It is believed that their attitude, even in these later times, has contributed largely towards the growth of those aspirations which have resulted in the abolition of the temporal power of the Pope and the unity of Italy, with Rome as the capital. The most frequent employment of the monks was the copying of the patristic literature, this class of works was very large, and the monks were so skilled in the use of the pen that their achievements in this department are still a bibliographical wonder. They wrote on parchment, and were acquainted with all the arts necessary for permanent transcription. They knew how to make ink from vegetable materials, which remains firm to this day. They prepared the skins for writing, and knew all the details of enduring and artistic binding they were capable of exquisite illuminating in the production of doctrinal works they were at their best many of the illustrations in purple silver and gold are still masterpieces of delicacy and finish end of chapter twenty part two chapter twenty one of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Christian Art. Christian art in the medieval church was patronized in all the centers of thought. The monasteries were not wanting in even this larger field of intellectual development. St. Gall in Switzerland and Fulda in Germany excelled all places north of Italy. For some time the former stood at the head. Tutilo lived there. He was the Michelangelo of his time, being architect, painter, poet, and sculptor. The furniture for the sacred buildings grew into more artistic shapes as the Middle Ages advanced. The brass candelabra were of rich details. The wooden stalls and seats for the clergy and the choir were richly carved in all possible devices. The pulpits grew to be a vast mass of exquisite stone or wooden sculpture, and the screen between the nave and the high altar 
was frequently a place of metallic open work at once rich and beautiful each part of the sacred building was adorned with all the skill known to the art of the times the churches during the early part of the middle ages were modelled after the classic type the basilica ruled throughout christendom but in time the pointed ceiling and arch came into use and marked the final transition north of the alps to the magnificent gothic the goths who ruled in ravenna employed the byzantine style these churches are still preserved and because of their rich and numerous mosaics are the best sources for the study from ecclesiastical structures of the earliest christian usages the tenth century was the darkest period so far as art is concerned in the middle ages there was a universal stagnation there was a pause in the building of churches and a disposition to depart from the romanesque style and to adopt the gothic in the eleventh century there were evidences of a reviving taste but in the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries the revival was in full force not only in architecture but in all departments of art there was a general casting away of classic models and the gothic style became universal the christian mind seemed disposed to abandon all relationship with the greek and roman public buildings the very reminders of them were avoided the place where the christian worshipped was to the believer of the later medieval period a rich and living growth there must be flowers and leaves and vines in all the rich luxuriance of a german forest the great window must not be of transparent glass but colored with all the tints of the rainbow so that the rays falling on the stone floor of the cathedral might suggest the falling of the light through the leaves and branches of great trees upon the forest floor then the window itself must be a repetition of nature in her happiest mood the rose window became in all gothic architecture the particular object in which the poetic fancy and artistic skill succeeded in the creation of one of the most beautiful objects ever used for the advancement of a sacred building during this period the cathedrals of cologne strasbourg speyer and other places were built the cologne cathedral was modeled after designs of conrad of hochstaden it was begun in the thirteenth century and finished in part at the end of the fifteenth it was not till this century that the completion of this wonderful structure was seen it was dedicated october fifteen eighteen eighty in the presence of emperor william i and his protestant court the catholic archbishop of the city being in exile erwin of steinbach was the architect of the strasbourg minster it was begun in twelve seventy but erwin died before the completion of his undertaking his daughter sabina took his place and carried on the work the minster however was not finished until the fifteenth century glass painting for the ornamentation of sacred edifices came into use in the eleventh century with the growing taste for gothic architecture it was first used in the monastery of tigernsey on a lake of that name in the bavarian highlands and from that beginning it extended wherever the gothic style was used in architecture the plastic arts revived simultaneously with the medieval architecture nicholas of pisa who died in twelve seventy four was the master in the ornamental uses of gold and copper his genius made such rich and beautiful adaptations of these metals as to attract many into the same profession painting came into use largely for the ornamentation of the interior of the sacred edifices the germans learned the art from the italians the latter having derived their models from byzantium but the italians improved upon their byzantine originals these were stiff and formal but in italian hands they became soft and pleasing giunta of pisa Simbawe of florence and guido of siena were the first italians to take away the sharpness of the byzantine style and to clothe the images of jesus and the mother with that gentleness and attractiveness 
which culminated in the masterpieces of the school of Raphael. End of chapter 21「Part II, Chapter twenty two of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Christian Worship. The pilgrimages to the Holy Land and the progress of the Crusades increased the importance of church building. The relics brought back to every part of Christendom awakened a desire to construct beautiful chapels and even great cathedrals as fit depositories for such priceless memorials of early Christian life, and when these places were erected, the images were adorned with such stores of gold, silver, and precious stones as to bewilder the worshipper. THE SERMON The prevalence of monasticism added largely to the importance of this part of public worship. To establish a new order, or to found a new crusade, there must be a vigorous appeal to the people. The monks were close students of human nature, and were acquainted with all the mysteries of popular oratory. Many of them could sway an audience in the edge of a great forest, on the shore of a lake, or in the marketplace, with infinite ease. The religious fervor added vastly to the rhetorical effect. Peter the Hermit, when preaching his crusade, placed religious motives in the foreground. His audiences consisted of many thousands. He would preach until so wearied that he was compelled to lie upon the ground. He would then gasp his words, and these inaudible speeches were even more powerful in awakening sympathy for his cause than his loudest utterances. He was venerated as a saint while yet alive. His very hairs were preserved by the peons and regarded with peculiar sanctity. Bernard, also, was a celebrated preacher, and the people never tired of listening to his magnetic appeals. Berthold of Ratisbon, died 1272, however, was the greatest of all the medieval preachers. His audience sometimes amounted to 100,000 people. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. Like Towler, of a later period, he declared in favor of a revival of spiritual life. He renounced indulgences and many Romish errors with all the fire and indignation of Luther. The general preaching in the sacred buildings was in the Latin tongue, but the crusades and the advocacy of the orders and all the preaching to the great outdoor audiences were in the vernacular. As in art, so in sacred music, there was the same disposition in the Latin church to depart from Eastern models. The Gregorian chants, so long in use, grew into neglect in the West. The music became more varied and involved. The Ambrosian melodies took the place of the older models. Duets became common. Constant improvements were going on, and the choral service in the cathedrals was cultivated to such an extent that it eclipsed all other parts of the devotional exercises. Huobald, who lived about 900, Reginus, 920, Odo, abbot of Clugny, and Guido of Arezzo, 1000 to 1050, stood in the front rank as leaders in the development of sacred music in Western Christendom. Hymnology increased in importance commensurately with the melody. There was not only a copious recasting of the earlier Greek hymns into the Latin, but also into the popular languages. There was, besides, a disposition towards original composition. The tendency towards sacred hymns was promoted by the minna singers, many of whose popular rhymes were interwoven with religious threads. Among the best Christian poets of the medieval period, we may mention Robert, King of France, Abelard, St. Bernard, Adam of St. Victor, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventura, Thomas of Solano, and Jacoponus. Thomas of Solano wrote the celebrated Dies Irae. Dies Irae, Dies Ila, Solvet Saclum in Favila, Teste David cum Sibylla. Jacoponus wrote the Sabbat Mater. 
sabat mater dolorosa juxta crucem lacrimosa dum penebat filius cujus animam gementum contristatum ac dolentum pertransivit gladius End of chapter 22